Good morning. My name is Adib Farhadi, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the sixth great power competition conference, Russia's invasion of Ukraine implications for the central region. We're delighted, absolutely de delighted to be here with you in person after two years since the onset of the pandemic. This one day conference rescheduled after Hurricane Ian due to his extremely timely topic. First, I would like to acknowledge our GPC initiative partners, NISA and the US Central Command for their continued support. I would also like to acknowledge the Global and National Security Institute, newly established at USF to provide solutions to the 21st century security challenges operating at the intersection of science and technology, human dynamics and social behavior and cybersecurity. You will hear much more about GNSI later this morning. These ongoing GPC forums have brought together some of the best and brightest strategic thinkers, leaders, and subject matter experts from around the globe to address critical US national security challenges, particularly in the central region. Previous topics in our ongoing conference series have included regional perspectives, radicalization countering violent extremism, impacts of COVID-19, cybersecurity, and the two decade anniversary of 9-11. Today's agenda packed with notable array of speakers, panelists will focus on the far reaching implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Our conference includes two dynamic panel discussions, each followed by live question and answer sessions. Let me briefly direct you now to our conference program so you can follow along with the agenda and some of the other program features. So on page two, you'll see the Wi-Fi instructions. And also on the same page, you'll see the save the date for our upcoming GPC conference in March on China in the, in the so I'm gonna take a second right now to pause to make sure you're saving the dates of March 7th through the 9th to join us again. I wanna see everyone again that is here for our big conference, which will be a three-day conference. On the next few pages of the program, you'll read much more about President Law, Interim Provost Eisenberg, General McKenzie, and our speakers and panelists. And I can't resist a promotional plug for a great new book series on great power competition on page nine, available widely on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, and anywhere else you can buy the books. And today's conference will also have an edited volume schedule for release in, in, in spring. Okay. Let's move on to a brief snapshot of today's agenda. We'll kick off the conference with welcoming remarks from our own Florida Senator Rick Scott, USF's President Real Law, US Interim Provost Dr. Eisenberg, and former US CENTCOM Commander and current Executive Director of Global and National Security Institute, General Frank McKenzie. And we're extremely privileged and honored. Let me say that again. We're extremely privileged and honored to hear from our keynote speaker, General Eric Carella, the current commander of US CENTCOM. The opening remarks and keynote address will be followed by a short break from 1015 to 1045. Be sure to be back in your seats at 1045 for the start of our first panel discussion. Our first panel will help us understand how Russia's invasion of Ukraine will shape conditions in the central region and globally, in particular, we'll focus on Russia's shifting strategies in the region. From 12.45 to 2.15, we'll break for lunch and return promptly at 2.15 to hear from our STEAM plenary speaker, Ambassador Marshall Billingsley, followed by the start of our afternoon panel. Our afternoon interagency panel will address how Russia's invasion of Ukraine has affected drug trafficking and transnational organized crime. We will explore how regional actors in the Middle East and Central Asia are responding to these challenges and how these responses shape US security interests in the region and beyond. At 4.30, we'll close the conference with Dr. Randy Larson, Associate Dean of the Office of Research and Scholarship. 
So we are truly honored to have such notable speakers today. With that said, let's get the conference started with a short welcome video from Florida Senator Rick Scott. Hi, I'm Senator Rick Scott. It's an honor to join you at the sixth conference on the competition between great powers. Your discussions on the importance of the United States defending freedom against tyranny and preserving democracy are crucial. I have always been and will continue to be a strong supporter of Ukraine's fight against Russia's unjust attacks. I'm looking forward to learning about the outcomes of this conference as we continue our work to secure our nation and protect democracy. Thank you, Senator Scott. Our next speaker, President Law, has deep ties and a long history supporting our Tampa Bay region and our military community throughout her career, especially here at USF, and recognizes the value of partnerships in contributing to USF's growth and evolution as a high impact global research university. Please join me in welcoming the eighth president of University of South Florida, Ria Lum. Good morning. That was very tepid. I would expect much more from you. Can we try again? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There. Excellent. Excellent. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth great power competition conference here at the University of South Florida. And I want to just take a moment to thank each and every one of you for being a part of this new hybrid conference. I know that many of you, while you're here, we have many more that are joining us virtually. And I'm hoping that you're going to come back in person for the conference that you were just talking about next year. Three days, absolutely filled with important information, which we need to get out. We need to be able to share that with you. You know, USF is really proud to be the host institution for what has become a premier event. And it provides invaluable insights for our national security matters. Uh, we're equally proud of our long and successful partnership with US Central Command, and also with the National Defense University's Near East and South Asia Center. They serve as the government sponsors of this conference series, along with our USF College of Arts and Sciences, and of course, the Global and National Security Institute, which we are so very proud of, and you'll hear more about a little later today. The Institute is designed to address critical issues facing our nation in sectors such as defense, economic and political security, health and human security, and infrastructure and environmental security. There is a wealth of research about national security issues being generated by scholars across the nation in many, many universities, including right here at the University of South Florida. But once that research is done, then we need to focus on how we can get the information in the hands of key leaders so that they can implement actions and policies that will uh, support our country. And so for that, we are here for this conference for that purpose. Uh, since the semi-annual events inception in 2020, it connected academic scholars, current students, active military personnel, and federal policymakers, and brought them all together with a common goal. And the common goal is to share knowledge to foster relationships, and most importantly, to keep our country safe. So the University of South Florida plays a very unique role in this matter between our high impact research in national security technologies and policies and our wide range of degree programs that prepare our students for careers in the military and intelligence education. USF is leading the, in bridging the gap between academia and the national security sector. Today's program will explore, as you just heard, a very timely issue that continues to attract international attention, the ongoing conflict in Ukraine and the significant impact that it has had on foreign policy within the central region. Russia's invasion of Ukraine continues to affect the global economy, foreign policy decisions, and other strategic issues. 
I hope that this event brings you new knowledge that you can bring back to the organizations that you serve and support. So I thank you again for attending this groundbreaking event and I trust that you will enjoy the rest of your day here on the campus of the University of South Florida. And I have to end by saying, go Bulls. <laughs>Thank you so much, President Law. Next, I am incredibly honored and grateful to introduce Dr. Eric Eisenberg, a truly inspirational leader at USF and a staunch advocate of the Great Power Competition Conference from its beginning as Dean in the College of Arts and Sciences. As CAS Dean and now interim provost, Dr. Eisenberg and President Law have recognized the significance of our location and footprint in the areas of global and national security research and scholarly activity happening across the university. Provost Eisenberg is a highly published and accomplished professor of communication and has served as a dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, the largest at USF since 2007. In the coming months, Eric is transitioning to the role of Senior Vice President of Community Partnerships. And in that capacity, I know he will continue to deepen and expand our close relationships with our military, business, and industry partners. And I would like to personally thank Eric for supporting my ideas over the years, even when they may have taken us a bit far afield at times. Again, I'm so very pleased to introduce USF's interim provost Provost and Executive Vice President, Dr. Eric Eisenberg. Good morning, everyone. Um, sometimes universities have the reputation for dealing with things that happened long ago. Uh, what I've loved about these conferences is that they are happening just in time. And uh, I know you're all connected to social media, but in case you missed it, uh, there was a prisoner swap this morning. Brittany Griner is in the air from UAE uh, and heading back to the United States. So it's a, a good thing for, for our government and, for, uh, and it's very relevant to our conversations today. So I want to add my welcome to the Great Power Competition. Uh, since I arrived at, at USF nearly 30 years ago, I have strived to create a closer relationship between the commands at MacDill and the University of South Florida. And at that time, uh, particularly after the Arab Spring, uh, there was an appreciation on the part of the DOD that unclassified research was uh, critical to uh, intelligence going forward. And so it's been really, really interesting to look at the convergence between military intelligence and the kind of research that we do at the institution. Uh, the conference series is one example of what we've done, but we've done many other things. The USF Institute of Applied Engineering, which just, was just awarded a $10 million contract to support various uh, requirements with the 6th Air Refueling Wing and US Central Command as well. Uh, in addition to providing much needed research, we utilize these partnerships to provide our students with unique high impact learning opportunities that fuel the talent pipeline as President Law was mentioning earlier. Um, over the 30 years, what I've recognized is that getting the University of South Florida and uh, the MacDill commands to work together is like docking two giant uh, uh, satellites to each other. We have two enormous bureaucracies. Uh, and part of the reason that we stood up the Global and National Security Initiative is to create that single point of contact where we can have easy relationships and a kind of umbrella organization uh, between our two organizations, leveraging expertise in applied engineering, in technology, human dynamics, cybersecurity, policy development, uh, and other kinds of social dynamics. Uh, the efforts of the GNSI, Cyber Florida, conferences like this all support our strategic priorities and goals in terms of providing opportunities for our students and also making our faculty's broad expertise available to the DOD uh, in a just-in-time kind of way. So I hope that you enjoy the conference. I know that you will, uh, and this opportunity to engage with each other. Uh, you've heard about USF's involvement with the conference earlier, but I want to recognize General Frank McKenzie, who has been involved with the conference for several years now. 
General McKenzie retired from the Marine Corps in April 2022 as the commander of U.S. Central Command at MacDill. He served over 42 years in the Marine Corps, leading joint and coalition forces at multiple levels of command. And over his career, he was also selected as a Commandant of the Marine Corps Fellow and served as a Senior Fellow with the Institute for National Security Studies at the National Defense University. We were extremely fortunate to bring him on as our first Executive Director of the GNSI. In addition, he serves as executive director of the Florida Center for Cybersecurity and president of the board of directors for the USF Institute for Applied Engineering. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you General Frank McKenzie. Thanks. Uh... Eric, for that, for that very kind introduction, <clears throat> and particularly for the role that you and President Law played in the continuing series of conferences like this. That, as, as has been noted, that's very important, not only to the University of South Florida, but also to the larger U.S. national security uh, enterprise, and it fulfills a very vital role. USF is an ideal location and host for these kinds of conferences, and the support that we've received has been vital to its success. I'd also like to extend my thanks uh, to the faculty and staff at the University of South Florida's College of Arts and Sciences, to the team at the National Defense University's Near East and South Asia Center for Strategic Studies, and to my former colleagues and friends from U.S. Central Command, and at the Florida Center for Cybersecurity for organizing and continuing to grow this event. I'd also like to recognize General Eric Carella, Commander, U.S. Central Command, and I'll talk about him a little more here in just a moment. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the sixth great power competition conference. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's been a little delayed as we all know because of Hurricane Ian and we've had to go to a new venue for it. But it still contains all the information and the insight that you've come to expect. And it's also worth noting that today's conference as has already actually been said, it's the first time we've been able to do this in person since 2020. So that's a big stride forward. And also, as you know, we're, we're trying to hybrid technology physical attendance, but also live streaming it to a very broad and diverse audience. But it's great to be back here physically together again, seeing old friends and being introduced to new faces. In a few minutes, you'll hear General Carrilla, our keynote speaker and my successor as the Commander of Central Command. And I'm also looking forward to hearing all the other speakers that we're gonna have today. We've got quite a lineup as, as Adib has already noted. And we're gonna have some robust and thought provoking conversations with our two panels each focused on a different aspect of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and what it means for the central region and the implications really for the future of the region. This is also the first GPC conference since I assume my duties as the executive director of the Global and National Security Institute here at USF. Global and national security is a key area of focus for the long-term plan here at the University of South Florida and GNSI will have a leading role supporting that initiative. I've been, I'm honored to have been uh, asked to lead this group, and it's exciting to build something as vital and impactful as GNSI is going to be from the ground up. So we've taken some big steps already in the process of standing up an entirely new organization. Like any, under, like any undertaking that's worthwhile, this process has not been easy, but we're always moving forward, moving relentlessly, building and improving. Our team continues to grow, and we've added one significant member to our team that I'd like to specifically mention today. I'm excited to announce that Richard Knopp will be the chairman of our GNSI Board of Advisors, and he's seated down here next to me. So, Rick, it's good to have you here aboard. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Rick is the founder and managing member at FedCap Partners, LLC. His private equity group is focused on high-end solutions and technology companies dealing with the federal government. Previously, Rick co-founded the Windsor Group, which he developed into the premier investment bank for the government defense contracting industry. He has a lot of experience in higher education as well. He's a member of the Board of Trustees for the George Washington University, as well as the Board of Advisors for the George Washington University Law School. He also serves as the chairman of the external committee for the George Washington University Cybersecurity Initiative. I'm looking forward to working with Rick and eager to engage him on ideas to grow GNSI and to achieve the ambitious goals that we put in place for our five-year strategic plan. We're also moving forward on building our steering committee and our faculty advisors. We've had lots of terrific discussions, but nothing official to announce yet. 
So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that here in the next few minutes. Hurricane Ian clearly has had an impact on our ability to do things over the last few weeks. But the catastrophe that Hurricane Ian was is a grim reminder of just how important emergency plans and planning are. Important as it is to be prepared. It's also a lesson that has a great impact on us and what we're doing at GNSI. The idea that preparation is a central tenet of global and national security isn't a surprise to anybody in this room. The need for organizations like GNSI has never been more paramount than today. Modern national security concerns include whole of society problems, problems like extremism, bio threats, climate change, disinformation, food security, a world that is increasingly complex and globalized and networked demands robust and interdisciplinary analyses of large scale global and national security issues. I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to look at the security environment that we confront. I believe we face the most dangerous threats to our nation that I've seen in my entire lifetime. We are on the edge of a nuclear confrontation with a peer nuclear power. And while we provide significant support for one of the combatants in the largest land war in Europe since the end, really end of the Second World War. The war in Ukraine isn't going the way Russia anticipated. And when we say Russia, we really only talk about one person. We talk about Vladimir Putin. Mr. Putin is in a corner and there are very few ways for him to gracefully back down. Unfortunately, both his temperament and Russian strategic thinking, Russian Soviet strategic thinking going back long before the Soviets actually, emphasize escalating your way out of a crisis. And frankly, Mr. Putin has precious few escalatory tools available to him that aren't nuclear. And that should concern us all as we go into what's gonna be a long and hard winter in Eastern Europe. If there's any good news in this crisis though, it's the reemergence of the importance of alliance and collective defense structures. NATO is our asymmetric advantage. As creaky and slow to act as it is, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization remains the principal reason why Russia has not had success in Ukraine. That and the tremendous fighting spirit of the Ukrainians that are actually defending their country. Meanwhile, Iran continues to increase the size and capabilities of its missile, its land attack cruise missile, and its unmanned aerial vehicle fleet. North Korea continues to push the world and its neighbors by testing theater range weapons, one of which recently overflew Japan. And we can't forget about China. In fact, our next conference in March will be focused on China's encroachment in the Middle East. Even as we confront an aggressive Russia, we need to keep an eye on the designs of China. They're playing a long game and we, they've been playing it for many decades. We're finally recognizing that and getting in the game ourselves. All of this to preface the need for groups like the GNSI, the Global and National Security Institute here at USF. The mission of GNSI is to provide actionable solutions to 21st century security challenges for decision makers at the local, the state, the national, and in fact, the global level. Our focus, as has already been noted, is that intersection of security policy and technology. Why, why that intersection? Uh, if you will, imagine a Venn diagram comprised of sort of three overlapping circles. One circle is science and technology. Another circle is cybersecurity. And the final circle is human dynamics and social behavior. The intersection of those three circles is where GNSI will operate and flourish providing a clearly different and unique alternative that offers practical, actionable solutions. Not just ideas, but steps, things that can be done. It not just, you know, here's where you could go wrong, but also here's how to prepare for it. Not just what are your vulnerabilities and weaknesses, but here's how you can fix those vulnerabilities, weaknesses, and make yourself stronger. So you might ask, why now? Why here at the, at the University of South Florida? Think tanks are everywhere. We don't need more of those. But the leadership at USF has recognized the need for a different type of entity and also recognized that USF itself is uniquely positioned and has a, a great, ad, an, an, indeed an advantageous position to create such a group and achieve prominence in this area. Global and national security is a primary focus of the, of the USF long-term strategic plan, as I've already noted. GNSI will be a key part of that strategic effort, but we're actually not starting from square one. USF has already established an outstanding foundation for the work that we're beginning. 
The University of South Florida is a preeminent research university and consistently ranks among the top 10 in number of patents awarded. This year, USF achieved its highest ranking ever in the US News and World Report list of best colleges. And USF is number 42 among all public universities. There's no uh, shortage of great ideas here at USF. And I'm excited to be working alongside industry and faculty leaders from our colleges of engineering, behavioral and community sciences, marine science, the MUMA College of Business, and the College of Arts and Sciences, the sponsor of this conference. Our role at GNSI is to reinforce each of them by combining the best of each discipline to create added value. The time for siloed thinking and isolated efforts is past. There are really actually no more single one-dimensional threats that you can confront very readily. And as you'll be hearing today, what happens in one place can and often does reverberate across the globe, cutting across the whole of society. Our location, physical location, offers a great opportunity and another key advantage. The Tampa Bay region presents assets to our team that you really can't get anywhere else in the world if you stop to think about it. USF, one of the premier public research universities, is located in a major urban environment. There are two major combatant commands here in Tampa, US Central Command and the US Special Operations Command, just a couple of miles to the south at McDill Air Force Base, and US Southern Command down in Miami, just a few hours to the south. Tampa features international transportation hubs and is a dynamic technological and innovation hub. In fact, Tampa was named the number one emerging tech city in the United States by Forbes magazine just last year. The defense industry is well represented in the region with global giants like Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, CAA USA and General Dynamics, Honeywell and a host of others. Florida is ranked in the top 10 states for manufacturing and Tampa is number two in the state featuring advanced manufacturing firms like JBIL, GE, Advanced Airfoil Components, and many more. On top of that, we have existing partnerships with two of Tampa's most technologically advanced groups, the Institute of Applied Engineering here at USF and the Florida Institute for Cybersecurity, Cyber Florida, also here at USF. All of these advantages are within arm's reach of GNSI, and we intend to utilize them all in creating a portfolio of practical, actionable solutions for 21st century challenge. So let me talk about how we're gonna do that, dig down to each one of those categories just a little bit deeper to talk about one level lower. So I'll start with science and technology. So the complexities of global and national security require research efforts, research in science and technology to inform policy, to find those solutions for current and emergent issues. These issues span a broad landscape, including conventional nuclear and space defense, bio threats, climate change, energy resiliency, food security, water sustainability, and I can go on and on. But the point I wanna make is when you think about national security, you can't think about the narrow traditional things that we, we like to go back to and revert to because it's comfortable. It is a much broader menu of threats that we face. Therefore, we must be equally innovative as we fashion a response. GNSI will serve to coordinate and support broad networks of research faculty and engineering expertise across the one USF system to address national and, and global security issues, particularly talking about current and future DOD technology turning points. Let me talk a little bit about human behavior and social dynamics. Understanding human dynamics defined as the actions and interactions of personal, interpersonal, and social contextual factors and their effects on behavioral outcomes, and that's a mouthful, and I, and I know that, and I apologize for it. It's essential to global and national security. GNSI will coordinate and support the necessary interdisciplinary expertise to expand our understanding of this rich and dynamic field. I had an opportunity while I was at US Central Command before I left command to do some work with USF in this field. And I know that my successor, General Carrilla, is equally interested in it. There's unique and groundbreaking work being conducted at USF in the field of human dynamics. And we wanna to continue to build on that as we go forward. And that will involve, again, the whole of USF, every, every college, every element of USF has a role to play in that. Additionally, uh, modeling and simulation, another ripe area that we're going to work with USF on going forward. We've been able to do some of that in the past with Central Command. That will continue. Finally, cybersecurity. Cyberspace and its underlying infrastructure represent significant vulnerabilities within the landscape of global and national security. Vulnerabilities impact wide-ranging infrastructure, everything from industrial production to port security. This is a key area that, that Cyber Florida is taking a look at right now. 
the way I, the way I describe it is this, the United States has the most powerful offensive cyber capabilities in the world. They're, they're, they're eye watering. If you go up to Fort Meade, Maryland, spend a day up there with the boys at NSA, you know, you, you leave and General Carrillo has done this too. You get in your car. The first thing you want to do is throw your phone out of the car. And then you want, you swear to yourself and others, you'll never be in a room with a computer again. And uh, so we have remarkable capabilities in this domain, but we also have a glass jaw. We are the most vulnerable society in the world to cyber attack, both direct cyber attack, but also disinformation. And so we, we, need, to, we need to address that. We need to work that problem. Cyber Florida will do that in concert with GNSI and other elements of the university. And we believe we can help that from the, from the GNSI platform. So how are we gonna do that? What are the ways that we're gonna do it? So a couple of things. First, outreach and engagement. Conferences like this, publications, academic journals, social media, digital outreach. We eventually wanna have a peer reviewed academic journal that is associated with GNSI that will be published with some frequency. Uh, that's probably a year or two away, but we want to we want to move to that we want to move to that standard because we believe there's a need for that kind of discourse in that in that field. Second thing is educational programs. Right now, USF is standing up a very good two-year degree program in national security studies here, designed to cater to people around the Tampa Bay area. We would like to build on that to polish a one-year program that would service a different population, serving U.S. officers and State Department people and other agencies that go away for professional schooling would try to get them down here for a year. Their advantages, their human advantages, who wouldn't want to come to Tampa for a year to go to school? Paid by the U.S. government, their, uh, their tuition's paid by Uncle Sam, their salary's paid by Uncle Sam. By definition, they're highly competitive people. And then they could go to duty at CENTCOM or SOCOM. So good for family life as well. The services will like that. There are a lot of reasons to make that attractive. So we're going to work that here over the next couple of years. And then also, I'll go back to a point I made earlier, research and support. The proper internal and external layers of oversight to provide the strategic guidance uh, to GNSI and to work with researchers across the university uh, as in, in these domains. We think it's an, a, tremendous, a tremendous opportunity there. The governance structure I've talked about a little bit. We'll have an internal uh, board of advisors uh, from faculty, the faculty deans. We'll have an external board of advisors. Mr. Knopp represents the first, the first member of that going forward. So we have a very good plan that we're beginning to set in place. I'm excited about it. Over the next couple of months, we'll begin to socialize this plan a little bit more with the enterprise across USF. So we get buy-in from everyone. We're not trying to duplicate anything that's here now because all the things we need to be successful are here now. We just need to optimize the way they are coordinated and presented to an external audience. And that's where we're really gonna, that's where we're really, I think we can make some money. So again, as Adib has said, I wanna remind you about our next conference. It's gonna be in March 7, 8, 9 here at the USF campus. Details will be coming out on that. In the fall of next year, we wanna do a technology centered conference here also here at USF. In the spring of 24, a year, a little over a year from now, we wanna think about maybe doing something at an international location. As we, begin, as we begin to work and build our international partners. Uh, so the, the, lo the location for that yet to be determined, but we wanna continue, to, we wanna continue with these conferences. We find them very valuable and I hope you find the one here today to be very valuable as well. So thanks for being here today. We've got a great day ahead of us. And now I'm gonna turn it over to our keynote speaker, General Eric Carrilla. Uh, Eric and I go back a ways together. Uh, he has had a remarkable career in the US Army. He commanded the Ranger Regiment arguably the best Colonel Command in the U.S. Army. He commanded the 82nd Airborne Division. He commanded the 18th Airborne Corps. We served together on the Joint Staff, and I was very lucky my first year in command to have Eric as my Chief of Staff here at U.S. Central Command. Uh, he's doing great work at, at CENTCOM and is recognized as one of the very brightest stars on active duty in the Department of Defense today. So let's give a big hand to Eric Carrillo. All right, good morning. President Law, thank, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And Frank, thank you for that introduction. Um, so I've been in command about eight months. Um, in that time, I spend about 50% of my time in the region. I commute to work to the Middle East and, the, and Central Asia and South Asia. 
um, right now. And I've spent time in 19 of the 21 countries, um, minus Iran for obviously reasons, and a Turkmenistan because of COVID at the time. Um, so I do spend quite a bit of my time in the region with both our service members, with our embassy teams, our diplomats, our partner nation uh, forces, our partner nation leaders to really understand the region. And through that, um, what I've come up with uh, with our team here is our strategic approach to CENTCOM, which can be defined in three words. And that's people, partners, and innovation uh, going forward. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is for us and the Middle East, Levant and Central Asia, a critical moment. Right now, CENTCOM is in search of innovative thought we're building a culture of innovation that seeks out new ideas about process, systems, and concepts, really in everything that we do. And there is so much wisdom in academia that can illuminate the way. So I'm heartened to see this university with the leadership of my predecessor in command and friend, former boss Frank McKenzie, partnering with CENTCOM. And there is quite a bit of partnering with CENTCOM, and I think more to come. So collected in this room is a lifetime of wisdom of great power competition in the Middle East the area for which CENTCOM holds resp military responsibility, as well as Central Asian states. So I'd like to focus my talk on three main items um, going forward. First, the Middle East sits at the crossroads of strategic competition, and we must maintain our competitive advantage there. Second, in order to maintain that advantage, the US military must partner strategically, and that requires sufficient force posture. And finally, CENTCOM at this moment is ideally suited to supercharge those resources and expand on those partnerships through the power of innovation. So let's get started. First, the Middle East sits at the crossroads of great power competition. The area for which CENTCOM holds US military responsibility is made up of 21 countries across 4.6 million square miles, teeming with 560 million people. This region contains half the world's known oil reserves as well as three of the world's most important maritime passageways, the Suez Canal, the Bab el Mandeb, and the Straits of Hormuz. Combined, more than 40% of global trade and more than half of all the world's container traffic traverses three, th these three passageways. Over 55,000 ships pass through those passageways in 2021. You remember last March when the ever given container ship was stuck in the Suez and the canal was obstructed? for six days. On the fourth day of that blockage alone, March 28th, the world lost 9.6 billion in commercial trade. The global economic loss over that six day period, over $64 billion. The United States consumer briefly realized the importance of a CENTCOM region. And let's not lose sight of the inconvenient truth. The Middle East remains the world's most important source of energy and a key global economic stability. This region produces 37% of the world's oil, 18% of its gas, and four of the top five OPEC oil producers are in the region, Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. The Middle East holds cultural and social relevance. The cradle of civilization, the region is majestic in landscape, ancient in history, and home of the three world's major religions. And this crowd will appreciate that the Middle East is home of some of the most important scientific, artistic, scholastic, and social contributions in all of world history. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the Middle East matters. The region is also characterized by fragile security environment rife with interstate conflict, civil wars, and humanitarian crisis. Many countries are faced with food insecurity, water shortages, rolling blackouts, and suffocating effects of climate change. All of these conditions are worsened by the inflation and wheat shortages wrought by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Nine of the 10 top most violent extremist organizations reside in the Middle East, and they desire and have the capability to spread instability, not only through the Middle East, but throughout the world. And many of these terrorist organizations have every desire to conduct attacks in the US and Europe. A spiller over these groups and their ideology into the US or Europe would prove catastrophic. You may not hear about it anymore, but ISIS vile ideology remains unconstrained and the group seeks to indoctrinate a new generation. Through all of this, Iran continues to undermine regional security, stability through militia groups, an eye-watering ballistic missile capability and UAV capability and routine threats to international waterways. 
Iran continues to violate sanctions and embargoes, proliferate weapons to its network of proxies and affiliates, and seize shipping vessels in international waters. Iran has now joined up with Russia in its illegal war in Ukraine, sending advanced weapons into the fight, and it steadfastly spreads chaos throughout the violent proxy groups funded by Tehran. Iranian-aligned groups routinely strike at American troops in both Iraq and Syria. Now, as the regime knows, its air force and naval power will never match ours. Iran's armed forces never fully recovered from the depletion it suffered during its crippling slog of a war with Iraq. With Iraq. Instead, to develop an asymmetric advantage, the regime invested in precise missiles, missiles with extended reach. It now has the largest and most diverse arsenal of such missiles in the Middle East, a stunning measure of missile capability it uses to coerce, intimidate, and bully its neighbors. Tehran has been manufacturing unmanned vehicles since 1985. The regime can now, now commands an arsenal of drone systems, ranging from small, short range to modern intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance units. They are building larger drones that can fly further with more increasingly deadly payloads. And with Chikpoa negotiations on pause, the region is very concerned about a nuclear armed Iran. This would cause all of us, this should cause all of us a measure of distress. I can tell you it is keeping the region up at night. And no one, no one can tell you how the protest movement will end. I can tell you that the regime has not even begun to bring the full weight of its capabilities and will to crack down on the protests. This regime has a system for beating back social unrest in the interest of regime survival. And that's how the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps was designed after the fall of the Shah. The real brutality of the streets on the streets of Iran has not yet started. Recently, Iran's weapons and advisors were seen in the battlefields of Ukraine alongside their Russian partners. An internationally isolated Iran has clearly thrown in its lot with an isolated Russia. The Middle East matters. It matters to Russia and it matters to China, both of whom are investing heavily in the region and since that is where this forum is really focused, let me dig in just a little bit, starting with China. China's goal as the world's leading, its goal is to serve as the world's leading superpower by 2049, puts the Middle East squarely in its crosshairs. As the second largest economy in the world, China has effectively leveraged soft power, increasing its influence by creating economic zones, providing infrastructure loans, investing in large port facilities, and increasing military hardware sales in the Middle East. China's efforts also include signing a 25-year strategic agreement with Iran. China's Belt and Road Initiative is setting the stage for a more active military role in the region while it's exploring and weakening the nations that are hosting Belt and Road Initiative nodes. We can already see that these relationships are severely stacked in China's favor and undermine the sovereignty of the hosts. We typically think of China as an Indo-PACOM issue, yet as a global competitor, its interests and activities extend far beyond that theater, and many of them are centered in CENTCOM. Some people believe American competition with China only occurs in the Taiwan Straits and the South China Sea. That is a very short-sighted, outdated view of the world. I'm not going to bludgeon you with data points to make the case that China is competing with us in the Middle East, but I'll give you a few facts and figures. And here are some of the data points, but I won't rattle them off. In terms of Chinese investment, we hear it loud and clear in the region. Just three months ago, I was in Islamabad. I had a meeting with General Bajwa, the former head of the Pakistani military, who recently changed out with, um, last week with General Munir. Bajwa was, and always has been, candid and direct. He said, we use both your and Chinese equipment. You do not understand how much China has closed the gap. So China, our pacing challenge, is clearly investing in the CENTCOM region. So now let's shift to Russia. Russia's objective to weaken Western security structures in the Middle East and Central Asia, and will continue to challenge US security interests in critical relationships in the region. Putin's interest in the Middle East range from energy transit to security relationships to military sales. Despite the recent damage to its reputation and influence, Russia is moving forward on several fronts to preserve its influence and access in the Middle East. For example, Moscow is creating an industrial zone near the Suez Canal, expected to attract $7 billion in investment. Russia is attempting to control events in Syria through a combination of arms and security agreements, private military companies, and basing of military forces. Russia also conducts several bilateral and multilateral exercises with a half dozen countries in the region, primarily with the former Soviet states. You see, within CENTCOM, 
We've also got the Central Asian states, which butt up against Russia. Since Catherine the Great in 1762, Russia has sought this region as part of its empire. This is in Russia's DNA. Its philosophical, almost religious sense, Russia has viewed the Central Asian states as its territory since the 1922 treaty with the creation of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The emphasis on ownership over Central Asia took on a fever pitch after World War II, when Stalin used the region for resource extraction and strategic depth. After its collapse, Russia remained active in Central Asia through the establishment of the Collective, treaty, Collective Security Treaty Organization, which it has used as an excuse to meddle in the affairs of its neighbors. Even today, Russia has extensive interests in Central Asia, spanning energy, military sales, counterterrorism, counter drug efforts, and others. So here's a slide that mirrors my China slide depicting Russian investment in the CENTCOM region. I'm not gonna read the points, but they tell a story. Russia wants in on the CENTCOM region. So global competition with Russia and China is manifest right now in the CENTCOM region. While there is a lot of reason for concern, there is also reason for optimism. Let's examine some positive trends. A survey conducted by the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change in London last year highlighted some interesting findings. First, a new generation in the Middle East is increasingly vocal and participatory in demanding both political and religious change. More than two thirds of the surveyed youth want their religious institutions to modernize and reduce their role in politics. The Middle East has been the center of mass mobilizations for liberalizing politics 10 times more often than the rest of the world over the last two decades. As a result, optimism is at its highest point in five years. As the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is unrecognizable from its closed form of just four years ago, the kingdom is opening up its society, making sweeping changes in civil rights and in information in a way that most in the kingdom celebrates, all while marginalizing Islamic hardliners. There are also signs of economic improvement. Annual venture capital investment in the region has tripled since 2017, while we're also seeing a jump in foreign military direct investments Foreign, foreign direct investments in many Middle Eastern countries are diversifying away from oil and into technology and tourism. Young adults in the region increasingly see entrepreneurship as a viable and desirable career choice. Further, in the wake of the Abraham Accords, the world saw countries with little history of diplomatic relations begin to let reconcile long-standing rifts. As a result, the improved Arab-Israeli relationships may generate as much as one trillion in a new economic activity, while collaboration across universities has greatly expanded. The inclusion of Israel into CENTCOM one year ago presents massive opportunities. For four decades, Israel was under the purview of US European Command. This ensured that a senior military commander partnered with the Israeli Defense Forces did also not partner with Arab militaries. Under Frank McKenzie's leadership, Israel was aligned into CENTCOM. Israel and the Arab minorities, it turns out, are seeing the same threat in Iran. They have common cause. Very quickly, stunning new partnerships were formed in the Gulf militaries and Israel as a hedge against Iran's drone and ballistic missile threat. It's a bit surreal to see the Israeli Defense Force Chief of Defense in the same room as his counterparts for the Middle East discussing air and missile defense. Meanwhile, Russia has damaged its standing in the Central Asian states because of its decisions and military performance in Ukraine. Increasingly, the states are cha charting courses independent of Moscow's lead, creeping opportunities, creating opportunities for us. So while the region represents a complexity of challenges, it also represents a change in, a, <clears throat> it presents a range of opportunities. We must be prepared to take advantage of these opportunities. We must be prepared to address these challenges. Doing so today requires leaning heavily on and investing in partnerships in a way that we have not done before. Over the past 20 plus years, CENTCOM has been the focus of much of the Department of Defense. This one is an unusual time in American history. We are fighting two wars at the same time. We're out of those wars now and have understandably downsized our force posture in the Middle East. The Department of Defense is now shifting its focus to our main pacing challenge, China. It's our only competitor able to combine all elements of national power into a coherent challenge to the international system. Therefore, it's logical that we should change our focus. That's where the National Defense Strategy directs us, and we at CENTCOM are fully aligned with that philosophy. So we don't have an enormous number of planes, ships, troops, and air defense systems we once had in the region just five years ago. So instead, we have to cultivate deep 
abiding partnerships that can serve as a hedge against China and Russia in the region while deterring Iran from its worst, most destructive behavior. You here at the University of South Florida understand the value of international cooperation. It's a testament to the institution that more than 50 countries are represented on this campus with more than 4,700 international students here, almost 10% of this Tampa campus. That's surely a great benefit to us all. Our partnerships must speak at our values. What I mean by that is that the relationships we build in the regime must be relational, they must be enduring, and they must be mutually beneficial. Contrast that with China's relationships, with our, which are usurious and purely transactional. Contrast our values with Russia, which bullies its Central Asian neighbors and beers, builds fear-based constructs. Our values and the enduring quality of our partnerships can win out, given the resources to do so. We're not gonna be able to partner with goodwill alone. We're not gonna be able to build deep abiding relationships with solely a positive attitude. No, nope, we must maintain a sufficient and sustainable force posture in the Middle East to partner. And that's what we have right now. We have enough troop, air power, and Patriot batteries, destroyers, and equipment to beat back what I call the abandonment narrative, the idea that we're taking our ball out of the Middle East and going home. That's just not gonna happen. We also need enough force present to present a flashpoint. As I said earlier, what happens in the Middle East does not stay in the Middle East. And to paraphrase, <laughs> to paraphrase Trotsky, you may not be interested in the Middle East, but the Middle East is interested in you. And given the range of opportunities and challenges across the region, the magnitude of international interest at stake in the CENTCOM region, we must be prepared to respond when regional security is threatened. Failing in this would put at risk the vital interests of our own nation as well as those of our allies. If we must relocate, reallocate resources from the Indo-Pacific and Europe to the Middle East to respond to crisis, we've just put implementation of the broader national defense strategy at risk for years. Now, Al-Qaeda and ISIS are largely degraded, no doubt, and I'm not what Stephen Walt calls a threat inflationist. I don't do that. But like I said, the ideology still hangs over parts of the Middle East, and a terrorist attack within the U.S. that originated within the Middle East would require a response. In fact, even an attempt of an attack <clears throat> of a commercial airliner or a city would likely demand some kind of realignment of resources. It's our responsibility at CENTCOM to prevent such a thing. That means we must have a globally sufficient and long-term sustainable amount of people, ships, planes, and air defense systems. As we look to fully prioritize military competition with China and Russia, implement the president's strategy and realign the global forces map, CENTCOM remains what I call the most likely theater of distraction. We can prevent a distraction with the right amount of resources. With those sufficient resources, it's critical we outcompete our adversaries for influence in the region. One of those tools with which we partner is foreign military sales. Our foreign military sales, or FMS, is an okay program. It has been since 1951. In fact, American FMS is how many NATO countries in Europe develop the military capability they have today. But when the system is overly managed, overly bureaucratized, it becomes entirely too slow to meet the security demands of our partners. That being said, 95% of all FMS goes pretty well. 5% does not. 80% of that 5% is in the CENTCOM region. Don't get me wrong, our partners want to buy American, but it takes too long and can be held up for various reasons. China can move faster without any end user agreements. Our foreign military sales system is literally pushing our partners to our competitors and the system must be overhauled. We should also recognize the power of institutions to impart stability. We led the building and implementation of the post-World War II system that stabilized much of the world for more than 75 years. We need such thinking about the Middle East. The Abraham Accords is a great step in that direction, but it is not the end point. Overlapping and mutually reinforcing military, economic, and political agreements should be our goal. There's one more element needed to accelerate our competition with China and Russia in the CENTCOM area of responsibility. That element ties together the resources and partners we'll need to put our competitors through the paces. This leads to my final point, that the Middle East is the ideal location for innovation, for new approaches and new technologies. The region is a literal sandbox for experimentation and innovation. The technological landscape is shifting rapidly in the CENTCOM region in both the military and civilian sectors. On the military side, we are seeing a rapid proliferation of advanced weaponry such as drones and various applications of advanced computing. 
The suppliers of these systems are countries we would not have expected just 10 years ago. We're still coming to terms with how rapidly these capabilities can spread. Battlefields of the near future, particularly in the Middle East, are likely to be characterized by AI, drones, and hypersonics more than they are by IEDs and small arms. On the civilian side, digitization, connecting all people and states is accelerating. Soon, some of that will be driven by technologies developed in the Middle East, enabled by rapidly growing venture capital investments. 190 years ago, Carl von Clausewitz wrote that the nature of war does not, cannot change. That remains true today. War remains a political act manifest as a contest of wills. However, Clausewitz also told us that the character of warfare, the means by which war is fought, evolves over time. We're in the midst of one of those evolutions as war shifts to the domains of cyber, space, and artificial intelligence. And here's another stunning change occurring before us. For decades after World War II, thinking about the nature of warfare was driven by the Pentagon and defense industrial base. Today, valuable insights about the manifestation of military competition comes from places like Silicon Valley, from academia, from think tanks, from institution and engagements such as this one. Techniques for applying the elements of national power must keep pace with the technology and social change. Industrial era concepts are unable to manage AI era threats. Given our proximity to many of these conflicts currently playing out in the world and the social and political changes taking place in the region, CENTCOM must become the front line for innovative thought and take the lead in figuring out the implications of these forces and trends. For the thought leaders and practitioners of statecraft and international relations who are joining me in this forum today, I challenge you to consider that innovative thought streams require considering underserved and overlooked niches and spheres of influence. The pace of change requires considering untested ideas, unbridled by the academic theories and geographic boundaries we have inherited from the past. In our headquarters staff, I expect the dynamism of our region to be viewed and dissected in seismic terms versus tectonic. That might require looking at the region through a tribal lens or possibly a financial lens. What other lenses should we be applying? Generational, climactic, access to the basic education or STEM? These are the questions we are asking. Additionally, consider ongoing pressure points. The world's largest humanitarian crisis in Yemen, the suffering and rot fought, uh, brought by the floods in Pakistan or the protests in Iran. A firm public response to any of these by the United States may have greater impact in terms of influence and impact among a wider range of audience than say a purely kinetic solution to an Iranian missile attack. A coordinated messaging campaign in response to any of these might give us influential foothold in the, if, in the information environment. When we consider our influence in the region, force is no longer the primary tool. Military might in concert with trusted partnerships, diplomacy and information will likely build more trust, empathy, and admiration in the region. In conclusion, we are faced with a critical moment for global competition, one that, must, <clears throat> one that we must advantage, and I'm certain we will. For the Middle East, it is a decisive decade. The region will align with our competitors, look inward and strengthen ties with the United States. All three of these outcomes are possible. Russia is weakened. We have the opportunity to weaken her still. With small investments in Central Asia that don't imperil the precarious position of our partners there, we may be able to place additional pressure on Putin over time. Should we smooth out our laden foreign military sales program, we can create a competition gap with China that will be difficult for Beijing to close. When FMS is not overmanaged and weighed down by bureaucracy, the system works. It can work for our partners in the Middle East. CENTCOM is ready to meet the moment. We understand the technology. We understand the value of partnerships. We understand the opportunities before us. With the advances made in innovation, we have the technology to integrate faster, to make decisions faster, to create decision advantage. We have a critical window and we must take advantage of it. And after all, so much of that is dependent upon us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Well, the conference is off to a fantastic start. And once again, thank you so much, General McKenzie and General Corella, for your insightful remarks and for setting the tone that will resonate throughout the conference. And indeed, USF in partnership with everyone here will serve or try to serve as that catalyst for applying knowledge to respond to the current events and future security threats and challenges.
Now we'll take about a half an hour break to let our panel set up. And uh, I kindly request everyone to be back sharp 1045 because you don't wanna miss the next panel. We got a great panelist here and thank you so much. So we'll take about a half an hour break. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are ready to get started with our first panel, which will discuss Russia's strategies in the region following the war in Ukraine. And we are happy to have with us as moderator for our first panel, Dr. Alexa Poulis, who is a professor and director of USF Institute of Russian, European, and Eurasian Studies. Dr. Alexa Poulis specializes in Russian politics and society, modern Europe, and the former Soviet Union. I'll turn the discussions over now to her, who will introduce the panel speakers, facilitate the discussion, and lead the question and answer session that follows. Golfo. Thank you so much, Adib, and thank you all for being here. Good morning. Uh, my name, as Adib said, is Golfo Alexopoulos. I'm director of USF's uh, five-year-old Institute for the Study of Russia, uh, Europe, and uh, Eurasia. So I, it is my distinct honor to be the moderator for this opening panel on the Russian invasion, Russian strategy in the Middle East and Central Asia after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we're extremely fortunate to have four distinguished panelists for the opening panel. Uh, they include Rear Admiral Nicholas Homan, Director of J2 at CENTCOM, Ambassador Philip Kosnett, former ambassador to Kosovo and senior fellow at the Transatlantic Defense and Security Program at CEPA, the Center for European Policy Analysis. Dr. Dmitry Gorenberg, center associate at Harvard's Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies and senior research scientist at CNA, the Center for Naval Analyses and Dr. Michael Slavo Slabochikov, Chair and Associate Professor of Political Science at Troy University. Our, question, our discussion this morning will begin with uh, opening remarks from each of the panelists and with some follow-up questions and a moderated discussion from me. And then we will open it up uh, for discussion and Q&A with, uh, with our audience, with both in person and online. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly set the stage for our conversation by providing some context uh, for understanding Europe's largest ground war since World War II. Uh, the war is now in its 10th month with estimates of over 100,000 dead on either side, uh, Russia and Ukraine. And nearly 8 million refugees, Europe's largest, largest displacement in decades. The expectation in both Russia and the West that this would be a short war, that Zelensky would flee, his government would collapse, uh, that pro-Kremlin sympathizers across Ukraine would take control in various regions. Uh, these, of course, did not materialize. Instead, we are witnessing a war of, that seems to be a war of attrition, one that no one believes will end anytime soon, and that some have compared to the Iran-Iraq war, uh, a war that dragged on for years. For both sides, this is an existential conflict. Uh, Putin doesn't recognize Ukraine as a distinct country or Ukrainians as a distinct ethnicity. In 2008, Vladimir Putin told then President George W. Bush, you understand, George, that Ukraine, it's not even a state. What is Ukraine? A significant part was given by us. Putin's goal is to take back land that he believes belongs to Russia. In July 2021, just prior to the invasion, Putin published an article entitled On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians, in which he argued that the Bolsheviks, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, were so generous in drawing borders and bestowing territorial gifts. The Bolshevik leaders were chopping the country into pieces when they created constituent republics. And that one fact is crystal clear, Russia was robbed. And so Putin believes that he is returning to Russia uh, territories that were robbed. In September, 
Putin illegally annexed four Ukrainian regions, Kherson, Zaporozhye, and this was uh, following the the uh, recognition of the independence of Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, even though his forces didn't completely control these regions. By annexing these territories, Putin was basically saying to Russia's elite and to Russian citizens that there is no turning back. The war, Russia will see the war to its end. At the present time, Russia controls roughly 40,000 square miles in Ukraine, or about 17% of the country, many territories in Ukraine's east and south. Territorial gains are important for Putin. In a meeting just yesterday, he said that Russia's annexation of Ukrainian territories constitute a major achievement of the operation. In fact, I would, um, I would advise any of you who are interested to watch him on YouTube. This was from yesterday. He was quite pleased with himself uh, in declaring that Russia has seized territory. And he described these land gains as a significant result for Russia, noting that the Sea of Azov has become Russia's internal sea. And he recalled how Tsar Peter the Great fought to get access over it. So yesterday was not the first time that Putin referenced uh, Peter the Great and made analogies between himself uh, and Peter uh, the Great. In June of this year, he compared himself to Peter the Great, saying that the two shared quests to win back Russian lands. And I quote, uh, Peter the Great waged the Great Northern War for 21 years. It would seem that he was at war with Sweden, that he took something from them, but he did not take from them. He returned to Russia what was Russia, what was Russia's. And it is also our lot to return to Russia what is hers and to strengthen our country. So this imperial war of conquest has had uh, tremendous global consequences, uh, both for uh, Ukraine, for Russia, and for the world. Uh, Ukraine has experienced uh, genocide, a uh, destruction of its critical infrastructure. For Russia, the consequences have been uh, catastrophic. Uh, the Russian economy shrank 4% in the third quarter of uh, 2022, reflecting sanctions and the harmful economic effects of the mass mobilization that Putin uh, declared in September. Uh, Russia will, as a result, have to reduce its spending on schools, hospitals, and roads in order to uh, shift its resources into uh, security and the military. So to elaborate on the global consequences of this war, I want to turn now to our panelists uh, and ask uh, Rear Admiral uh, Homan to get us started. Uh, as I indicated, each panelist will begin with opening remarks. We'll move then to a moderated discussion and then open it up to all of you for questions. Thank you. Please call. I think so. Oh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, before I begin, I'd like to express my, uh, my gratitude to the leadership here at USF, and especially to the new director of the GNIS, uh, General McKinsey. Um, thank you for the invitation to come and participate in this, sir. Um, it's an honor to be here uh, and be part of this esteemed panel. Um, I'm a dumb kid from Iowa um, who joined the military right out of, right out of high school and uh, have benefited from uh, U.S. government's uh, uh, desire to push me through and, and, and allow me to, to go to some higher education and some opportunities. So uh, reading through the bios of the, the folks I'm sitting next to, it was quite humbling, um, the number of and the amount of production and the amount of uh, publications that they've done and speaking engagements and stuff. Um, uh, I look forward to learning a lot from, uh, from this, uh, this evolution today. To open, I'd like to provide an assessment of Russia's current Middle East and Central Asia strategy and some of their activities as we see it on the heels of Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. From our perspective today, Russia is different from what it was in the heyday as a center of the powerful Soviet Union. Today, Russia relies on a pragmatic and opportunistic approach to its engagement with countries in the Middle East and Central Asia. Moscow is accomplishing this malign design by presenting itself as a great power, a regional power broker, and a reliable partner. 
Russia further strives to leverage ties to countries in the central command area of responsibility to support its strategic objectives by ensuring regime survival, promoting, promoting a multipolar world order and safeguarding Russia's sphere of influence in the former Soviet controlled area. In a quote often attributed to Mark Twain, we hear that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. History students in this audience would therefore see a familiar refrain in Russia's actions in the Central Asian states. Going back to the 19th century, Russian monarchs and leaders have always viewed the region as critical to their national security. Using a set of schemes, deceptions, and outright use of force, Russia has always sought to use Central Asia as a sort of buffer against encroaching powers, be they the British, the Chinese, or the Persian empires. Another famous writer, Rudyard Kipling, coined the term the great game to describe the jockeying and intrigues that occur among great powers at a time to secure a foothold in Central Asia. Today, we are reliving just that. Again, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. The difference today is that Moscow can now rely on cultural ties with former Soviet states to maintain primacy in diplomatic, security, economic, and what's very new today in the information sphere um, of engagements to influence and develop in this very critical region to prevent openings for outsiders to come in and influence. Some of these, for example, the information environment were things that were never available to the czars. We continue to watch as, as they develop new techniques. As I speak, Russia maintains a military presence in Tajikistan at the 201st military base, Russia's, Russia's largest military base outside of its borders. And it has an airfield in Kyrgyzstan as well. Furthermore, Russia leverages its dominant role in Eastern oriented security and economic organizations, such as the Collective Security Treaty Organization, NATO with less strings from their perspective, the Eurasia Economic Union and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization to insulate participating countries from Western influence. These organizations also enable Moscow to claim it represents a block of countries, reinforcing its perceived great power status and ability to counter the West and Western de democracies. While the Middle East is not central to Russia's overall foreign strategy, Moscow arguably views its 2015 intervention in Syria as a major strategic success, an opportunistic win that has enabled it to project power into the Eastern Mediterranean and demonstrate its ability to threaten NATO's southern flank. Russia cemented its hold in Syria by signing a 49-year lease for the port of Tartus and announced plans to invest $500 million in port development. Russia also developed an airfield to accommodate its bombers and expand operational capacity in the region. In light of these significant developments, Middle East and Central Asia watchers are rightfully wondering how will Russians design designs and relationships in the region change because of the operation in Ukraine. From where we sit, Russia's overall strategy in the Middle East and Central Asia likely will remain relatively unaffected. Even as it struggles to overcome sanctions and meet military needs, Moscow can always depend on Syria, Iran, and others to look broadly, um, to look more broadly across the region. They will leverage other partners, China, Venezuela, DPRK, kind of what we see is other autocracies to kind of counterbalance the democracies. At the same time, Russia will seek to deepen and expand relationships with other countries in the region. An illustration of such an arrangement was the transfer of hundreds of unmanned aerial systems to Russia, Moscow, which Moscow is employing in Ukraine. We can also expect to see Moscow use an opportunistic bilateral relationship in the Middle East and Central Asia as it tries to break its isolation, undermine US relationships, and build a more multipolar world benefiting Russian interests. Evidence of this unsavory, unsavory design materializes frequently in Putin's speeches, where he almost always calls for a new geopolitical order in which Iran and other Middle Eastern countries could play a leading role. As if its overt assault on the rules-based international order wasn't bad enough, Russia is trying to ensure global oil production remains in line with its interests. 
In early September, there are many who believe Russia influenced and certainly benefited from the organization of the petroleum exporting countries, also known as OPEC, to cut oil production by 100,000 barrels per day in an attempt to keep oil prices high enough to help fund Russia's military adventure in Ukraine. That being said, we are now seeing the G7 price caps on Russian oil exports to Europe now in play. The Kremlin will no doubt be calculating its next move. Finally, and despite its poor showing on the battlefields of Ukraine, it's worth remembering that Russia remains a major Middle Eastern arms supplier. Historically, arms sales have been an arena in which Moscow has been able to compete with us in the region. The CG mentioned the FMS and some of the, the challenges that we have there. However, I suspect that going forward, countries in the region may be more skeptical about acquiring equipment of dubious quality, especially if engaging in such transactions might subject them to sanctions, potential opportunity for us. With that, I will stop and uh, thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this panel. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Admiral Holman. We now have Ambassador Kostnick. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, this is a remarkable panel. A tremendous group of participants in the audience, and I understand online as well. So I will try to keep my initial remarks uh, short. I will echo the Admiral in thanking the organizers of this, uh, including my friend, uh, General McKenzie, uh, who, with whom I first served in, uh, in Afghanistan 12 years ago. And it's, uh, it's nice to see you transition and own a necktie now, Frank. So, you know, <laughs> congratulations on that. Uh, I will not repeat everything that uh, Dr. Alexopoulos said about what Russia wants. I, I will say, I, I don't think Putin is attempting to, to recreate the Soviet Union. I think he is attempting to recreate the Russian empire. That is a fact that is not lost on the Swedes and in particular the Finns, which is why they uh, have broken with longstanding policy to seek membership in NATO. Uh, I would like to congratulate Mr. Putin for doing more to strengthen Western solidarity in opposition to Moscow than any Western leader uh, over decades. Uh, I won't go into great detail on this, uh, on the issue of whether or not uh, Russia's move into Ukraine was meant to forestall a NATO threat to, uh, to, to Russian independence. There's been a lot of discussion, a lot of scholarship on this. Uh, I will simply say, I do not believe that Russia was responding to the threat of so-called NATO enlargement. Uh, and note that those countries in, uh, in the Baltics uh, and elsewhere in Eastern Europe that have joined NATO over the last couple of decades did not do so under American or West European pressure. They did so voluntarily and they requested, uh, they requested membership. So let's talk a little bit about how the former Soviet states are aligning in response to this. Uh, I think that uh, it's well established that the Baltic countries have taken a very tough line against Moscow, uh, more so than what, um, what Mr. Rumsfeld many years ago referred to as old Europe. Now, the Eastern European countries and the Balts understand, they know Moscow, they understand Moscow's bullying tactics, and they, want, they have remarkably punched above their weight in standing up to it and really doing a lot alongside the United States to force countries in, uh, in Western Europe to accept the reality that uh, Putin's Russia is a threat not only to Ukraine, but to Europe as a whole. It, the situation in the Caucasus deserves some attention. And here we can see that Russian influence is for the moment at least fading as, uh, as people see that Russia has bitten off more than it can chew in Ukraine and doesn't have the hard power and soft power to influence events in the Caucasus to the extent it had did as recently as 2020, where Putin could be the peacemaker and step in and negotiate a peace deal between Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, what we now see 
is, and others may have different views on this, and I hope we'll have a discussion of it. What we now see is Azerbaijan acting very much as, uh, as a, an associate of Turkey, as a junior partner of Turkey, and you know, acting to assert its, uh, its security and economic interests in the Caucasus, while Russia is not really in a position to do very much to support Armenia. Okay. What about Central Asia, which, unlike the Caucasus, is in the CENTCOM area of operations? Uh, the Central Asian states have, in disparate ways, resisted being drawn into Putin's adventurism in Ukraine and laid down markers that they are not going to follow uh, Russia's line when it doesn't meet their interests. Uh, just a few points. Uh, Kazakhstan is geographically the closest country to Russia. Uh, Kazakhs often don't even think of themselves as Central Asian. If you ask for a map of Central Asia in Kazakhstan, you will get a map which does not include Kazakhstan, for example. Uh, in, uh, in January of this year, the, uh, the CSTO, the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which some people have referred to as, as a NATO analog. I mean, that's, that's kind of facile, but we don't have a lot of time here. Yeah. Uh, for the first time in its history, sent troops into a member country in response to an Article 4 request uh, from the government of, of Kazakhstan. I mean, President Tokayev in Kazakhstan said, we face a, a terrorist threat, we need help. Russia sent a couple of thousand troops in. They left after 10 days after not firing a shot. And I think once the dust cleared, it became clear that there wasn't really a terrorist threat uh, to Takayo's government. There was just domestic political pressure on him. Anyway, the Russians came in, the Russians left. And shortly thereafter, Putin sought Kazakh troops to join him in his adventure in Ukraine. And Tokayev said no, and Tokayev has given a number of interviews where he said, we are not obliged to kowtow to Moscow. We are not obliged to follow Russia's lead just because they, they did us a solid there. Uh, Tokayev has not helped with sanctions evasion, uh, and he has not pushed, the, pushed back the thousands and thousands of Russian draft dodgers who traveled to Kazakhstan after uh, after Russia announced its partial mobilization. Similarly, Uzbekistan, which has the largest population in the region, a country where I used to serve, a country which is very much part of what the Russians call Ruski Mir, you know, uh, the Russian world, yeah. uh, surprised many observers when it refused, like Kazakhstan, to back Putin's play. I mean, both countries have refused to, uh, to accept Russia's, uh, Russia's declaration that the Donetsk and Luhansk republics in Ukraine are now independent. Uh, the longstanding, the veteran foreign minister of Uzbekistan, uh, foreign minister Kamilov, gave a speech in March of 2022 when he said that Uzbekistan would support the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Uh, Putin was by all accounts furious about this threatened to ship home the millions of Uzbek guest workers from Russia to Uzbekistan to create other trouble for the country. And in fact, Russia is, I don't, I don't mean to delve into, into conspiracy theories here, but you know, I don't, I don't have access to the sort of information that the Admiral does anymore. Uh, but Russia is suspected of having played a role in, uh, in demonstrations, violent demonstrations, in the Uzbek region of Karakal Pakistan uh, in, uh, in, in last spring. Uh, bear with me for a second. So Uzbekistan, the president of Uzbekistan had moved to alter Uzbek's constitution to reduce the level of autonomy of the Karakal Pak uh, autonomous region of Uzbekistan. Uh, Karakal Paks reacted very negatively to this. Uh, and uh, there were there were demonstrations, and uh, Uzbekistan and the Uzbek government withdrew its proposed modifications to the constitution. Again, there are reports that the Russians were behind that, or at least uh, influenced it in an attempt to remind Tashkent, who was really boss. Right. In October 
uh, there, was, uh, there was a summit of Central Asian leaders and Russia in which the president of Tajikistan, a longtime ally of Russia, uh, took Putin to task on video, I mean, at a table much like this one, you know, uh, complaining that Russia did not show the proper amount of respect to the Central Asian republics, that, uh, that, he, that Putin treated his Central Asian neighbors as if they were a developing country. I mean, he, he used rather, you know, frankly, the racist language saying you treat us like Africans, you know, uh, which, which in, a, in a, you know, Russian world context, you know, was quite an insult. Uh, and if you actually go on YouTube and watch that, you can also find your way to videos of Putin sitting uh, at uh, getting ready for various bilateral meetings with Central Asian uh, officials where he was left waiting, you know, in his chair while he was being dissed by all these other Central Asian presidents showing up 15 minutes late to the meeting. That may sound trivial, but Putin has, has had a habit of doing that to world leaders for years to try to show people his boss. So you could see how the Central Asian leaders were relishing the fact that the worm had turned a little bit. Okay, but, and here's my big but. Some people look at that sort of thing and they, and, you know, they say these are manifestations that Russia is losing its grip on Central Asia. I think we have to be careful not to exaggerate that. I view these kinds of developments as evolutionary rather than revolutionary, reflecting the longtime desire of the Central Asian countries to balance Russian influence against Chinese influence and Western influence in the country. And, you know, and take advantage of the fact that all of these country, all of these so-called uh, superpowers are pursuing you know, economic and security benefits in the region. So you know, they are going to continue uh, to, to try to seek that balance. And even you know, Ramon, when Ramon was, uh, was, dime, was yelling at Putin, he wasn't yelling at him, he was kind of, you know, twisting the knife. He wasn't, he didn't mention Ukraine. He wasn't complaining that Russia had been out of line in invading another former Soviet state. He just said basically that Moscow was not, uh, was not giving enough love to the Central Asians. So I think it's important, and I'll come back to this, to resist the urge to look at the great game in Central Asia, which is definitely a thing, and imagine that we are going to, to flip the game board, you know, to flip the, the space on the game map from red to blue. You know, this is going to remain contested space among us, the Chinese, the Russians, and others into the future. I'll come back to that. Okay. Third topic, Turkey. Uh, Turkey is not in the CENTCOM area. Neither the Department of Defense nor the Department of State consider Turkey to be a Middle Eastern country, but it sure influences everything that happens in the Middle East and Central Asia day in and day out. And nobody is more uh, aware of that than President Erdogan. Now, a few points. First, I would be skeptical of anyone who looks at Erdogan's policies and decides that Erdogan is pro-Putin. Erdogan is pro-Erdogan. And even though uh, people, sometimes refer to him as an autocrat, even as a dictator. The fact is that Turkey is a democratic country. He's facing a tough election in 2023, and he is going to uh, take steps in the international arena that are going to strengthen his position domestically. So he is, for example, playing hardball with Finland and Sweden over their, uh, their accession to NATO. And I don't think anyone who has ever sat across a table from the Turks was surprised that the Turks took a transactional, you know, business-like approach to this. I mean, Turkish diplomacy, way before Erdogan became its leader, was, was very tough and strategic. And when they, when they had leverage, they would use it. So they have a bigger beef against Sweden than they do against Finland uh, related to what the Turks consider uh, Swedish indulgence of the PKK and other terrorist groups 
but it's not it's not a surprise that they are using this opportunity. So it, it what what Erdogan is not doing is he is not blocking or attempting to block Swedish and Finnish membership in NATO as a favor to uh, to Putin. He's doing it for his own reasons and you know, out of both political and economic opportunism. Uh, I would note that Turkey sees itself as not just a, a, a growing regional power, but as a growing global power. If you ever watch CNN or other American news stations, you may have seen you know, an endless stream of advertisements from Turkish airlines reminding you that THY flies to more destinations around the world than any other airline. You know, it used to be Pan Am back in the day that could say that. Now it's THY. Uh, Turkey uh, is a major provider of aid in, uh, in the Middle East, in Africa. So when Turkey stepped in to attempt to moderate a deal between uh, Kyiv and Moscow to get grain flowing through the Black Sea, to destination countries again, he wasn't doing that just in a European context. He was doing it to show his leadership to African and Middle Eastern audiences that relied on uh, that relied on grain exports from Russia and from Ukraine. All right. Okay. Fourth point: How should we grade U.S. leadership on the events sparked by the renewed Russian aggression of 2022? I think that uh, Putin was taken by surprise by the degree of unity uh, uh, among the European states and between the United States and Europe in opposing, in opposing his, in his renewed aggression. Notice I don't say invasion, I say renewed aggression because as you all know, he first invaded Ukraine in 2014. Uh, I think that um, as I said earlier, nobody has done more to rebuild NATO solidarity than Putin after the, you know, the tensions between the United States and Western Europeans over the last few years and the failure in Afghanistan. But I would also note the failure of US diplomacy, Western European diplomacy, to bring a lot of non-Western countries on board. You know, India has not signed on to the sanctions against Russia. Uh, there are many uh, other countries in Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa that you know, have chosen to at least stay neutral in the conflict. And I think that those of us who spent 20 years fighting the global war on terror, you know, have to have to reflect on why that is. And I think a big part of it is there's a very common view in the Middle East and Africa that the Americans invade countries whenever the mood strikes them for their own, their own purposes, sometimes leaving things in disarray. I mean, aside from Iraq and Afghanistan, remember when, uh, when NATO got rid of Gaddafi in Libya, you know, and you know, hoping, uh, and hope is not a plan, that something resembling a stable democracy would emerge. And we didn't have much of a plan, you know, and Libya is pretty far from a stable democracy. So people and governments, as well as just people sitting in cafes, say, why should we get involved in some border war in Europe, you know, just because the Yankees are asking us to. So, you know, we have a lot of work to do to, to rebuild our influence in much of the world. And I think this is a pretty stark reminder of it. Okay. So that brings me to my final point, final point. Okay. Where do we go from here? What lessons do we learn from all of this? All right, so first, my first, my first piece of advice uh, to people in government, to people in the military is do not get cocky. Do not think just because the Central Asians are, you know, are kind of showing their strength vis-a-vis -vis Russia and standing up to the Russians means that they want to break with Russia. The economic, the security, the social, the cultural ties are centuries long and very deep. And we're not just gonna displace the Russians, even before we get to talking about China, which I know is gonna be uh, the subject of the next conference. Now, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was some optimistic giddy talk in places like Washington and Ankara that the Central Asians and you know, other former Soviets were just going to shove the Russians out, you know, and they weren't going to have a role anymore. That may have happened in the Baltics. It has not happened in uh, in Central Asia. 
I'm also reminded, because this is something else that I and many of the other people in this room lived, when, uh, when we occupied Iraq in 2003, there was a lot of giddy talk in the Coalition Provisional Authority and on Capitol Hill that we were going to displace Iranian influence in Iraq, notwithstanding the geography and the centuries of religious and cultural and economic ties. I mean, uh, to, to, to beat this horse a little more, you know, imagine if some foreign country thought it was going to displace American economic and social and uh, law enforcement influence over Canada and Mexico, you know, not happening. So I think that we have to recognize this is not black and white, that this is going to remain contested space. All right, fine. next point. We should not feel intimidated. Uh, American diplomacy needs to continue to project our values in addition to promoting our interests. Uh, there's a lot of skepticism in the world today about America, especially when Americans talk about democracy. You know, I was a chief of mission uh, over the last five years, both in Turkey and in Kosovo, two very different countries with very different stances towards the United States. But in, in, in Turkey, you would certainly hear all the time from talking heads, from people in government, from people in the street, that, you know, look at American democracy. It's, uh, if it's not failing, it's certainly not having a good moment. You know, what do you guys have to teach us? Why should we listen to you? Uh, I believe we need to overcome you know, any sense of intimidation and continue to speak out, to pursue the values that we stand for, democracy, peace, justice, you know, economic freedom. This is not a time for isolationism, and this is not a time for weakness, but we should not pretend, at the same time, we should not pretend that we have all the answers and that you know, our traditional talking points about following the American model are gonna, are gonna win the day for us. Uh, you know, a phrase that I have used to describe this is strategic humility. You know, we need to continue to lead, but we need to acknowledge that our country is not perfect. We don't have all the answers and we have to do some listening along with the bloviating. Okay. So in that context, I think it's important for us not to get angry when countries that are our partners have their own strategic interests, you know, and pursue them in their own way. Uh, example of this is Turkey's attitude towards Sweden and Finland. We should oppose what Turkey is doing. We should you know, negotiate with Turkey. We should use incentives and disincentives to get Turkey to come on board. Uh, I could give other examples of, of partners where you know, we need to use carrots and sticks and our powers of persuasion to get them to move forward. But you know, we shouldn't act outraged when other countries see the world differently. Okay. And the last point I'll make, thank you for really being so patient. Yeah. The very last point <laughs> is we need to find a way to, uh, to convince people overseas that the United States is not going to change course politically every four years so that they cannot trust any agreements, any, any commitments we make. Uh, we have to be able to get back to uh, to uh, get back. We need to find a way to strengthen bilateral political agreement on core foreign policy issues so that both adversaries and friends know what to expect from us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Kostnick. Next, we have Dr. Dimitri Gorenberg. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to the organizers and to Adib particularly for, for uh, inviting me to be here. The, the challenge with, uh, as, as we go along here, it's harder and harder to say something that hasn't already been said by one of the, the previous speakers, but I'll try to keep repetition uh, to a minimum. Um, so uh, the first thing I wanna talk about is uh, the what are the Russian kind of security goals? Uh, and uh, I think they've been actually been fairly constant for a number of years and and and, there, and the Russian foreign policy really stems from two uh, two key drivers. One is to control its immediate uh, neighborhood, um, 
I don't necessarily uh, think that uh, uh, Putin is trying to reconstruct either the Soviet Union or the Russian Empire. I think he's trying to just control that region. And in some cases, that means an annexation, as as we see in Ukraine. In other cases, it just means sort of domin trying to dominate the other go uh, governments while they retain their, their independence. Uh, the second uh, goal that's been driving Russian foreign policy under Putin is uh, kind of uh, trying to to restore uh, Russia's what what he sees as Russia's rightful seat at the big boys table, kind of uh, kind of uh, the the uh, Russia's position of global influence and ability to uh, uh, interact with the United States and um, and more recently with China as an equal uh, and to set the rules of the game, uh, and so in order to do that. Uh, uh, the Russian government has been looking to expand its global influence, so beyond just that region where it wants to have direct influence, but to kind of, uh, to have more influence in uh, the world as a whole. Um, and that is where I would uh, argue uh, there have been some setbacks as a result of Russia's uh, surprisingly for most, uh, uh, certainly for, for the Russian government and also for most observers, surprisingly poor performance uh, in, in the Ukraine war. Um, Russia has, uh, has somewhat narrowed its focus over the last year. Uh, it's, uh, you know, through because it's had to focus on, on Ukraine, because it's been distracted, because there are domestic challenges uh, and so forth. Prior to the war, it was looking to increase its influence. It's pretty, in pre some pretty far-flung uh, uh, regions. Africa was getting a lot of attention, Latin America, uh, uh, Asia other than, I mean, there's, there's a long relationship with China, but Asia other than China was, was Southeast Asia, uh, South Asia, certainly. These were all areas where Russia, uh, you know, not to mention the Middle East, which I'll get to in more detail in a minute, uh, all areas where, where Russia was trying trying to, to make a play. Uh, now we're in a place where uh, Russia's more trying to avoid losing what they've already developed. They're not doing that much to expand relations with, let's say, Venezuela, Libya, uh, Southeast Asian states, India. It's just kind of trying to hold on to what they've got. And that's a change that I, I think has, has come about over the last eight months or so. Uh, it's much more focused now on a few key relationships. So the big one is China. Uh, uh, Russia sees uh, Russian leaders see China as uh, necessary to be a counterweight to the United States and to the West on the international scene. So that that relationship is really critical for Russia. Uh, it's been critical for a number of years, and but it's but it's even gained in importance in the last year. Uh, second area where, that uh, Russia has been focusing on is, is trying to find potential weak points in the Western alliance. Uh, uh, Ambassador mentioned the uh, greater unity in uh, in the West and in NATO, and that's true. But there are certain countries that uh, the Russia sees as potential weak points. Hungary is one. Uh, Turkey is another, as so already discussed. Uh, and and so those are areas where the Russian government is trying to exploit tensions, fissions, differences in interests, and so forth. Uh, certainly. Uh, you know, if other countries, if in the in the West, if opportunities arise, uh, France, uh, uh, you know, the slight differences in emphasis with what Macron says versus what Biden says, those are those can be highlighted in in the Russian media for sure. Uh, the the change in Italian government was seen as a potential opportunity. It didn't turn out that way, but but nonetheless, so uh, those are the kinds of things they're looking for. Uh, and then, and then uh, the Middle Eastern uh, oil states and Iran, and I'll, uh, and uh, and let me let me uh, address those uh, in a little more detail in a second. Uh, the uh, as uh, the one other area before I get to the Middle East, one other area that I think Russian influence has been shrinking a bit, and again, I'm gonna kind of parallel what, what the ambassador said, is uh, the uh, influence in Central Asia. And, and it's, it's certainly not, a, it's not that Russia's withdrawing from Central Asia. It's not that, that it's not gonna turn blue for sure. But, but I think it is important that Kazakhstan 
went from depending on Russian intervention from regime survival in January to making very clear statements by the summer and the fall that it was searching for other potential partners. Uh, that, that's something that, that I think is noticed uh, in Moscow. Certainly there's been a lot of discussion in Moscow about uh, ungrateful Kazakhstan. Uh, you see that in the media all the time. And, and, that, and this is something that is, that is, uh, that is noticed. Uh, the uh, even fairly weak independent leaders like, uh, like Rahman uh, felt able to make this direct address in Putin's presence, arguing that Russia does not centra treat Central Asian states with enough respect. But the key part of that interaction for me was that the, the, what, the ask. It was, uh, he was saying Putin doesn't treat us with respect, but the, the ask wasn't, so you should, uh, so, we need other partners who asked was, you should treat us with more respect. You should give us more. Like, like we want that relationship with Russia. That, that, uh, because uh, for a lot of the, I mean, Kazakhstan may have larger pretensions to, to leadership in, uh, in you know, more, maybe more, more global ties, but for the other Central Asian countries, they see the alternatives as largely limited to either Russia or China. Uh, US just, uh, there isn't the belief that US has the staying power in the region. Uh, and so, and there's a lot of um, fear and distrust of China. So they'd rather have uh, Russia more present and and just, but just in a, on a more equal relationship than than be left alone with China. Um, so finally, uh, getting to the Middle East, I think Russia. That's one region that Russia has in the last, you know, in 2022, uh, has maintained its its position uh, somewhat better. Uh, mostly because some of the key players uh, in the region are either in the same boat as Russia, i.e. Iran, uh, or want to be more independent from the U.S., uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, other GCC states. So Iran uh, sees a potential partnership with Russia in the club of nations who try to circumvent sanctions. Uh, and they see possibilities for helping each other in areas as diverse as weapons development on one hand and suppressing opposition protests on the other hand. So, so there's a lot of common interest now with Russia and Iran, and that's why we see some of these uh, moves where on the one hand, uh, you know, Iran sending drones uh, to Russia. On the other hand, Russia is giving them advice on how to deal with protests. So, so that, that, that's where they're, they're at. Uh, the Saudis are very concerned about uh, the oil price cap uh, being a first step to establishing a buyer's cartel, sort of the, the, the anti-OPEC. And that and they would like to work with Russia uh, to prevent this from happening because it's very much not in their interest to have uh, the buyer side uh, have have um, uh, any kind of uh, ability to con to control prices. So that's where it's not that the the, the Saudi leadership oh, wants to to uh, support Russia. It's that they see their own interests as being not aligned with the United States and with uh, Western European countries on that issue. And so, and, and much more aligned with Russia in trying to prevent, prevent that from happening. Uh, Turkey, I, I won't go into too much uh, into Turkey because the ambassador already has, but they've been trying to place both sides for, for, uh, for a number of years now because Erdogan uh, is, is trying to, to look out for his own interests. Uh, but part of that is also that both Turkey and Saudi Arabia have been somewhat upset about U.S. pressure on human rights and see working with Russia uh, as a way to force the United States to reduce that pressure because of, you know, other interests that, that the U.S. would have. Uh, and Russia has used all of these concerns to its advantage to maintain uh, its position in the Middle East, despite having fewer resources to devote uh, to its diplomatic and military activities there in the current environment versus uh, before uh, it invaded Ukraine. Uh, and so, so we see this, it, you know, the, it's cut its military presence in Syria, for example, but that hasn't had that much of an impact because there are, it already, you know, that war has largely been won for, for Assad. And so, so Russia can afford to do that. Um, now, the last topic that, uh, that I was asked to address is, is, uh, is maybe a little different from what's been said so far, and this is how to interpret uh, the, uh, uh, the, the series of uh, uh, threats related to weapons of mass destruction uh, that Russia has made in the course of the war. Um, and and there's, a, there's a whole range of threats that Russia has made over the last uh, year. 
uh, starting with regular reminders, even before the war began, or before the 22 war began, I should, yeah, there has obviously been a war since 2014, but the, the, act, the, the, the active and higher intensity phase, uh, the re regular reminders that Russia is a nuclear power uh, and that it has red lines and that cross it, the West crossing them is, uh, is a danger. And this, this was obviously done in order to prevent uh, the US and NATO from getting in, actively uh, involved in, uh, in, in uh, 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 st stopping uh, Russian intervention in, uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, once, uh, but, but since then also trying to kind of force the US to, to be cautious about what kind of assistance it provides to, uh, to, to Ukraine. Uh, and, and in doing so, promoting conversations about the possibility of Russia using uh, non-strategic nuclear weapons uh, in certain circumstances, that is a, also a tool of deterrence. Uh, and then the last bit, uh, more, more recently in the last, you know, in the fall, discussing the possibility of a, an accident or sabotage at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant uh, is another another kind of reminder that there's, a, you know. They don't, they don't have to be weapons, right? It could just be a, 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 a sort of a, the equivalent of a dirty bomb, essentially, some kind, some kind of radiological accident. And I would argue that the main goal of all of these um, threats has been to scare the West into curtailing uh, its support uh, for Ukraine. Uh, there hasn't been any evidence that Russia has actually taken steps to use uh, or to prepare to use nuclear weapons or even taken them out of storage. Uh, uh, and, and the other uh, evidence that this is mostly just kind of scare tactics is that the threat discussion has been turned on and off uh, to influence a global uh, discussion. Uh, there was a good example of this quite recently uh, when uh, if we saw in October a lot of discussions about uh, radiological accidents at this Operation Nuclear Power Plant, and they were very, very suddenly turned off right at the end of October when uh, the Russian leadership clearly decided that uh, that usefulness of that that conversation was at an end. They wanted to sort of maybe try to get more of a emphasis on, on trying to make a deal, trying to get some kind of negotiation going. And that whole like uh, effort to uh, blow up tensions was turned off in order. To, and, 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 uh, and, and, and I think those, those are the kinds of bits of evidence that we see that, that suggest that this is mostly about deterrence and, and scare tactics. Uh, now, one thing that is uh, problematic, but probably can't be helped, is that the endless discussion of Russian nuclear threats in the Western media uh, ends up kind of contributing to, to, the, to uh, Russia's playbook in this, right? Uh, uh, it raises people's fears. So it increases the pressure on governments, on the US government, on allied governments to try to uh, maybe uh, make some deal to curtail support for Ukraine because of this, this danger, right? Now, obviously, governments need to do contingency planning for this kind of thing. And it's not an argument saying that they shouldn't be doing that. Everyone should be thinking about what happens if Russia does use a uh, non-strategic nuclear weapon, if there is a nuclear uh, uh, event of uh, accident or, or some other kind of event at the nuclear power plant and so forth. Uh, uh, that's their job. Uh, but... Uh, I think analysts and media need to be careful in how they discuss these kind of things to avoid kind of feeding the flames. Um, uh, now, I think that the, gov the US government and other governments have actually done uh, a very good job in terms of being clear on understanding these threats as being exactly what they are and, and, and appropriately uh, uh, treating them in the risk assessments as, uh, you know, uh, but there is, you know, obviously there's a need for caution. Russia is a nuclear state. And if their leadership believes that regime survival is at risk, they could take drastic action. So I don't want to say that there's no chance of uh, uh, a nuclear threat coming, uh, you know, being, being used uh, you know, or, or some nuclear event uh, or other WMD event taking place. I think the risk is, is, actually, is very, very low, however, uh, because, because of the reasons I've laid out. So I think uh, and this is the last point I'll make in terms of, uh, response, I think the US and NATO has been uh, entirely appropriate. They made it clear that these kinds of threats are deeply irresponsible and will not change uh, US policies or allies policies. But at the same time, they've made it equally clear 
that any use of WM, uh, WMD by Russia will result in a strong and forceful response. So kind of deterring back as it were, right? And, and, this, and, and they've also had discussions with some of Russia's partners and with neutral states, and those have been helpful. Uh, I'm talking about China, I'm talking about India, uh, because there's a consensus uh, among analysts that even uh, even for China, you know, one of maybe Russia's one of Russia's closer allies, uh, partners, let's say, in in this in this fight, uh, Russian nu use of nuclear weapons would be seen as crossing a line and something that, that that China couldn't support. So so I think making trying to get China on board and just having those conversations at least has been has been useful. So uh, so I'll stop there and uh, pass back to Phil. Thank you, Dr. Gornberg. And our final speaker is Dr. Michael Slavo Slabochikov. So going last is both a privilege and a problem as most of the uh, issues have already been addressed. So I'll uh, go off script for a little bit. Um, I do want to thank General McKenzie and the Global National Security Institute. Um, I want to provide a counterfactual events such as these providing difference of opinion, getting together policymakers as well as, as uh, leaders and academics. Uh, had Putin had such a mindset, he might not have gone into Ukraine in the first place. So I, I really applaud your efforts to get all these uh, people together and, and, and to talk about these issues. Um, so the first uh, thing that I want to bring up is the power of the small states, the power of the weak states. So if we look at Central Asia, there's a long history of playing the great powers off each other and to gain benefit in doing so. Uh, they did this throughout the Cold War period. They did this uh, and they continue to do this. And, and they're playing rush off of China and also now recognizing the US as, a, as an actor in the region and playing all of, all of these actors off each other to gain their benefit. This is the, the, uh, it's a time-honored game, but it's also a way of maximizing their own interests and getting what they want to achieve. Uh, the last time we saw this happen to, to detrimental effect was actually uh, in Ukraine, believe it or not. Uh, former uh, President Yanukovych uh, was playing the EU off of Russia um, and uh, deciding whether to sign an, an um, association agreement with the EU and, uh, and playing off of Russia um, and decided at the, at the end to not sign the association agreement with the EU to get loans from Russia repaid and, and debt canceled and uh, great prices on gas for his own benefit. But that led to the Maidan revolution and the collapse of his government. So um, this is a, a time honored tradition in that area of trying to play the great powers off each other. And we often talk about great power conflict from the point of view of great powers, but we also do need to keep in mind the idea of the weaker states having a stake in the game and playing off the great powers um, as well. Um, now, as a professor, I have to say it's it's uh, exciting to see so many people who are not asleep in the in the classroom. So <laughs> I, I almost am lost as to what to do. Um, so, uh, but I, I do want to to mention very briefly uh, what. Ambassador Kosnett said about the uh, just wait four years. This is a constant problem of US foreign policy. Uh, and it's not just a four year problem, it's a two year problem, right? Um, as, as we saw with the new Congress now coming in, telling the Biden administration, wait a second, we need to scale back our, our support for Ukraine and we need to keep our eye on China and Taiwan. So. Uh, you know, a lot of states out there are saying, well, the U.S. is a great partner today, but it might not be tomorrow and certainly not in two years or four years. And we do not have a consistent foreign policy that we can uh, point to uh, to uh, assure them that we're their partners for the long term. And that really causes us some problems. So certainly in Central Asia and other places, 
as Dr. Gorenberg said, uh, the, the reality is they're looking at, at the US to gain concessions from Russia and China, but they're really looking at the long-term players in the region as being Russia and China, and who would you rather have, and how would you rather handle it? So they'll play them off each other. Uh, the, the Russian and the Chinese uh, marriage of convenience right now is, is uh, uh, trying to counter US influence in the region, but we can't forget that they've been strategic rivals for a long time. They've fought a war, border conflict with each, with each other. Kissinger tried to, uh, to uh, bring a cleave between them by uh, getting closer to China to, to isolate the Soviet Union. Um, so I think that that is an advantage that we should be discussing in policy circles of how do we, uh, how do we create a cleavage between Russia and China and there are many uh, fissures there uh, to exploit. Um, Russia is actually very worried about China and China's influence and becoming a junior partner. Uh, Dr. Gorenberg talked about Russia's want to be at, uh, at the seat of the table, but Russia certainly doesn't want to be at the seat of a children's table where China is at, at the main table. So, uh, um, you know, a, a Thanksgiving dinner, so to speak, where uh, the kids' table is, is there. So that's not what they want at all. Um, so that is important to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing that we should keep in mind domestically that will have tremendous um, influence on uh, the central region is um, that demographically Russia is changing tremendously. Um, Russia is becoming more of a Muslim state. Um, and this is going to cause problems domestically. It's going to cause domestic unrest. And it will ca also cause problems with some of the Central Asian states and the Middle Eastern states in the future. So this is something to, to very much keep in mind. Uh, we are not only the closest to nuclear war that we've been in, since the Cuban Missile Crisis, although I agree with Dr. Gorenberg that a lot of this is posturing, but we certainly are the closest that we've been since the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. But we also have to keep in mind what happens if there is civil war in Russia, how that will um, expand in the region, and the act. And we, the last thing we should want as the United States is a civil war in a country where there are as many nuclear weapons as there are. This should keep Sam Nunn up at night, and Senator Luger, if he was still alive, would be there too. So. Um, I tried to keep it to seven minutes, I you promise. Did. You did. Thank you so much, Dr. Okay. Slobodchikov. Thank you. So I, I would like to pick up on your last point regarding um, social instability, because we, our speakers did such a fine job of giving us a um, a high level analysis of uh, Russian strategy and uh, the responses of the governments in the region. Um, but this is a region right now that is, um, is witnessing tremendous uh, social upheaval and uh, potential for social unrest. Um, there is the, the protests in Iran. There were the protests earlier this year in uh, Kazakhstan. Uh, in Russia, there were protests uh, after the invasion, which were uh, very harshly suppressed. Uh, the crackdown in Putin's Russia uh, really has never, that kind of, that level of crackdown has not been seen in Russia in decades. So uh, I want to ask you um, whether, because um, Rear Admiral Homan mentioned this alliance of uh, authoritarian uh, leaders and uh, authoritarianisms, uh, do you think that the United States can possibly um, challenge Russian influence in the region um, in, the, in the sphere of values, uh, our democratic values, our human rights values? Um, do you see that there is, might be a willingness on the part of ordinary citizens in these states in Central Asia and the Middle East um, to look at the United States um, with hope the way that uh, those behind the Iron Curtain did uh, in 1989? 
May I uh, say one thing for clarification? And, and the Admiral brought up a good point about uh, the autocracy versus democracy argument. Uh, but I think one thing that, that has surprised us was India's vote at the UN and the fact that India has stayed by Russia um, much more so than we would have expected. India is a democracy. Uh, so I, I think that if we go too far into saying that this is an autocratic versus democratic conflict, uh, we do miss India and some other governments in the, in the region. Um, and the answer, and I want to take a step back and say I teach American national government classes and I've been doing so for many years. And one of the first questions I ask is, do we live in a democracy? Is the United States a democracy? This to me was a no brainer, right? I, I, I grew up during the time we all believed we could pick ourselves up by our own bootstraps and we could follow the American dream and, and uh, you know anyone could achieve greatness. And it's incredibly sad to me to see now 18 year olds coming into the classroom and saying, we do not live in a democracy. We live in an oligarchy and only a select few can get ahead. That's within this country. So we're having questions about the American dream from 18, 19 year olds, 20 year olds and, and older who are questioning our core values and our core beliefs in democracy, in liberty, in, uh, in issues like that. So if we have those kinds of questions at a younger generation, it's only natural to assume that many of the countries out there are going to have the same questions about, about the, the benefits of democracy and liberty and things like that. So I, I know that we stress it at, at the diplomatic level and we absolutely should, as the ambassador said, we should absolutely uphold those <laughs> ideals. Uh, but it, it's, it's difficult to uphold those ideals and to, to be a shining principle when uh, in our own country, we, we don't necessarily believe that either. Can, Do you, yeah, please, uh, I'd like to go down the, yeah. Okay, I'm please, sorry, go ahead. Please, please, please. Go ahead, Dimitri. Okay, uh, this is very, very brief because I think it kind of follows um, uh, Dr. Slobodchikov said. Uh, the, the problem with democracy promotion as the US has practiced it over time is that a lot of it is kind of uh, seen in other places as talk that, uh, that the US doesn't itself follow, right? That, that, that democracy promotion is a nice talking point, but always, <sighs> falls off first whenever there's some other interest that's more that's seen as more important that's at stake uh and that it's kind of and then and so there's accusations of hypocrisy uh for that reason against the united states and i think the way to deal with that is precisely what dr slobodchka was talking about is 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 kind of a show me don't 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 tell me uh situation where uh if you practice it uh then you become that beacon and that and that's i think where we were in the Cold War is that we, it wasn't that we were spending, I mean, we were spending a lot of time talking about democratic values, but we also showed the example. And I think we've fallen off from that a bit in very, in some ways. Uh, and and it's, it's it just um, makes it uh, less uh, attractive uh, to, to the other parts of the world. And we have to get back to that. Thank you. So I was a, I was a serving American ambassador overseas uh, on January 6th. And I, I think the way to get at this is to acknowledge that American democracy is far from perfect. We've been at it for over 200 years. We're still trying to make it work, you know, and rather than just use the old warmed over talking points, acknowledge to countries that are struggling with the same sorts of issues that it's hard and we have to look for solutions together. Something else that I think we need to do, and this is really hard for Americans, is sometimes we need to do nothing. Look at the demonstrations in Iran, where the government is attempting to say the demonstrators are just tools of the US, the great Satan, the West. Sometimes when we are actively applauding you know, democratic movements overseas, we play into that. So it's really tough for Americans just to sit back and watch, but there are times when it's necessary. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think there's actually 
opportunity here. Um, I, I don't necessarily believe that it's that we should look at it as uh, you know going after being a democracy. We, we've proven, I think, that that's really hard to change countries, certainly in the Middle East, to have them model our system and be successful. I think it's important to look at the system that they have and then try to morph it within. But I think um, what I think is very different, and I mentioned it briefly, is just the information environment is so different. Um, if you look at Iran, for example, if the supreme leader, we, we all are going to pass away eventually. Um, the issue is, um, is there a middle level that's going to come in that's going to take over that country or other countries? Or is there a younger generation that's going to vault over that, you know, what we often call the frozen middle um, and, and change things drastically? And I think um, in our own country and, and across the globe that there's, there's that opportunity today. If you look at the, the younger generation um, and their voracious appetite, for information and for understanding what's going on. I think there's just tremendous opportunity if you can show that your system works and that there's positive effects to it. Um, I think there's there's opportunity in some of these uh, police states, autocratic, wh whatever you wanna call some of these, these states that are, that are more controlling um, for there to be some loosening of that. Uh, I think we're seeing a little bit of it in Iran where, where they've, um, you know, in 2019, they cracked down very hard and 10, 10 days killed over 300 people, put the, put the protests down very quickly. Um, and yet today we're seeing them take a more measured approach to it. So, um, and part of that I think is driven by the information environment. Now, many of the countries try to turn that off, um, but I think they're finding it increasingly difficult um, to keep people from having their devices and from access to, to information and certainly if Starlink gets up and does what they're talking about from the mesh network kind of thing globally, I think that's going to become even more significant as we go forward. Thank you. I think this is a great time to move to audience uh, questions. And I think we have a question here, please. I, can everybody hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Lee Rosenberger. I worked 35 years in the US national security community. Uh, was out in the private sector for a while, and I'm back in the U.S. government, uh, working at the Peacekeeping and Stability Operations Institute, uh, co-located with the Army War College in Pennsylvania. Um, I want to thank General McKenzie for mentioning the global food crisis. Millions of people in West Africa are starving to death, waiting to see what the international community will do about it. So far, I haven't seen much. Um, uh, the ambassador mentioned the uh, uh, Erdogan's uh, brokering the UN grain agreement. 24 hours later, we saw how much Russia really is interested in that with a missile strike. Um, so what's missing here is enforcement and compliance, right? Nothing in that agreement uh, calls for that, that I can see. I'm interested in two things, the, imp the military implementation of this agreement and the economic side, and the international business community is also watching. Uh, and frankly, uh, the question goes to you, Admiral Holman. Uh, on the military side, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't see a whole lot of deep mining going on, and there aren't many ships that are going to want to plow through mines. So until I see that happening, and you guys doing something about it, more and more people are starving to death in West Africa. Lloyds of London is not going to provide insurance either until they see something happening militarily. So my question is, when are we going to protect the shipping going through the Black Sea? Erdogan, as far as I'm concerned, Ambassador, you said he's not pro-Russian. Well, he's not doing a whole lot to protect the shipment going through the Black Sea and beyond uh, to Africa and the Middle East. And I want to know what the U.S. Navy is going to do to, to help the cause. Thank you very much. Please. Me to start? Sure. First, thank you for your service, sir. Um, you know, a lifetime of service, it's really uh, greatly appreciated. Um, I don't want to venture into the, the policy realm. It's not my place to say what, uh, what we would do. I would tell you, we've looked at uh, the demining and, and trying to get a Q route or something that, that comes out of, out of that area. Um, it's, it's extremely challenging. If you look at the number of mine clearance ships and, and the capacity within NATO, 
um, is, is extremely challenging. Um, I think the, the way to do it would be, and I think we've, we've started down that road, is to continue to negotiate um, with, the, with the Russians to allow us and to lay out where those mines are um, and to enable the, uh, the commercial fleets to go through. Um, but I'll, I'll pause there, and I think some of, the, uh, some of my colleagues here probably have far more insight into uh, the policy perspective of this, of how it could do that, that's really not my realm. Thank you. Anybody else want to add something? No? Well, I'll say that I agree with you, you know, mm -hmm. that words on paper are worthless if there is an enforcement, you know, and, uh, and I don't want to throw it back on the military because you're right, operationally, they're demining challenges, you know, but um, I do believe that it is incumbent both on, well, on all the players here, you know, the people who are plotting the agreement, starting with the UN, you know, and, and uh, the European Union and the United States, you know, to find a way to move the food. And uh, I, don't have, I don't have the answer there either. I'm curious to know, I mean, what are Russian demining capabilities like that? Don't they also have a responsibility? Uh, absolutely, I think, think they have a responsibility. I mean, if, in theory, if they put the mines out, they know where the mines are and yeah. they, they can clearly align and, and show you a cue route to come out and, and be able to do that, which I, I think if presented correctly to Lloyd's of London, um, you could you could possibly get them to to support that from the from like commercial right. shipping. Right, because you're saying all you need is a channel. You don't need to clear every mine out of the Black Sea. Yes, sir. So, I just I just want to make sure everyone understands that the, the ships do go through. Right, it's not that there they aren't have, ships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean the, the the agreement. I mean. It would obviously be better if there were no war and no mines and more ships would go through clearly but given where we are the deal has actually been relatively successful in allowing for some transit and there are corridors uh some of the mines are russian some of the mines are ukrainian because you got to remember that one of the ukrainian goals was to prevent amphibious landings on their coast mm -hmm. and those mines maybe shouldn't be cleared for the moment uh you know while hostilities continue and what they have is ukrainian pilots who know where the mines are and who can you know guide the ships through through those channels before they, they you know they, they they'll sail onwards so i think that uh you know it's 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 actually the fact that the that deal was renewed recently with uh, in November, uh, without any um, major uh, tensions, you know, it just it was it was just renewed. Uh, shows that it actually has some some usefulness for, for for all sides. So we have a number of questions. So in order to get to all, I would like to ask if we can just do a couple questions at a time, and then you don't need to answer all of them, but just you know, pick, you can pick and choose, please. My name is Simon Bolin. I'm the Agribusiness Development Manager for Hillsborough County. I appreciate the previous gentleman's um, question. To add a little more context to that, Ukraine is, is the largest agricultural producer in, in Europe. They, they're the largest producer of sunflowers, seeds, and oil. 64% of that oil goes to Africa. With uh, food insecurity, it, it creates stability issues, and, and that's a direct application for, for CENTCOM and, and SOCOM. Uh, they're also a large fertilizer, corn and wheat producer. Um, Iran is the largest producer of saffron and uh, apricots in the world. If they sold all their saffron, it would equal their heating oil sales, which can pay for a lot of rockets and missiles. Um, China's Belt and Road Initiative is, is economic and infrastructure driven largely to support or uh, to or to do uh, agricultural development. Um, the one thing that the US has not put an embargo on with Russia is fertilizer because of high global fertilizer sales. Uh, the EU has, so there are ships coming into the port of New Orleans every day being unloaded, being reloaded onto that same ship and shipped to Europe for, for their farmers over there. So uh, a few points that General Carrilla uh, brought up was um, underrated and overlooked uh, 
areas. Farmers are often overrated or underrated and overlooked. How might CENTCOM or, or other operations address that issue in whatever country? Because every country that CENTCOM and SOCOM operates in, the largest employer is agriculture. Thank the you. largest economic driver is agriculture or oil. Um, small investments that don't imperil partners. Um, agriculture doesn't imperil anybody, it feeds people. So how might, how might SETCOM uh, address that? Um, because it, we're not selling guns or missiles, it's just agricultural development. Thank you. Do you have an? Do you have a second question? Is that the, well? That was my second yeah. question. Oh, okay. um, and that's it. Okay, Thank excellent. You. Thank you so much. Anybody hear that? And and we'll take one more, and then we'll let the panelists address the questions. Thank you. Is it okay if I turn this down? Yes, please. Yeah. Thanks. I'm kind of short. Um, so I wanted to start with um, a few things. Um, I believe, I'm not sure if I can pronounce your last name correctly, I'm going to try, I'm sorry if I miss it, um, Dr. Slobodchikov yes. did mention the newer generations are disillusioned with the American dream, and I can personally state that I'm seeing that a lot, and I don't really blame them, and it's not just with the United States. Prior to this conference, I tried to speak with some of my friends in Saudi Arabia, and I asked one of my friends, who I'll just call Riri, do you think China invests more in Saudi people than, than America in terms of money? For example, do you think that they primarily only invest in petroleum projects or do they invest in projects that help Saudis as people in their day-to-day -day life? And so the previous um, person who asked the question did mention that the Belt and Road Initiative is primarily infrastructure driven. And of course, infrastructure is definitely going to help people in their day-to-day -day lives more. And so she replied to me, Oh yes, definitely. China does, but not in that sense. They send us Chinese students and teachers. Their ambassadors always speak fluent Arabic, and they are very active in the Saudi society. They even attend our festivals, whether they're cultural or international. We even celebrated the Chinese year, New Year at Riyadh Boulevard last year. She did mention to me, however, of course, as you guys know, that Saudi Arabia and Iran are not exactly friends, to say the least. China isn't innocent either in that they back Iran with weapons, but you can easily communicate with China as their ideological voices don't block their communication channel, if I may say that or if it makes sense. China does buy a lot of our oil and our petroleum products, and the Americans, on the other hand, as many Westerners are affected by, she states, their racism and hatred as well as their ideology. She's referencing the frequent attacks over Saudi Arabia's actions over Jamal Khashoggi, and the fact that it's true that many in the Middle East don't particularly prioritize democracy as a value, it's just not important. Um, and so when they see the West, especially in social media settings, anywhere where they can interact with people, they do search out information. And a lot of the times there is an ignorance within our own societies that they paint them as backwards, barbaric, unable to be anything like a democratic country. And this greatly affects their um, outlook towards the West as a partner, especially since it's well known in psychology that opinions aren't made based on data or statistics. It's based on personal interactions, which then get projected to entire groups of people. So can we, I'm sorry, can sorry. We, so you, your question is about how we can change these perceptions or what we can do <laughs> to address some of these perceptions? Part of that, and also it's about the fact that I think a lot of the strategy is missing the point that you know, if you try to project democratic values to a people who largely don't care about that, they're going to be more interested in survival and growing as people. And I think a lot of the efforts that I'm hearing so far are kind of entirely missing that, especially when it comes to investing in other nations as people, instead of just like, oh, how can we get more influence in, let's say, Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan? It's really more about people. That's how you're gonna maintain any kind of bridges you build with them. Okay, thank you. And thank you so much for your question and comment. Next, we'll take one more and yes, thank you. 
So thank you very much. So uh, my name is Dmitry Savchuk, and I'm here at the math department at USF. Uh, so I am originally from Ukraine. So uh, I came to the United States about 20 years ago, and I still have, of course, my family and uh, relatives and uh, friends in Ukraine. So I'm kind of biased, of course. Uh, part of my family is now refugees in Europe, and I have some friends who got uh, their family members killed and so on. So uh, my question is about, uh, so what do you think about the long-term strategy uh, Western strategy and US strategy towards Russia. So maybe let me just say a few more words. So uh, right now there is a significant concern in Ukraine that uh, even after Ukraine will gain its territories back to 1991, uh, and even if some liberal forces will come uh, to power in Russia, uh, there is a danger that those liberal forces will be uh, uh, will be uh, imperial again. There is right now a big discussion <coughs> about uh, uh, TV channel Rain uh, prohibited in Latvia uh, a couple of days ago, uh, kind of based on similar concerns. Uh, so, uh, and of course, there is a danger that there might be uh, returning to some authoritarian uh, regime after some time. So, uh, so that's why uh, right now in Ukraine, a lot of people are talking about uh, what can be done to prevent that. So, uh, do uh, some options like, for example, denuclearization of Russia. Some people in Ukraine even say about splitting of Russia are considered. And could that can we talk right now about general long term strategy? Thank you. Thank you. So we have um, three excellent questions. Uh, what can CENTCOM do to protect uh, agricultural business? How can we address perceptions of the US uh, in these regions? And uh, how can we prevent a new conflict uh, from emerging in Ukraine? I think this is one of the major points of discussion actually surrounding this war is um, if even if we settle it in some way, um, it is likely to uh, reemerge. So how do we ensure an enduring peace? So anybody wants to address one or two of those questions, please? Do I, do I need to yes, down? yes, please. Okay. Uh, I'm first in the hopper. So, uh... I, I, from the agricultural question, I would say, you know, if you listen to what uh, General Corolla said, you know, his, his three things, people, partners, and innovation. So when we start talking about how we're going to increase anything, um, it's about uh, a whole of government approach and then leveraging strongly on a partnering uh, and trying to collaborate with, uh, with the country that we're at in order to get at um, whether it be agriculture or whether it be other things. So the, the interagency group that, that we have at CENTCOM works very collaboratively and is fully engaged in, in the strategy uh, as we go forward in, in how we can do those things. And I get, I think to, to the, to the uh, young lady's question here uh, also, I, I think it's, it's very much driven towards the population and trying to, to help the population. USAID has done, taken tremendous steps and, and does a lot of great work uh, across the CENTCOM AOR and trying to, to support to help uh, the population. Uh, and then I'll just touch briefly on the China piece. Um, you know, I, in, in my perspective on that is just kind of looking at uh, as China moves around the, the CENTCOM AOR and tries to provide things, whether it be through their Belt Road Initiative and things like that, I think <laughs> what we're hearing from, from our partners is it's very transactional. Mm -hmm. um, China will bring something out, they drop it off, you bought it, it's yours, good luck. Um, the U.S. and the, some of the coalition, when we bring things out, we tend to stand behind it. We bring, you know, uh, service representatives out there that help them, train them, show the country how to employ it, how to use it, how to fix it, and do, do many of those things. So I think, I think that, that's a, a fundamental difference. Um, I think when you look at how, uh, when China comes into an area and offers something, you have to understand that while there may be economic benefit, um, everything China does has a security lever to anything that they're doing. Um, that they, they look at the economic things as akin to and, and complete dual use with their, their security regime. And, and the security law number one says protection of the regime, regardless of the company, regardless of the individual, you, you have an obligation back to the regime to protect the regime. So when we talk smart cities and those kind of things, I think you have to be real careful with where your data is going to end up um, and how it's going to be used. Um, so while it may be benefits on the on the short term, the long term could come back uh, 
for some serious repercussions. And I'll pause on those. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for mentioning the you know whole of government, one of the most important buzzwords of the uh, of the current decade. Uh, but it's really true, and I would I would go beyond that to you know when I when I, when I heard a gentleman ask what is what is CENTCOM going to do you know to support agriculture overseas? Not really CENTCOM's job. But it isn't only the job of U.S. Agency for International Development and the Department of Agriculture and the State Department. We also need to be able to, um, to energize, to motivate uh, American industry, American agribusiness to work overseas because you know, agriculture is a great American strength. Right. Uh, to tie that to your question, ma'am, about uh, Chinese, you know, uh, the effectiveness of Chinese diplomacy and, and, and uh, public diplomacy. They are very good at what they do. They are very good at marketing themselves. They're good at marketing the Belt and Road Initiative as a selfless act that is going to benefit you know, other countries. We talk that way too sometimes. And I, I, I'm glad you mentioned, I don't want to mischaracterize your words, but the point that sometimes we, we seem to put forward this notion that we know better than other people what is best for them. Uh, that, is, um, that is bad diplomacy. That is bad public diplomacy. We need to move beyond that. Uh, and I think we try to. Look, I, I actually think in a lot of countries, there's a lot of buyer's remorse about the Belt and Road Initiative. People, uh, governments are realizing they're saddled with extraordinary debt and the infrastructure they're getting is falling apart already. Um, you know, I can tell you in the Balkans, uh, countries may pay more for, you know, an, Amer an American built highway than a Chinese highway, but they still get a highway that works a few years afterwards. Uh, more importantly, we need to find ways to, uh, to create long lasting economic benefits for people, which is one of the points you made. Whereas the Chinese have tended to bring in tens of thousands of workers on a project, you know, and then ship them out and there are no jobs for locals. Uh, I, when I was uh, at my last post in Kosovo, yeah, we, our mantra was that we were supporting the local people, not just the local political class, in building peace, justice, and prosperity. All of those are interconnected. You cannot have economic development unless you have rule of law and a system where every individual has a stake in, this, in society, which is why when we would push for rights of minority groups, like the rights of LGBT community, we saw that as directly linked to economic development because it gave everyone a stake in the future and, you know, and, and tried to overcome the sort of, of angst and uh, an ennui that we've talked about, that you know, the doctor talked about on American college campuses as well. So, I think that we need to strengthen the private sector role in economic development overseas. And one way to do that is by strengthening rule of law in other countries, including in the CENTCOM AO, so that American companies will feel that it is in their interest uh, to, move, to move into those areas. Thank you. You know, we have so little time and so many other, but, but there will be plenty of time to engage with the speakers afterwards once we're, we're done. And we encourage you to do that. Thank you so much. Dima? Um, yeah, so let me turn to the thing I actually know about, which is the strategy. The lasting versus, piece? Uh, okay, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, uh, versus, versus yeah. other things such as agriculture that I don't know anything about. Um, so uh, it depends a lot on what Russia looks like after the, the war, right? I mean, there, there are a number of directions that Russia could go in. Uh, and one thing just, uh, I, I'm going to say some things that I think are controversial, maybe unpopular, but that, that's okay. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of people talk about, you know, we don't, what, we don't want to undermine Putin be, too much because, you know, there could be chaos, there could be, uh, you know, civil war or whatever. Uh, bad things could happen in Russia, it's true. But one thing we know for 100% for sure is that Putin is bad, right? Putin makes nuclear threats. Putin invades neighboring countries, right? So uh, whoever comes after Putin may be worse, it's true, but could be better. And 
chaos within Russia, uh, while not ideal, at least has the benefit of forcing Russia to look inside rather than outside uh, and threaten its neighbors. So from that point of view, I think that uh, uh, Putin being gone and something coming after Putin, whatever it is, is more likely to be good than bad. That said, it could be that the next leadership is still imperialist and hardline, in which case uh, the policies that we should undertake would be very different from one where from a Russia that is more open, maybe not, you know, not, I don't want, you know, not going to be probably anytime soon democratic and liberal and so forth, but more open to compromise, more more willing to um, engage, <coughs> to to um, to um, uh, uh, to, to stop its aggression and so forth. Uh, and I think if that's the kind of Russia that we have, then it behooves us, based on what we know of, hist of history, to work to integrate as much as we can rather than to isolate. Uh, and we see, I mean, I, the 20th century is a good example of this, right? We, we had uh, the punishing uh, peace after World War I against Germany, and that did not lead to good outcomes, whereas the integrating piece after World War II led to good outcomes. So I would argue that we, you know, when we start talking about things like demilitarizing Russia or uh, other kinds of punitive kinds of kinds of actions, uh, that may, uh, I mean, that that is um, just uh, and that is satisfying, but it may not lead to uh, the best long-term outcomes in terms of peace and security. So we just have to be cautious about that. And uh, I'll just say one more thing since it was mentioned uh, uh, by, the, by, by the, the gentleman who asked the question, TV Rain, uh, which was uh, you know, denied a license uh, or, uh, uh, in, in Latvia uh, just this, in this last week. It's a very counterproductive action. Uh, if, be, if I can just uh, say, you want to explain? No, just or? just that that a major Russian independent news station with eight, uh, the reach of eighteen million inside Russia um, that really is largely you know anti-war and uh, very um, independent uh, was kicked out of Russia was based in Latvia and just this week the Latvian government uh, revoked its license. So do you want? Yeah, yeah. So thank you. And this cost of Thanks for elaborating. Yeah. Uh, so uh, because it's important to, uh, I mean, yes, there were some people on T on TV Rain who said some things that uh, were controversial, that were could be interpreted as being uh, supportive of the Russian army. Uh, I have questions whether I mean, maybe that there was a misunderstanding of what was actually what they were trying to say, but regardless. Uh, but that was one person, uh, and TV Rain as a whole, if you look at the body of their work, is very much trying to get an anti-war message to Russians in a language they can understand. And uh, the and by revoking its license, it only it it not only undermines their ability to to transmit to Russia, but it also feeds Putin's line that look, the West is you know the. You talk, you know, West talks about freedom of speech, but they're not, you know, freedom of the media. But look what they're doing, uh, right? So th it helps Russian narratives as well in the broader world. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, kind of a kind of a shooting yourself in the foot in some ways. Thank you. Before we move to the next questions, Michael, did you want to add? Yes, I, yeah. I, I did want to very briefly add. Um, a lot of gray hairs ago. I, I, I had a lot of a lot less gray hairs, but I do remember when George uh, Herbert Walker Bush at the end of the Cold War said he could envision a Europe whole and free from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. And uh, we it wasn't that long ago that we were all optimistic that that, uh, you know, conflict was going to end and and that uh, liberalism had triumphed and, and uh, the liberal values. And now we find ourselves back again at the, at the same brink where we were. Um, and so we, we should keep in mind that these things do, uh, do fluctuate over time. And, and a lot of what we're seeing is uh, a failure to win the peace after the end of the Cold War. Um, 
that that you know it, I don't know if it could have been one. I, I, you know that's a good question, but uh, and debatable. But uh, but we certainly thought that that we were there and and we're not, and we'll continue to strive to get there. Thank you. We'll now turn to some online questions, please. Right. So I want to thank Dernova for this question for the panel. Um, and she, the question is, how do you think it is possible to organize a better understanding between Ukraine and Russia? Who among us can give security to Europe today? And can we give security to all of us? Thank you. And then I'll take the next two questions because the gentlemen have been so patient standing there. Yes, please. The next question, yes, right, sure. we'll, thank we'll you. bundle a few again, Hi. thank you. Thank you, my name is Thomas and uh, thank you for letting me ask a question. Um, my question is, you guys mentioned the information environment in the past before, and I can remember my parents telling me when they were growing up, they can still remember when Walter Cronkite said, uh, or LBJ had said when he lost Cronkite that he knew he lost the war in Vietnam. And I'm of the belief in hindsight that the technology at the time, television, how mass media in contrast to the lack of it during World War II played a huge role in the, the eventual outcome in 1975. Given the internet uh, nowadays, I have a background working in the startup industry and I understand how you all are optimistic about how the internet can be used as a force for good for disseminating good ideas. But on the reverse side, I could also see it potentially being used as a double-edged sword for unscrupulous actors. I know that Russia is very famous with the KGB during the Cold War for its capacity to even insinuate itself within MI6 and the CIA, how they were able to bring in people that were able to convince some of the best and brightest. And in effect, they were able to undermine from within operations. So what I'm curious about is, what would be the best way without compromising the principles of like the First Amendment and what really the internet was predicated on uh, to safeguard it from outside actors potentially who might feign, you know, some altruistic motive, but in reality be using the internet to po uh, poison the discourse. I mean, I can, I'm, I never ceases to amaze me talking to a lot of people. I'm 26 now, talking to people my age and it makes me realize that there is a very much a lack of sort of media literacy, being able to sort of critically think and discern one things that are facts from things that are false. And I just, there's a lot of people that just surprise me that have said things, for example, like I'm center right, relatively conservative, but people who I've heard who, who are very intelligent in other fields, openly claiming that like they're pro Putin, or they think that what Russia is doing is like a noble effort. And it just surprises me because the sources that sometimes they cite they just, from at least my point of view, I mean, I'm Korean, maybe it's because I sympathize a lot and I can see a lot of overlap between what's going on in Ukraine now and what was going on in the Korean War following World War II with what the Kim regime was trying to do. But what really surprises me is how some people could just with a straight face see some of these sources and not question them maybe. Or they'll say, oh, well, the site looks professional and there's a whole team of people. But Thank like, it, yeah, it troubles me. And I, yeah. I'm, that's why I'd be curious to hear like, how do we safeguard those things, but not compromise the principles that allow us to have that open debates exactly. that make it. May I make a exactly. quick comment? Thank you, thank you. And and then thank you so Sorry. much for your question. And then the gentleman's question, and then we'll turn it to uh, the panelists. Thank you. Yeah, hi, uh, Bill Lambert at US Central Command. Mm -hmm. I had the good fortune in 97 of coming back to CENCOM and working the integration of the Central Asian states into the CENCOM AOR. So I'm delighted that we seem to be rediscovering Central Asia. Uh, when I retired in 2000, I had the privilege of going to Uzbekistan for four years as the Export Control and Related Border Security Advisor. I had a pretty substantial program there. Uh, so shortly thereafter, after arriving, 9-11 occurs, we come in a Karshi Khanabad, we come in a Manas, and with much fanfare and euphoria, everybody in Washington and everywhere else said they're moving away from Russia, they're breaking free, they're going to be democracies. And then I watched over the intervening four years where the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, where Russia and China were effectively able to put aside their differences, got us thrown out of Central Asia. I saw some of my programs, $18 million program to upgrade Uzbek uh, helicopters uh, effectively and very viciously undermined and ultimately eliminated on the part of the Uzbeks because of fear of Russian retribution on a number of things. And there were other examples of that. 
So I guess uh, the question is, uh, one is, where do you see the Shanghai Cooperation Organization impacting our ability in the future? But also, as importantly, how is it as is, is, is people that advise senior policy advisors? I mean, at one point, the Secretary of Defense, uh, or Sec State Powell said, you know, right after Karshi Kanba and everything else, this is a great example. We're having great relations with Russia. We see eye to eye on stability in Central Asia. And then three or four years later, we're in the crapper again. And then it goes back up and then we're down again. And this, how do you prevent this episodic discovery that Russia may not, and China may not see things eye to eye because the Central Asian states certainly see this. The Central Asian states certainly feed from the trough when they can, but senior discussions indicate they also know feed now because we are as transactional as anybody. And I've done two tours in Pakistan, so I've seen what a trans, transactional relationship ultimately looks at looks like thank you okay thank you so much and so please anybody want to okay, address can I, uh, briefly one or address yeah. the information question yep. and and that's a very important issue uh information we saw how great it, it's worked in uh, in the arab spring in tunisia and and other places but uh, the Russians certainly are experts at, at knowing that if you just feed a ton of information, it's like a water hydrant and uh, you can throw as much in disinformation in there and it's hard to know what the truth is. Um, and in a sense, the internet and Facebook and all of these other uh, programs, Facebook especially, um, and Instagram and others, they have algorithms to, to give you the information that you want to hear. And so while there's a ton of information out there, uh, we tend to be in an echo chamber of information because we don't tend to hear dissenting voices, we tend to hear confirming voices. Um, and so uh, that's one of the great ironies of the age of information is, is that there's, there's a ton out there, but uh, in reality, we really don't go the extra mile to find out uh, what the truth is. And, and uh, some have argued we live in a post-truth society, so. Thank you. Any um, yeah, let me briefly address the uh, other two questions. So the, the first question was about, you know, how do we get to a better understanding between Ukraine and Russia? Uh, I mean, first the war has to, you know, Russia, uh, I, I think that the, in the short term, Russia has to, has to uh, be defeated, uh, to be honest, uh, right? Like in this war, the question is, the, what are the parameters uh, exactly? But uh, beyond that, even once the war is over, I think it's going to take a very, very long time to reach any kind of an understanding between Ukraine and Russia because, because uh, Ukrainians have been brutally attacked. Uh, and it's just, you know, there's... There, it's and what they're seeing is on the whole on the on average it's not it's not putin it's russia right it's it's their uh, public support for the war in russia is certainly not universal but it's not but it but it, it's relatively high uh for various reasons and we i don't think we have time to get into all the reasons for it but 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 uh, that is something that will not be quickly forgotten or forgiven and and it's a question it'll be a question of how to manage the hostility rather than how to build uh, an understanding uh, i'm afraid for for quite some time um as for the role of the shanghai cooperation organization you know it's interesting it was not that long ago that you know when the seo was first formed that it was basically kind of dismissed as uh, you know, kind of a venue for a, a place where Russia and China could get together and talk without, um, uh, you know, others getting in the way. You know, kind, kind of, kind, kind of, um, uh, uh, not much of an organization. In other words, just kind of a, a forum. Uh, and it's the, but it's changed. It's developed over time. It's much more serious now. Uh, it has. Uh, and it's really an effort to create an alternative uh, to some of the Western organizations, right? Uh, and you see this with 
India, Pakistan, a number of other countries that are getting involved in that effort. And so I think that it's going to, uh, it's here to stay. It's going to be, uh, you know, someone, I think earlier, someone said this, you know, mentioned CSTO as, you know, they pretend it's a, uh, it's like a parallel to NATO. It's not. But what is a parallel, not, not to NATO, but to, to some of these Western, this, this agglomeration, let's say, of Western institutions is the SCO potentially. And I think that that's, that's uh, uh, down the road, if there is, you know, if we're lucky and Russia develops, you know, Putin is replaced and there is a more um, open to cooperate, op open to, a, to settlement, let's say Russian leadership down the road at some point. Uh, and, you know, maybe China also, uh, I, don't I, know, I don't know that much about China, so uh, <laughs> I don't wanna speculate on that. Uh, is that that's, that's where you might wanna come to some kind of understanding. Again, not, not you know, it's, 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 we don't have, the, there are a lot of differences uh, and uh, both uh, political and, and values, but, but that's where an, some kind of modus vivendi might need to be achieved. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the anecdote about how, gee, back in the day, you know, we were throwing a few million dollars worth of equipment at the Central Asian countries, and there was all this giddiness about how they were gonna become Western style democracies. This is what I was talking about earlier, about the need for us to have realistic goals that, you know, we can be a player in Central Asia and supporting economic development, continuing to support rule of law and democracy. And in some places there's real progress, but you know, it's more than writing a few checks and imagining that somehow uh, we're gonna wave a magic wand and, and the people in Uzbekistan or Kyrgyzstan are gonna become little Americans. We gotta get away from that. Uh, we need to continue to push policies that will uh, increase freedom for the individual, both in the economic and political sphere and the rule of law sphere, but we need long-term commitments. And, you know, we, we tend as Americans and American diplomacy tends to suffer from ADHD, you know, and at most we have a four-year horizon on affecting anything, all right? I don't expect that to change anytime soon. I mean, Afghanistan is a good example of that, if, if you'll let me. You know, uh, when, I, when uh, I served in Afghanistan and others in this room have done so as well, you know, we would get visits from congressional delegations saying, okay, how long is it gonna take to fix Afghanistan, you know, to achieve our long-term strategic goals? And I saw generals and ambassadors say 20 years. And congressmen and senators would say, well, thank you very much for your honesty. You're not gonna have 20 years. You know, the American people and the American Congress don't have that kind of strategic patience. So what can you do in a couple of years? And yeah, uh, there was a tendency for people to say, well, I will do, I will shoulder my share of the task. I will do the best I can, you know, and kick the can down the road a little bit. Uh, I think we need to moderate our goals and we need at the same time to accept that uh, increasing our influence, even if it doesn't end in some sort of total victory is worth the effort. Hi. Thank you. Um, to, the, to the online question about security, I, I, I think like all wars comes down to, to the populations that are involved in it. Um, and, and they will drive um, the war to a resolution, and then they will drive the, the post-war security environment. And that, that I think we, we've seen uh, many times. And, and so we'll see. I think the Ukrainian population is 100% behind um, not giving up more territory and, and has dedicated themselves. They have mobilized the entire country um, behind this effort. Um, in contrast, uh, I'm not sure that's true in Russia. Uh, I think, uh, so we will see how long the Russian population um, will allow this to go on and then how much pushback and how much uh, aggressiveness they have to, to bring it to conclusion. So um, that's the short answer to that. On to, to the other gentleman who, who made mention to the internet and the information environment, I think if I 
understood part of your thing, some of it was reference to uh, uh, misinformation and, and how do you preclude those kind of things. Um, I, I would just say again, back, back to a comment I made earlier is I, I think um, the digital generation, the generations who have come up with the iPhones that understand that um, the majority of them understand that there's a lot of different sources of, of information and having access to that and the ability to compare and contrast mm -hmm. and, and look across the scope of that, I think um, will do a lot to, to um, not allow that misinformation to drive. There, there will always be the fringe elements and, and there's never gonna be anything we can do for that. We've seen it throughout history, but I think the majorities are, are in that middle round group and the opportunity to be able to do research on their own without someone sitting, you know, and looking at a box and having someone preach to them, I think is, is, uh, is the way to go on, on that one. Um, and then just real quickly on the Central Asian states, I think one of the things that I think is key about the Central Asian states is, um, and, and my colleagues here have, have laid that out very clearly about uh, the deep roots that Russia has in those areas, certainly from an economic perspective, from a historical perspective, you're not gonna drive Russia out uh, of those areas. So I think, but there's, there's strength in collectiveness. So um, trying to, from a CENTCOM you know, kind of perspective, trying to um, get them all together, have them all understand and, and row in one direction, and, and not try to you know, push Russia completely out because uh, recognizing that that's probably a bridge too far. But I think there are gains and there's opportunity there as Russia is, is focused on Ukraine to get a foothold in there and to rally those, those countries to do small things and to support uh, more move towards, towards Western um, and, and towards some of the things that we'd like to do in order to, to push back and cause dilemmas for Russia. Thank you. I just uh, also want to mention about Russian support. Uh, just in the past week, there was a, a um, opinion poll that was released indicating that for the first time, a majority of Russians are in favor of not continuing the war. I think mobilization is now impacting Russia. Those numbers uh, were, were flipped from just a month ago. Uh, when the war was not so close to home. And, and it's absolutely true that uh, in principle, they believe in destroying the Ukrainian Nazis and uh, uh, seizing territory that is rightfully Russia's, uh, but they're now uh, seeing the costs of the war. Uh, so that's, that's really impacting them. One quick thing on uh, information, uh, since we are at a university, I think all of us uh, who teach uh, at whatever level, uh, it's our responsibility to do a better job uh, helping uh, students to assess uh, information and sources. Um, so why don't we end with your question? I think we, do we have? That sounds good to we, me. Yeah, we have in the last five minutes, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so um, it's taking notes questions and answers and I appreciate all the all the dialogue but we're here to kind of think of solutions and we've discussed a lot of what does exist and has existed and how we're all viewing what it is but I would really like to know the panel's answer to what you believe the solution is for us to deal with things that many of our partners view as our hypocrisy according to the May CRS, um, the Congressional Research Survey, China holds second largest of US debt, right? The next one is Japan. So when we look to our partners and we're like, don't work with China, we're not coming from a place of some sanctimonious above them. China holds US debt greatly. And what we also have is that, and Sir, you mentioned this, that we are, we are not looking to supplant others. We're just looking for our seat at the table. There was reference to, you know, the kids table. I think one of the, the, the issues I see as a, as a watcher of Central Asia is that we oftentimes just say Central Asia states, but they are sovereign states and they have independent needs. And I think one of the, um, 
unfortunate like uh, arenas that we fall into it as that you know that fits into american exceptionalism that we know what's best for you is that we categorize so many sovereign states into a single entity mm -hmm. and oftentimes they view that as a very hypocritic kind of stance towards our diplomacy towards them so i appreciate i, I really felt like um, Mr. Ambassador, you were reading my notes because I do think strategic patience is something that we don't embrace as well here and we don't have foreign policy or really like our policy terms are very short, but how would you all propose solutions for shifting that mindset of American exceptionalism in a way that we could ask for a seat at the table with partners that we view as more important in their region than we are in their region? Thank you. This is a very good question to end with. So please, anybody want to start? Uh, should we start with Michael? Michael, do you want to start? And... Oh, I thought we were going to start that side. Oh, we can start on this side, yes. <laughs> Why don't we? All right, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> I'm happy to do it. I'll, I'll just, just briefly, I think, you know, from our perspective, great, great question. I think from our perspective, um, it, it really is about partnering um, and, and trying to get to know and understand each company. I think if you if you listen to the CG uh, commanding general talk after his his uh, trips to the Central Asian states, his his one mantra is, you know, you have to do more than just sit at a table and, you know, drink tea or coffee or whatever and have a conversation look at powerpoint slides you have to get out and really understand what makes the country tick and what they want to do he went horseback riding with with one of the uh, one of the chods and, and did many other things and i think his point was that's where you really learn what the country needs and how you can best provide a solution um, and try to try to figure out how you solve their problems and, and try to help them and i'll i'll pause there yeah. sir or how you help them to solve their problems, not how you solve their problems. Because I think this is the part we're talking about here. C different countries are different. I mean, we, there's a whole checklist of, of, of ways you can be better at diplomacy. But one thing is getting out of the capital, talking to ordinary citizens, not just to Western speaking elites. I think accepting uh, the point that, um, that the scholar was making that, yeah, People are going to be suspicious of foreign governments. They should be suspicious of foreign governments. All foreign governments are going to be pursuing their own national interests. Now, I happen to think that uh, the US is well positioned to promote economic security, rule of law, human rights in ways that are useful to people in other countries. Do we fail miserably at that sometimes? Of course we do. Does that mean we should stop trying? No. Uh, we also should not assume that because we come from a big country with big cars and a big GDP, you know, that we're smarter than everybody else. I mean, I could go on and on about this. You know, frankly, my experience dealing with foreign diplomats and policymakers is that often they have to be sharper than us because they don't have all the tools we do. You know, they can't threaten airstrikes uh, in order to pursue their policy goals. You know, they've got to be smart and nimble and, and think strategically, you know? Um, and on top of that, I think it's also clear that, you know, information is out there. Um, everybody has a good BS detector now. And last point I'll make there, getting back to the question about information. Yeah, it's a drag that there's so much information out there and there's disinformation out there. And it's hard to separate the truth from, from falsehood. But if you live in a country where if you aren't on the internet, all you get is 100% disinformation from government broadcasting, you're better off you know, going online uh, you get yourself a VPN and try to find the truth. And we see this in the generational differences about attitudes in authoritarian states. I mean, in Russia, 
older people are just watching Russian government TV in Central Asia. Older people are just watching Russian state TV broadcast into Central Asia. You know, they think that the Americans in Ukraine, you know, are spawn of Satan. Um, their kids, even if they have trouble sifting through all this stuff, even if there are limitations on internet freedom, they are more likely to find reality than their parents are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll just add one, I already talked about this earlier, but I'll just add one thing very quickly. The most effective uh, US uh, propaganda during the Cold War was not talking about democracy and human rights and all those things. It was cultural programs. Mm -hmm. It was jazz, uh, it was blue jeans, it was all those things. Uh, um, and that's so you make yourself attractive by being attractive right by like having a culture that others want to emulate it's harder now there aren't those kind of the iron curtain is not the same kind of iron curtain russians have you know the same hamburgers and the same you know jazz and whatever but that's that's still much more that kind of cultural attractiveness is still much more effective than you know preaching about democracy and human rights um, in terms of uh, convincing people to to uh, follow your lead. Uh, building off of that last comment, one of the great things that we had was uh, foreign students coming to the U.S. to study and to return back to their home countries, having seen what life is like here. Um, the cultural diplomacy that 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 we need to uh, to absolutely continue and ramp up and and that I think we've has taken a back seat to uh, to to some forms of diplomacy recently. So um, certainly a humble attitude, a welcoming attitude uh, to to bring people here to see how how great it is here um, is very important. Thank you so much. And thank you all to our magnificent panelists. We're so grateful for your insights. Thank you. And thank you for your great questions. Well, thank you very much, Gotho. I sure hate to be the bad guy here. This was fantastic and we can go on for a long time. So thank you very much, Gotho, our moderator, our panelists. And thank you for coming to Tampa and making the trip. I hope, you know, I apologize for my relentless emails and texts and everything else I could possibly do. And, uh, you know, I was sitting there and I couldn't help, but I wanted to jump into conversations. And I know it's lunchtime and no one wants to hear anything before lunch uh, to do that. You know, we talked about Kipling's great game and ambassador, thank you for bringing up Afghanistan. And I think a couple of my key takeaway is this is not a time for isolationism. This is not a time, but the question is, we have to recognize we are in a modern strategic competition. And do we understand it? Do we understand those human dynamics of interest, influence and power, which I think we call, we don't have the luxury to throw money at it any longer. It has to be effective. And this is looking beneath the iceberg a lot of times. And this is where the human dynamics comes in and the re-engagement. So one more time, thank you so much. And thank you for shedding light on these pressing security considerations arising from Russia and Ukraine. So we'll now break for lunch and we'll come back at 2.15. And please come back at 2.15 sharp because boy, oh boy, the second panel, you know, I'm gonna advertise this. It might be just as good, if not better than this one. And also we have our plenary speaker, uh, Ambassador Billingsley, which you don't want to miss his talk at 2.15. And the lunches, we do have some very nice places in around the campus and also at Fowler just across the street uh, for lunch. So please grab your lunch and come back. And if you have any questions on exactly where to go, we do have some people to direct you, but we do have walking distance right across the street and also right across on Fowler uh, to do this. And I think that's it. So thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch and we'll see you at 2.15. Thank you again.
So welcome back, everyone. Hopefully everyone had a great lunch and I was at the lunch conversation and wow, that, that was a very enriched conversation. And I'm sure everyone else had a chance to network and talk about the morning panel in the afternoon and all the other issues. And uh, I'm incredibly honored to introduce our plenary speaker, Ambassador Marshall Billingsley. Ambassador Billingsley is a former assistant secretary at the Department of Treasury and a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Prior to joining the Hudson Institute, Mr. Billingsley was a special presidential envoy of arms control at the US Department of State holding the rank of ambassador. In his capacity, he led arms control negotiations and worked with partner and allies in Europe and Asia on developing and deploying defensive capabilities. Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Billingsley. So thank you, Dr. Farhadi, and, and thanks to the University of South Florida uh, for hosting this conference on such an important and timely topic, as well as to U.S. Central Command uh, for, uh, for being here with us. And it's great to see General McKenzie again and to see General Carrillo this morning, the two fantastic officers I've had a chance to work with over the years, and U.S. Suncom and the nation are cer <clears throat> certainly lucky to have them. I also want to thank at the outset uh, of my remarks, Elon Musk and his new artificial intelligence platform, ChatGPT, because last night I went ahead and tasked it with auto-generating the rest of this speech. <laughs> Work smarter, not harder, right? No, seriously, this thing is the rage on Twitter. Uh, people are saying it spells the end of uh, term papers in college. Uh, it can instantly write a 300 word short story on Bill Clinton getting into a fist fight with Niccolo Machiavelli or uh, an Atlantis Morissette song about trading Victor Boop for Brittany Griner. Isn't it ironic? So why not task it to brainstorm on <clears throat> the implications for the Middle East from Russia's war against Ukraine? But I will tell you, because I actually tried to do this just to see what would happen, uh, the machine wanted nothing to do with this topic. It threw up multiple objections. It said uh, its data hadn't been refreshed since 2021, no way to connect to the internet to get additional information, and it didn't want to comment on current events. Um, basically, the AI was saying, this is a really complicated topic. It involves high stakes, probably going to get it wrong, and I don't really want to have anything to do with it. It's a hard pass. So without the benefit of artificial intelligence, uh, what you're getting this afternoon is whatever of mine uh, I can offer. Um, so set your expectations accordingly. I'm going to talk to you about four things. The first is why it's important that we keep arming Ukraine to defeat the Russians. The second is what Russia will likely do in the CENTCOM AOR as the war grinds on. The third is likewise for China as they watch Ukraine and they plan for their own conquest of Taiwan. And time allowing to get to how Iran and its terror proxies factor into all of this. First, let me say, this is a debate that is raging now in Washington, particularly within, within my party. So here I'm, I'm, I'm speaking also to the young students of USF. This is, this is something that we must stick with, arming the Ukrainians. Make no mistake, arming a friendly, freedom-loving nation to defeat a massive and unprovoked Russian invasion is a quintessentially American thing to do. Ronald Reagan did it to the Soviets in Afghanistan, so bloodying the Red Army that they finally admitted defeat and withdrew. In his 1985 speech, <clears throat> State of the Union Address, President Reagan articulated what became known as the Reagan Doctrine. He cautioned against pass passivity when liberty is under assault. And he urged the American people that, quote, we must not break faith with those who are risking their lives to defy Soviet-supported aggression and secure rights which have been ours from birth, unquote. All told, Reagan spent around $3 billion to bleed the Red Army white in Afghanistan. If you adjust for today's dollars, that's around $11 billion. Of course, the scale and intensity of what's happening in Ukraine dwarfs 
what was going on in Afghanistan, and so too will be the sums necessary to defeat Russia this time around. To date, we've supplied approximately 17 billion to the Ukrainians in actual military hardware. And I believe we certainly can and should do more. There's a great deal of confusion because of how the Biden administration is double, triple, sometimes quadruple counting uh, these numbers, these various press releases, because they're not only including that 17 billion I mentioned, but they're also including the cost of replenishment. They're including the cost of actually getting our defense industrial base back to where it needs to be to manufacture these weapons, things like stingers and javelins, all these things you, you've heard of. We've also created a uh, slightly over $10 billion fund that Ukraine can use to buy weapons from American manufacturers. And then there are similar amounts that are being provided in terms of humanitarian assistance because Russia has wiped out half of Ukraine's GDP and people are freezing to death, as well as funds to keep the Ukrainian government operating on a day-to-day -day basis. So when you add up what the Biden administration has asked for, it's not trivial. It's about $105 billion if you add the most recent amounts they've asked for from the Congress, which many in my own party are having a hard time reconciling. But I must say that while the result, that the sums are not trivial, the results that the Ukrainians have had are also not trivial. Ukraine has used our equipment and that from our NATO allies to devastating effect on the Russians. According to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Russia has suffered more than 100,000 casualties so far. To put it in context, during the first nine months of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, or reinvasion of Ukraine, they have had more soldiers killed than in nine years of their invasion of Afghanistan. This is simply not sustainable for the Russian military. And you can see the results on the battlefield as they retreat from city after city. If we stay the course, if we stand by the, Russia, the, the Ukrainian people, Russia will lose this war too. Every $175,000 javelin or $120,000 stinger that we provide to the Ukrainians that knocks out a four or $20 million tank or helicopter or combat aircraft, that translates into a decimated Russian military that not only will not will be incapable of winning in Ukraine, but it actually won't be able to threaten our NATO allies for decades to come if we do this correctly. Now, the Ukrainian defense ministry provides their claims over how many different weapon systems have been eliminated, and they, they claim to have killed 3,000 tanks and uh, nearly 6,000 armored combat vehicles. Even if these numbers are inflated twofold, the attrition and the devastation being wreaked on the Russian military is, is clearly significant. And it's in this context that I, I remind everybody, our students, my Republican colleagues, as Reagan said in his State of the Union address, quote, dollar for dollar, security assistance contributes as much to global security as our own defense budget, unquote. We've got to keep that in mind. Moreover, with Chinese communist aggression against Taiwan, appearing ever more likely, the sooner we drive the Russian bear back, in, back into its cave to lick its wounds, the better. So I think we need to remind ourselves of what a, a true American foreign policy in this context looks like. It is not isolationist. It does not abandon freedom-loving peoples. It does not throw a lifeline to a drowning enemy. It tosses them an anchor. So if I then turn to how I believe this is going to unfold, Russia's not backing down and shows no signs of being willing to do so. And a big part of their counter to what we and our allies are doing, in fact, involves the CENTCOM AOR. Let's start on the economic side <clears throat> with export controls and sanctions. Some of the trade restrictions imposed by the United States, by Europe and some of our Asian allies are starting to bite. Russia is expending huge volumes of ordnance in this fight. And they're suffering these battlefield losses I mentioned. Simply put, they, are, they just don't have the production infrastructure necessary to replenish without access to a lot of Western technology and components. So they can't get these technologies and we're starting to see some important bottlenecks in, in Russian supply chains emerge, particularly for their precision guided munitions. Now this makes jurisdictions such as the United Arab Emirates 
with its free trade zones, very attractive to the Russian intelligence services. The SVR, which is its external intelligence service, inherited from the KGB a special line of officers who are trained and specialize in evading export controls. They understand how to, to establish the commercial footprint that is needed to acquire dual use technology for seemingly legitimate purposes. Dubai has long been a hub for this type of activity, often used by Iran, China, North Korea. Look for the Russian presence to expand there. In terms of sanctions, while the Russian economy really hasn't felt a major shock due to the Biden administration's unwillingness to truly target the oil sector or the gas trade or the associated banks, Russia is nevertheless planning for that eventuality. Uh, the recent EU price cap is largely performance art. They set it at $60 a barrel when Russian Urals is trading at 57. Uh, moreover, it doesn't even touch pipeline oil. Uh, which is what's going to Hungary and to Germany and others. And it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't begin to really degrade the hard currency reserves that the Central Bank of Russia has built up. But they are planning and they are beginning to put in motion the deceptive practices necessary to evade a truly meaningful set of sanctions on oil. And General, you and I have seen this firsthand with how the Iranians did it. The Russians are operating off of that playbook. The same kinds of tools and techniques, tricks that the Venezuelans and the Iranians and the North Koreans use are what we're now seeing the Russians use. In fact, a number of vessels that were previously being used by the Iranians to smuggle oil are now in Russian service. And we're seeing them go dark, turn off their AIS beacons. They're bunkering in the same places that the Iranians bunker off of the Herd Bank, which is just outside Maltese territorial waters for instance, those vessels are eventually going to head east through the Suez and around Yemen and onwards to India and China. Uh, and, and I will tell you, Admiral, this is kind of, this is your bailiwick and you're, I'm really glad to see we got a, by the way, go Navy beat army. But, uh, <laughs> but maritime interdiction is gonna become an even more important mission for CENTCOM and I do hope that you and NAVCENT are gonna be given the resources and the authorities necessary to get at this Russian problem. You see, unless we start making a real dent in Russia's hard currency generation through these energy exports, they will prolong this war and potentially for years. I want that to sink in. The Europeans today are sending every single day more than half a billion dollars in oil and gas purchases to Moscow. And India and China have stepped in to pick up what's left. So assuming we do begin to have a financial impact, a real financial impact, the illicit off the books re revenue generation of other Russian activities is going to become ever more important. And this again falls within CENTCOM's remit as well as AFRICOM's. Let me give you an example. Certain of the Russian oligarchs like Yevgeny Prigozhin, who runs the Wagner Group, are really mattering to Putin, not only because of what they're doing on the ground in Ukraine with all the convicts that they rounded out, out of the Russian prisons and mobilized, but the Wagner Group has been operating a wide range of raw material concessions across the Middle East and Africa, which are big money makers. In the press most recently is the monopoly that they've established over the diamond trade coming out of the Central African Republic. But they've got gold mines in Sudan, They've got oil concessions in Libya and Syria and so on and so forth. So these oligarchs will feature prominently in the future in terms of that revenue uptake if we begin hitting the Russian economy the way we should. So I suggest that CENTCOM and AFRICOM have an opportunity by working with Ukrainian special forces to put a dent in these revenue streams. CENTCOM can certainly find and fix the commercial targets. What the Ukrainians do to finish them is their business. But you're gonna to have to press hard to get a reluctant White House to give you that kind of authority. Finally, I mentioned both the UAE and I mentioned oligarchs, and we will see a great deal of oligarch money flowing into Dubai and to Abu Dhabi, as London and Europe and the United States are increasingly inhospitable jurisdictions where our law enforcement agencies and our treasuries are first freezing and then seizing their assets. Again, an area where CENTCOM can contribute, even if it doesn't have the finishing force. We did this with the Afghan threat finance cell together. 
In fact, I've got former Treasury officers here who know all about that. We did it again on my watch to ISIS together with CENTCOM. The all source analytic capability that the command has, the planning methodologies that, that the command has and the mill to mill contacts, these are all things that would help the interagency immensely. On China, I'm gonna keep it very brief. Suffice to say that the Chinese Communist Party is watching what's happening and they are reducing this all down to a math problem when it comes to Taiwan. How much, how, what's the size of the hard currency reserves we have to have? How quickly will the Americans slap sanctions and if, and on what? They're not gonna to try to export control us because we don't export, we import. So what are they gonna do in terms of raw material imports, these Americans and their European allies and their Asian allies? Given that the Russian ruble is one of the world's strongest performing currencies to date, even though the president came out saying he was going to quote, reduce it to rubble right after the invasion, I, my guess is Xi Jinping has decided he can weather the financial sanctions. But to be on the safe side, the Chinese Communist Party is going to want as many financial entanglements as they can possibly engineer with Gulf financial institutions, preferably in yuan denominated accounts, to deter the United States from sanctioning these gargantuan Chinese banks, banks that dwarf the size, frankly, of many US investment banks and certainly Russian banks. On the export control side, I suspect the Chinese are a bit more concerned. As I said, they are a major importer. And so we should expect China to aggressively push for assured access to raw materials. In the event of a shooting match over Taiwan, China knows that one of our options is to enforce trade embargoes and blockades on the sea lanes. Through their contracts with the Saudis and Qatar and establishment of naval facilities in the UAE and Djibouti, Equatorial Guinea, and in Sri Lanka and so on, China is trying to reduce the viability of this option and it will fall to CENTCOM to do the very best they can to keep this trade space open for a future administration. Finally, I mentioned Iran and I'll conclude. They and their terror proxies are highly relevant as we've heard today, uh, both in the keynote speeches as well as through the panel, uh, they're highly relevant to Russia's war. Uh, now, the good news is I think we, I believe, we are seeing the emergence of a full-scale revolution in Iran. And whether they can put it down through force or not remains to be seen. I hope I'm right and that they can't. This certainly has delayed and I think somewhat complicated their ability to further bolster Russia beyond what they've already done. But I mentioned that Russia's flush with cash and there's no accident when they fly cargo planes into Tehran to onload these UAVs, these drones and these ballistic missiles they're also bringing in pallets of euros. It's no accident, like I said, that, uh, that Iran has both the capacity and the willingness to sell these drones and these missile systems. It fits neatly into the Russian campaign of barbarism against the Ukrainian people. I mean, let's, let's not kid ourselves. They're practicing genocide here. They're slaughtering innocent men, women, and children, civilians in Ukraine, and they are attempting to blot out the Ukrainian culture. And the Iranians certainly could care less. They, in fact, they're willing to go so far as put advisors on the ground in Crimea to both train on how to operate these drones, to fly them against civilian targets, and potentially to fly them themselves. We know they're there because the Ukrainian government has come out and said that recently they conducted a strike that killed as many as 10 of them. This is the same modus operandi that CENTCOM has seen the Iranians use with the Houthis in Yemen, who've been conducting drone and missile strikes against Riyadh, against the airport there, against civilian populations, against the Emiratis. It's the same MO that they've been using with Hezbollah and perhaps now with the Maduro regime in Venezuela. So looking for opportunities to disrupt these actions in those cases has long been a CENTCOM priority. In fact, there was another Dow seizure uh, just last week uh, where they pulled over a vessel that was loaded with more explosives and ammunition and rocket propellant ingredients as a case in point. But looking for ways to degrade Iranian drone and missile assistance to Russia, to Russia should become a major, fairly new priority. So with that, I'm gonna conclude. I hope that you, <clears throat> I think you'll take away hopefully two things from my remarks. First is that CENTCOM, Despite the shift to great power competition, CENTCOM remains unquestionably a vitally important command in this era of great power competition. 
but you're going to have to study up on domains that may not be as familiar or as comfortable for a combatant command, such as high finance, such as economics, such as the oil trade. By the way, this is something that I think the professors at, at USF can help with. Uh, in many cases, most in fact, you're not gonna possess the finishing force or the effectors that are needed. Those are gonna come from your interagency and coalition partners, but you can and should work to actively put them over the target. I think your second takeaway is probably that it would have been better if Elon Musk's AI had agreed to write this speech. Um, but those are my thoughts as they stand. And I do thank you for the time and attention and the chance to be with you. Ambassador, thank you very much. We're honored for your thought provoking address. And I have a few of my students here now, their final papers were due yesterday. Now I have to go check to see if they are Elon Musk AI aided or not. So that's just more work for us. Well, now it's time for our second panel. So let's get started. Our second panel discussion will explore how Russia's invasion of Ukraine has affected drug trafficking in transnational organized crime in the region. This interagency panel will examine how regional and global competitors respond to this activity and how these responses shape opportunities and challenges for the US security interests, both domestically and globally. I'll turn the discussion now over to our esteemed panel moderator, Dr. Andrew Whiskeyman. Dr. Whiskeyman is an associate professor in the College of Information and Cyberspace at the National Defense University and a visiting professor at the Joint Special Operations University here in Tampa. His area of studies include information warfare, disruptive technology, strategic forecasting, and leadership development. Before he retired from 20 years of active military duty, he served as the Chief of Information Operation and Chief of Strategy for the CENTCOM Joint Cyber Center. Welcome, Dr. Whiskey Man. And just a point of clarification in our program, Mr. Matthew Donahue is the former uh, Deputy Chief of Operations for DIA. Just wanted to make that clarification for everyone. Dr. Whiskey Man. Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, sir. Good to see you again. Uh, welcome. And to the about 70 of you all that decided to be back this afternoon, you're in for a treat. I can't promise it's gonna be a better panel than the one this morning. I think we could have gone on for many more hours with the fascinating points, uh, the great questions, the dialogue about the topic. That's kind of the challenge with panels like this, right? And conferences like this is any one particular aspect could be an entire semester or entire lifetime worth of study. The benefit that I see from this, though, is being able to have a panel of experts who have spent a lifetime studying the topics, sharing really critical points that hopefully generate discussions, ideas, potential solutions, and outcomes that out of this group, we can start presenting and moving forward with, and not just admiring problems. I'm just going to have a couple of contextual thoughts to start this off. And then I'm gonna turn it over to each of the esteemed members of this panel to provide a brief introduction of what they'd like you to take away about their, their thoughts, a couple of opening remarks, and then hopefully we'll get to some great questions. So as we're going through this, please be thinking about what you would like to ask. You can just line up or queue up behind the microphone. How many are we at online right now? Do you have a count? Almost 90, so we're up a little bit from uh, before the break, which is great, people came back, so welcome. So always trying to do a hybrid one of these is a little challenging uh, when you have folks online as well. But if you are entering questions into the chat, please do that. We'll alternate questions back and forth if you have them to make sure we address that, because the most exciting part is the dialogue, I think. All right, so biases, assumptions, and sources. I want you to think about those three things as we walk through the discussions on this and how it ties back into what we talked about this morning. What are the biases that we each bring to thinking about this problem? What are the biases that our competitors or adversaries are approaching it with? 
What assumptions do we make about what the problem really is or problems might be? What assumptions are our competitors making that are driving their decisions as we have that interaction between the two? And then somebody a whole lot more famous than me once asked a question, quid est veritas, what is truth? How do we trust the sources that we have for the information that we're receiving in order to make our decisions? Those are all really important things to be thinking about as we approach this, and as you approach the questions that you bring to us on the panel. All right, quick vignette. In 2015, I was, had just earned my PhD. I was blessed to be accepted to a brand new program in the Army. It was colloquially known as the SAMS PhD. And I was looking at what my next assignment was going to be. And I had dreams of grandeur about where I was going to get used in a SIG or a CAG, or I was going to get tapped into to just be part of something meaningful. And when I spoke with my assignment officer, it was ABC, anything but CENTCOM. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that because I had had multiple trips into the Middle East already, and I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to think about China and the Pacific. I wanted to think about Russia and Europe. I wanted to think about the Arctic. I had written one of my masters on climate change and national security, so the opening of the Arctic, something, something just different. Well, you know what they say about plans and laughing at times. My wife was really happy I got assigned to SENTCOM in 2015, but, but I wasn't, and boy, was I wrong. Because CENTCOM is the crossroads of strategic competition, as General Carrillo mentioned. If you want to think about Russia, you can't do it without the central region. If you want to think about China, it's to your detriment to not consider the central region. And this is not a new phenomenon. This is not a plea for resourcing, right? It's just practical. It's been that way for millennia. There's a great site out there called Maps of War. I love it because in about three minutes, you get this overlay of all the different uh, um, cultures and great powers back to Alexander, really, that have crisscrossed the central region. You can find it on YouTube. It's really, really a neat, uh, neat teaching tool to think through. That's not new. We ignore this region to our detriment. And we saw that this morning in the great panel discussions and how, how we laid out why it's important to think about the central region when it comes to these, these issues. That's a big picture look. So why drugs? Well, I think you'll see as we get into this presentation this afternoon, the discussions, there are many second and third order effects that come out of Russia's decision to invade Ukraine. And one of them is the challenges with narco trafficking and the connections that that has to so many other things, including homeland security here in the US and for many of our Western allies. The drug problem is not something separate by itself. And I think you'll see that through the thread of the discussions today. While you cannot approach a complex situation with really myopic thinking or thinking about a single domain or a single solution, we mentioned that this morning too, right? Attacking a complex problem requires a team of teams approach. And so when we look at interagency and the whole of government, hopefully spelled with a W, not just an H, we come together and really think through how do we get after some solutions? How do we bring the best of what we have from State Department, Department of Defense, DEA, and bring that together to make the Reese's peanut butter cup of solutions? Reese's peanut butter cup? Yeah, you take chocolate and peanut butter and they don't lose their essence, but they come together and it's just this delicious thing, right? That's kind of what we're looking to do. We don't want to make the State Department into the Department of Defense or vice versa, but keep your strengths come together and figure out ways to get after solutions. All right, enough about some of my biases to come in. I love the central region. I didn't start out that way, but I'm a, I'm a believer now and was blessed to be in that uh, fight. On a side note, if you want to talk anything information, disinformation, whether it's the deluge of disinformation, the fire hose of falsehood or whatever else, I'm happy to talk separately on that. I'll try not to to turn this into that because we're talking narcotics. But with that, I want to turn it over to Admiral Renshaw, who's the
the J3 at CENTCOM right now for, for his take on this uh, and his opening remarks. So thank you very much. And sir, over to you. Hey, thanks a lot, uh, Andy, doctor. Uh, pleasure to be here uh, today with all of you. And, uh, and, you know, I am probably subject to my own biases. Uh, every day I get the Intel book and when I get done reading it, I walk back out and I tell my staff, I didn't really need to read the Intel book today because I already knew that the Russians are jerks, the Iranians are up to no good and the Chinese wanna take over the world. Um, so that, that's, that's my personal bias on, on the region. But, uh, you know, as we, we talk about, you know, Iran and, um, and Ambassador Billingsley mentioned, you know, Iran, um, they are the real challenge for us in the region. So most of the destabilizing activity uh, most of the threats uh, to the, the world order that uh, we, we choose to try to permeate throughout the, going back to the Atlantic Charter, you know, in the region uh, where Russia would do the same thing, definitely in the European region, uh, Chinese would do it globally to try to challenge that world order and create one where a regional hegemon uh, would divide and isolate weaker, weaker states and then try to dominate them. Uh, that's exactly what Iran is trying to practice in the Middle East and has for a long time. You know, they see themselves as the heirs to that Persian empire. So um, uh, we should be terrified uh, by Iran and Russia uh, you know, coming together in some sort of uh, unholy alliance. Um, and, uh, and certainly Chinese uh, will try to benefit from that as well. Uh, at the same time, you know, there's a, there's a great deal of destabilization uh, that goes uh, with the Russian war on Ukraine as they're uh, trying to, to show that they still have some power in Syria as they uh, uh, are unable to do some of the things in border security in Central Asia that they once did. But, but it also then offer, off, offers us some opportunities. And those opportunities are to demonstrate to the partners in the, in the region and then our allies throughout the world uh, that what we saw in response to Ukraine were a strong NATO that stands for the same values, you know, can stand up to Iran. And, and I, would, I would never say something like Middle Eastern NATO. So don't, don't take those words the wrong way. There, there, there's too many diverse uh, thoughts. But uh, with US leadership, the ability to resist Iran, to be contributing members to the world order, to, to use uh, the power of the region uh, for the good of the world economy, I think is, is very important. And so, you know, I'm, I'm getting ahead a little of myself, but, but you alluded to it. You know, this region, if you look at a map of the Belt and Road Initiative, it goes right through the Middle East. It follows where the Silk Road went thousand, a thousand years ago that Marco Polo traveled on. Uh, and it also has the maritime routes. And those maritime routes go back to, um, you know, as, as surely as the uh, monsoon wind is gonna blow uh, from the south to the north, uh, in, the, in the summertime and then back to the south again in the wintertime, you know, those dows that are sailing there now, their, their ancestors have been doing that for thousands of years. And so uh, the, the, the value of that trade is incredible. Uh, but if you go back a thousand years, you could probably find a pirate. You can probably find a smuggler. You can probably find ungoverned um, uh, trade routes. And so uh, what has happened in that region when you talk about the history of, of, of conflict is uh, various civilizations arise and try to exploit or dominate those trade routes. And when they try to dominate or exploit those trade routes, eventually there's someone who's going to challenge that or they're going to overstep. So that, 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 that sense of a conflict that's always in the region, the sense of this global economy that flows through there uh, always permeates. And so uh, despite um, you know, whatever the U.S. interests are globally, we are always drawn to this region because the, 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 the global world order depends on the security of those trade routes, the, stable, the sta stability of those regions, and the ability to try to keep them uh, out of war. And so Iran is, is the biggest threat to that, and, and Russia has been right there as well. Um, and a big part of that, that global trade, unfortunately, is not legal trade. It's, uh, it's smuggling people, it's smuggling weapons, it's smuggling uh, uh, commodities, and uh, it is certainly now smuggling drugs. And, uh, and so you have a, a countries in the region that either lack the will 
uh, the capability or absolutely are complicit in, uh, in, in using these drugs uh, for their own gain. And, uh, and so, or, or at least stopping you know, the drug trade. So the land route uh, that I talked about, that's in the Belt and Road Initiative that we, you can look at a map. And if you look at where the mountains are and where things lie, you know, the land route that comes from the opium fields in Afghanistan uh, that goes either to the Caspian Sea or up through the Central Asian, Asian nations and the steppes of Kazakhstan into Russia uh, is, is a boulevard uh, for drug trade. Um, and the border uh, with Afghanistan and Tajikistan, to some extent, Uzbekistan, uh, is not a very, very secure border. In fact, the Tajikistan border is about, uh, it's, it's about a thousand miles and uh, about every 10 or 15 miles, there is a, uh, what's really a hut. It's like a, maybe a shack with three people. Uh, in between those huts, there aren't a bunch of sensors and, and uh, helicopters flying around. You know, there, there's nothing. And so it, it's, it's quite porous and it's, it's a huge challenge. Uh, to the south, um, the, the, through the Makran coast, if you go down through Pakistan, but really through Iran, um, you have the same, you know, you get to the coast and you've got these dows, you've got smugglers. And if you get it to one of the places, uh, General McKenzie mentioned, or General Carilla mentioned earlier, that uh, about half the world's shipping eventually goes through the region. Um, you know, one shipping container can, can carry a lot of drugs. And if you have one shipping container among hundreds on hundreds of ships, um, you've got a real problem. And so uh, even as we look at, uh, at dows and, and those smuggling routes, uh, for example, uh, we have about, uh, we had about 177 DAOs last year that we thought, hey, this, this fits the profile. This could be somebody that's smuggling. Uh, we were able to get a ship to interdict about 33 of those DAOs. Uh, 32 of them, 32 of the 33 had drugs. Better one might have too, we just didn't find it. So, so pretty high success rate. Um, what is classified and we don't know for sure is, uh, so we, we, we 177 were suspect. How many, how many did we miss? And uh, I suspect the number isn't one or two. And, and so uh, the scope of that problem is, is again, a big challenge for us. Um, the good news is that when we talk about the people, partners and innovation uh, that General Carrillo has emphasized uh, uh, and emphasized again this morning, um, partnerships are how we get after this problem. Innovation is how we get off this pro after this problem. Even if we have a major naval presence um, and we have, a, uh, we're abil we have the ability to put a destroyer 24 seven in the Red Sea, that's like having one police car patrol the entire state of California. So we're never probably gonna get there by doing what we've done in the past and, and trying to throw just conventional forces at it. We have to have those conventional forces. We have to have the posture to build the partners. We have to have those to, to build around. Uh, but what we absolutely need is uh, partners, both in, uh, uh, from different countries, as well as in the interagency, you know, from our own government uh, to, to work these problems. In the maritime, we've got the, the combined maritime forces. You know, we're up to 35 countries and, and growing uh, who all, all view this as a problem. And so we can build a lot of confidence in them that we're working together to solve a problem uh, that would benefit all of us. And if you don't know a lot about the combined maritime forces, India and Pakistan are now both in the combined maritime forces. Now we gotta be careful sometimes that we don't put them too close together, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a future, Korea and Japan, sometimes bitter rivals, operate in the same task force we, we had a picture uh, of, a, uh, of a Korean commander who visited a Japanese ship assigned to his task force in CMF, awarding medals to Japanese sailors, all with big smiles on their faces. Uh, I've spent some time in, in uh, the Western Pacific, and I guarantee you, you will never see that in the Sea of Japan, or as the Koreans call it, uh, the East Sea, because they can't even agree on the name of, of the ocean. Uh, so so there's, a, there's a huge huge opportunity to build partners on this common ground. Similarly, in the, the, the um, Central Asian states, 
you know, as the Russians are slowly almost having to abandon that because their focus is so much on Ukraine, you know, they're starving for some uh, affection. And so, you know, we, we've been able to go to those border huts and rebuild them for them, make it, a, you know, it's, it's a little one room uh, with, with a bathroom and a kitchen and some comfortable beds, but that's a heck of a lot more than they have right now. Um, and then you layer that on with technology. And so from an ISR point of view, um, if you can get a lot of sensors into the air and into the water uh, on the ground, and then you can network those and then use modern computing power and artificial intelligence, then you can really start to get after that, you know, what is 177 plus X? What is that X? And then you can figure out the best place to interdict them, and you can start to make a, a, a much bigger difference uh, in that interdiction. So um, from the uh, CENTCOM point of view, the, the counter-narcotics interdictions is an opportunity for us uh, to build those partnerships and then to use innovation uh, to, to really hit the accelerator. And, and the funds are not going to be there. Uh, the forces are, are finite across the military right now. Uh, but uh, with, with the interagency, uh, with that innovation, and then with uh, the international partners, uh, we'll make a difference and we'll give them a lot of confidence an ability to push back, you know, as we try to fight for the global order, which really is to the benefit of all. Thanks. Hey, thank you very much, Admiral. Uh, Ambassador, over to you. <clears throat> well, you just you just heard me go on perhaps a little over over time here up there, so I, I want to yield all the time back to my colleagues, just to make one point. Uh, when I rattled off some of the skill sets, where I think. USF and, and the broader Tampa community can help the command, particularly in, in line with the commanding general's focus on innovation. I should have mentioned crypto. Um, it, we knew Iran was getting into the crypto business back on my watch at Treasury, <clears throat> but I would call attention to some very recent discoveries that the Iranians were using a dark exchange that was colluding with Binance, the huge Chinese exchange and that more than 8 billion, at least 8 billion in crypto assets were flowing through that process. Um, and I suspect we're gonna hear um, as we talk further about the, the narcotics aspect of this problem, that a lot of that ties directly to the narcotics trade. If not <laughs> now, then certainly it will in the future. And that's another area that I would commend uh, to the command as a, as a, as a focus area. But I would, I would yield back to, to learn more from my colleagues. All right, Dr. Schroden, over to you. Okay. And uh, good to see you again, by the way. Likewise. Long time no see. Dr. Wistman and I were on a separate panel yesterday at a completely different conference. By coincidence. By coincidence. Uh, well, thank you all for, for your time and attention today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Fahadi, for the in, invitation to speak. Uh, it, it's great to be back at USF. I, I live here in Tampa, so it's, uh, it's easy, but always still nice to, to come over and visit you. Um, so thanks for that. Um, I, I thought I would focus my remarks today on really the, the central hub of narcotics in the CENTCOM AOR, which is Afghanistan, um, right? And, and to do that, I'm going to draw a large, I am not a narcotics expert by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so I'm going to draw largely on the work of some people who are. Uh, David Mansfield, in particular, if you're not familiar with him, is, is literally the voice on this issue. Um, and I would commend you to him, as well as Rupert Stone, who's a journalist who's done a lot of recent reporting on this that's quite good, um, as well as reports from the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the UNODC, uh, which has been active in Afghanistan and tracking trends there for a long time. Um, so some good sources of information. Um, I'll touch on the situation uh, you know, with narcotics in Afghanistan uh, over the last year. Uh, primarily because obviously the Taliban took control about that length of time ago. And so the situation has changed, or, or at least in some ways has changed um, since they've been in, uh, in charge. Uh, so I'll touch on that. I'll also talk a little bit about what we might expect going forward uh, and what, if any, prospects the U.S. and the international community might have with respect to engaging the Taliban on this particular issue. So any of you who have been watching Afghanistan over the last two decades know that poppy production, opium production, right? eventually the production of heroin, um, that Afghanistan has been the central hub for that for quite a long time. Um, estimates recently, as recent as 2020, 
um, suggests that Afghanistan might be responsible for as much as 85% of the global supply of illicit opium and heroin. Um, so the vast majority of it comes from Afghanistan. Um, the poppy crop, right, which is where uh, it eventually gets turned into opium and, and heroin, uh, is grown largely in the Pashtun heartland of southern Afghanistan. Um, and it was a sizable source of income for the Taliban insurgency. Uh, and it is a sizable employment sector for Afghans. About 500,000 of Afghanistan's roughly 30, 35 million population are full-time employed by the poppy slash uh, narcotic sector. And that is despite a whole coterie and a lot of programs and a lot of money having been spent by the international community in Afghanistan over the last 20 years to try and combat this problem. So that's what you probably know already. What you might not know is that methamphetamines from Afghanistan have also significantly increased as a problem in recent years. Um, Afghans discovered within the recent past, four or five years ago, um, that a natural precursor to methamphetamines, the ephedra plant, grows very well in some of the mountainous regions in the central area of Afghanistan. And, and by using that natural source, the ephedra plant, it actually cuts the cost of eventually turning or you know, making methamphetamines about in half. So it's a much more efficient way to get the same end result than starting with synthetic chemicals and trying to cook those into methamphetamine. So as, as a result, we've seen su a substantial expansion of methamphetamine production in Afghanistan over the past few years. Now, looking at the last year in particular, um, with respect to poppy, since the Taliban have taken over, unsurprisingly, poppy cultivation has expanded uh, a lot. Again, according to the UNODC, the 2022 poppy crop harvest was one of the largest ever on record. Um, if you look at percentages of cultivated land for poppy in Afghanistan, the 2022 crop was 32% uh, larger than the poppy crop in 2021. So a pretty significant expansion in one year. Now that said, the Taliban Supreme Leader, Haibatullah Akhundzada, declared in no uncertain terms in March of this year that poppy cultivation was immediately banned upon punishment of crop destruction and arrest. Um, he also stated that the use, trade, transport, production, import, and export of drugs is also hereby banned in Afghanistan. Importantly, that came directly from him, directly from his office, not from someone else. Now, the timing of that announcement was a bit of a surprise because it came just before the poppy harvest was set to start in Afghanistan this year. The cycle is they plant, in the, generally speaking, they plant in the fall, harvest in the spring. So it was an odd time to make such an announcement right before the harvest was set to start. Um, now, how do you square all these points that I put together, right? Uh, as has been the case for a lot of other topics in Afghanistan since the Taliban have taken over, for example, girls' education is, is one that you may have uh, read about. There are pretty, there are a lot of differences between a stark policy that exists at the top and the implementation of that policy at the ground level in Afghanistan, which is to say, right, the implementation of these policies that are, are dictated by the Supreme Leader have to be carried out by Taliban officials in the districts of Afghanistan, at local levels, in the villages, in the towns, right? And those local officials have to make their own calculations about the political benefits and risks, both to the Taliban movement, et cetera, but also to themselves and their own little power fiefdoms in implementing that policy. And so uh, as, as David Mansfield has stated, quote, privately, Taliban leaders stepped back and said they would allow crops that were planted last fall to be harvested and sold, but then they would implement the ban that was decreed by the Supreme Leader. So effectively, right, they, they grandfathered in last year's crop relative to the decree, while also engaging in what were relatively performative type actions in the South where there's a secondary crop, right, plowing under some crops that were probably not going to produce very much anyway and doing lots of photo ops and putting it online, that type of thing. Um, Right, so, so that's sort of the, the situation with, the, with poppy so far. Now, the Taliban have, interestingly, moved much more strongly against the production of methamphetamines over the last year. So a year ago, uh, even before the poppy ban, they announced a ban on the harvest of ephedra, not coincidentally, right after the ephedra harvest season had ended. 
right? So, but they did announce such a ban. Uh, and so there was some, you know, the timing of it was, you look at it and be kind of cynical about, are they really gonna do anything with that, right? But this summer, interestingly, they closed the primary market hub, the Abdul Wadud Bazaar in Southwest Afghanistan, uh, completely shut it down. The first time in decades that it has been completely shut down in terms of narcotic trading. Um, and they closed a lot of the labs around the bazaar that were processing the crop as well as in other parts of the country. Um, as a result, what we've seen is the price of methamphetamines in Afghanistan has, has risen more than threefold, uh, right? So the market is indicating that there is some type of shortage of methamphetamines in Afghanistan as a result of these actions. So what are we likely to see looking forward? Um, experts, right, suggest that we're likely to see more action by the Taliban uh, against source crops and labs that are tied to methamphetamine. Right? It's less politically risky for them to do so because there's fewer farmers involved. There's less of a tradition of that uh, crop in Afghanistan. It's relatively new. And the bulk of it comes from the central highland areas of Afghanistan, which is not where the bulk of the Taliban's primary constituency, the Pashtun population lives. So it's a lot less politically risky for them to go after methamphetamine. And you're probably likely to see them do a lot more of that uh, both for internal audiences and external audiences. On poppy, we're likely to see a fairly disjointed implementation of the poppy ban going forward. So the planting season is taking place now in Afghanistan for a spring, a harvest in the spring. Um, and it's unclear to what extent, right, people are planting or not. There haven't been any widespread reports of the Taliban, you know, leaning on people, et cetera, although Mansfield has reported um, that the Taliban have been warning farmers in East and Southwest Afghanistan that poppy cultivation will not be tolerated, whether they're doing that purely for a deterrent effect or whether they intend to act on that remains to be seen. Uh, but the markets are nervous, right? The price of dry opium in Afghanistan has shot up just vertical, vertical line over the last few months. It's now around $450 per kilogram, which is the highest price it's been in Afghanistan since 2003. Uh, and it's doubled since July. So the markets are nervous. Now, what's interesting about that is the Taliban may be, you know, doing this whisper campaign to try and deter people from planting, but that price is a pretty large incentive for farmers to plant, especially in a country where the economy is decimated, people are starving to death, right? There is, there is a terrible economic situation going on. Um, so you have this, this uh, you know, push and pull between the economic inducement of the price, which is driven by the Taliban's policy, and the potential, you know, the gamble th these farmers have to make of whether the Taliban are going to implement that policy or not. So how that unfolds in the weeks ahead is very hard to predict and will be very, very interesting to watch. Um, in terms of engagement on this issue, right, what, what if anything, can the U.S. international community to, can do? To date, I've not detected much, if any, U.S. engagement on this issue with the Taliban at all. Uh, for example, the U.S. Special Representative Thomas West was just in Doha this week. He met with senior Taliban officials there, including Mullah Yaqub, who's the Minister of Defense, um, and, and Anas Akhani. Um, and his readout didn't mention narcotics or poppy at all, and neither the, did the Taliban readout of that meeting. So it wasn't, wasn't even a talking point in that meeting. Um, and I would argue that future engagement on it seems pretty unlikely at least from the US side of things, because issues like counterterrorism, humanitarian aid and women's rights are much, much more important to the United States. Uh, and, and we're not making nearly the types of progress on those issues that we would like. So this secondary issue is not even on the table. Now, the international community, Europe, Afghanistan's immediate neighbors, as we heard, have a lot more interest in this issue because the drugs are primarily going there. Right, and so it impacts them a lot more uh, directly. But again, right, they are, you know, you talk about impact of the Russia-Ukraine war, they are distracted in some ways by that. Um, uh, and there's a lot other, there's a, just a lot other things, a lot of other things that, that they have going on um, rather than focusing on this issue. So, um, so that's sort of, right, you're just not seeing the international community engage on this with the Taliban very much, if at all. Now, if the Taliban do act aggressively against narcotics, that might, might help their relations with the rest of the international community, 
right? And then some have argued that the bands that they've announced or the timing of those was in some ways uh, geared towards external audiences in the Taliban's initial press towards possible legitimization and recognition by the international community. Um, and so that may be a benefit that they would want to reap by, by acting on some of these things. That said, that recognition, that legitimization seems less and less likely to come, especially when you start to see things like, right, the ban on women's education. Uh, within the last few weeks, especially now, we've started to see public executions and floggings in stadiums with public attendance again, things that the international community, generally speaking, finds fairly abhorrent. Um, and so, right, it, I think the inducements that the Taliban might have wanted to get out of acting more aggressively on this issue are, are unlikely to come, and they probably know that at this point. So any implementation of the bans that they've announced going forward are probably less likely to come through any type of inducements from the international community and are likely to remain driven by their own ideological edicts, political calculations, and the economic conditions in Afghanistan recognizing that narcotics is a substantial industry in Afghanistan and is likely to remain so for the foreseeable future. Um, so with that, I thank you for your attention. I look forward to the questions. Hey, thank you, Dr. Schroeden. Uh, right, Mr. Great. Donahue, over to you. Bat and clean up today. Yeah, oh, it's always tough to come back clean up, especially, especially when I don't have a big bat. But uh, first, thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's, I really appreciate the opportunity to get a law enforcement perspective uh, from DEA uh, and, and especially from what we, we bring to the table, which a, part, a lot of people aren't aware that we have 91 offices in 68 countries. Uh, we have a very robust program overseas. And majority of my time, my experience when I was with DEA uh, was in Columbia, Columbia, South America, where I lived about 11 years. I was also the SAC in the Caribbean, where we covered the entire Caribbean, and then a regional director in Mexico covering Central America as, as well. And the reason I say that is uh, that's really important for DEA because we look at this as a global issue. And as I go through some points here, which hopefully will answer some of the questions that some people might have, is that we look at uh, the area of Sintam almost as an outside in approach, right? So you have uh, Clemming cartel members, Mexican cartel members, uh, other places in Central America uh, with Chinese nationals living in these areas calling over into the Sintam area. So if there's areas where we can't get certain projects, intercept projects on a judicial manner, we'll attack it from countries around it. So when we look at, uh, say, Afghanistan, I'll use that for an example. Uh, and I think it's a tremendous example of what the military can do along with law enforcement. When you look at the project that we put over there, what we'll call a JWIP, Judicial Wire Intercept Program, because it's all about intercepting communications that you can share evidence with other agencies and the IC. Uh, the, the, the police officers uh, over in Afghanistan were really an example of what can do when you can try and stabilize the country. When you have the SIU, Sense of Investigative Unit, the NIU and the TIU operating over there con uh, collectively with U.S. military, with U.S. law enforcement, with British, uh, British authorities as well, showing what that can do to build up a country, a country's security, and share that information with bordering countries. And what you'll see, what was born out of that, the RNIFC, uh, which uh, the, Sin the Sincom folks are really familiar with. Uh, DEA is heavily involved in that, funded by the military. And when you, when you talk about uh, interagency cooperation, right? It's one of the things I wanted to bring up. That's another example. A lot of people throw that word around, interagency, you know, cooperation. You know, but what is it really? Is it just putting the same people from different agencies together and sitting there and saying, okay, you know, we're interagency cooperation, or are they actually sharing? You know, or, or are they using their authorities collectively together to attack the problem? You know, one of the things I always told uh, my groups and offices, you know, we're, we're not playing for a tie, we're playing for a win. And sometimes you got to be very, very aggressive and have critical conversations with a lot of people inside the Beltway are always comfortable uh, and uncomfortable having. Because it, it takes, you know, it takes, you know, uh, uh, some intestinal fortitude to really get what needs to get done, and it, it's a it's a pretty ugly and violent world out there, and we see that in some of our offices, uh, we see that uh, what happened in Afghanistan, we see it in Mexico and, and other places that if we don't work collectively together, interagency, and using our authorities together to attack the problem, we're not going to get much further than what we are right now, and there's a lot of examples uh, that DEA has. Uh, with the military as a whole, with DOD as a whole, uh, working with FBI, HSI, uh, with, with Treasury, 
know there's always more ways to, to skin a cat. Uh, and, and we'll look at the Al Capone uh, theory, right? We don't care how you get them as long as you get them. You know, if we get them on jaywalking and we can put them in jail for 10 years, that's what we're going to do. And if that's someone else's charges that gets it, you know, that that's what we're going to do. And we look at uh, our relationship like with the IC and when you uh, work, work, work with the ambassadors and the DCMs uh, and, and these uh, embassies, it's really important to have that relationship and understand what the end goal is. Uh, we, we do a lot of work with SYNCOM over the last uh, couple of years. And I was very proud of our successes because no one was really worried about who was going to get the credit. They're just figuring out how can we work this out. And when we work it with the embassies, uh, which I always call the fifth floor guys, right? Because I was in Columbia, they sat in the fifth floor, right? What, what is the end game, All right? There's a big difference between intelligence and evidence. <clears throat> you can't put anyone in jail with intelligence. You can put them in jail with evidence. It's what you can prove in a court of law. And if you look at some of the really big targets, not just narco traffickers, uh, terrorists, uh, corruption, uh, hit, uh, hit men, right? They get, you got to put them in jail. Knowing things is really good and it's good for reports and sounds good when people want to read it in the morning saying, look, look how bad the world is. It's different when you have people downrange that are living there, speaking those languages, infiltrating these other countries to get a result done that's going to put people and organizations in jail. You know, and, and you look at the big picture that it's all about transnational criminal organizations. It's not about like the head of snake, you know, Chapa Guzman, gone. Really? He's a trophy. We're worried about the other 3,000 Sinaloa cartel members. Same thing in, with Afghanistan with the, the, the tribal people over there and the people around them over in Pakistan, over in those areas. How can we take all that information and not hold it into our little drawer saying, well, it's mine, it's mine. And I know one of the great points I wanted to make when you talk about data, I, I forget who asked the question in the afternoon about the technology, it's, it's, re it's really important. But when you talk about, again, you say the whole government approach, okay, what's that really mean? That everyone wants to talk about it together and say, we're gonna attack it with the whole government approach. But then when you actually ask for funding or you actually ask to use their, their influence with maybe the White House or DOJ or, or somebody, well, I don't know, my boss, you're gonna get a little pissed. I can, really can't go down that road. I mean, the whole government approach should be, okay, what's our goal? What do we wanna accomplish? And how are we gonna get there? And, and, and I'll argue uh, a lot of times we work with our intel, the, the end game should be a judicial end game. You know, you should be able to develop provisional arrest warrants in foreign countries to say, how can you pick somebody up? Or like I love the Colombian, uh, you know, or neutralize somebody, right? With that information. But when the US military who trains some very highly skilled uh, uh, host nation counterparts, if they have a provisional arrest warrant in their hand, that person can be arrested. That person can be extradited. That person can stand trial in the United States. That's really important when you're looking at disruption of entire organizations and changing the country. If you look at some of the transformation, and I'll go back to Afghanistan. I mean, I, again, we're not there anymore, but I know for a fact, and a lot of people in this room have been over there and saw the productivity of that unit. That should be used as a model in areas around there. I know uh, uh, Kazakhstan is something uh, we really want to focus on over there. I know some other areas that are, are friendly with the United States. And as DEA, you know, we do really well when it comes into putting in uh, bilateral uh, cooperative uh, projects to be able to utilize human sources and judicial intercepts, not just for Americans' interests, not just for DEA's interest or the U.S. Embassy's interest, the interest of, of the foreign country's national security. And when I said we have uh, you know, a lot of offices in many countries and, you know, it's tough, right? You got to speak your language. But one thing that I, I know that U.S. law enforcement authorities that I've worked with over the year do very good at, they learn how to drink the local liquor, their whiskey, tequila, or their food. They know about the families of the people they're working with. They hang out on weekends. They respond to them when they need something. There's a kidnapped uh, host nation person. We're jumping on it with our police units. You're hopefully trying to rescue that person. That gets you buy-in. So when an ambassador asks you for a little help, who do you call? You call those people that now trust you because you accepted their culture. You're helping their country. You're helping them get through things. Uh, so I, I think that's really important when you look at stuff from an academic standpoint or from an intelligence standpoint or from a policy standpoint that the people downrange really need the tools that they need. And, and, and sometimes they need them today. Uh, the general, I forget which one mentioned it today, and again, I'll probably get in trouble with this, right? Because you, you, know, you always want to be the person that's bitching and complaining. But when you talk about bureaucracy, when you need equipment, when you need funding, 
to change a threat to the, to the, to the United States, a national security threat, national public threat, national health threat, you know, getting that device and that equipment you need a year and a half from now, I mean, it really just because they one door and back, you just throw it in a lake in the back because the technology's already changed. Or you got munitions list problems. Or, 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 or that, or you just can't get it through or down to the, in that country for another agency disagreeing with it because only we can have that device. They're the hurdles that you got that you have to beat when you're in, when you're working in these countries to be able to establish going after what what these gentlemen all just talked about right now. How do you win? How do you get the information to uh, to share? That, that's the key. And, and and I've seen this I've seen this firsthand with Syncom, and I know it's a huge challenge. Uh, we talk a lot about the, uh, the, the DAOs. A lot of people mentioned those today. Uh, we've had a lot of exposure to them. And I go, this goes back to our initiative because of the information that uh, they're producing, the information that people are sharing with them and going after those DAOs. On those DAOs is methamphetamine and heroin. On those DAOs are Iranians and Pakistanis. Right? So from a law enforcement standpoint, and this is a stovepipe, and, I, and the Admiral probably heard you know, a bunch of guys from DA always complain about this before in the Caribbean and the Pacific. When a boat is stopped and they make a successful seizure and they get all that drugs on there, the most important thing on, on that boat for us is the pocket trash. You know, but when they start classifying things, you get into the whole issue that we have as law enforcement and intel. Once something's classified, we now can't use that for evidence. We got to figure out how we're going to recreate that or somehow get it back to law enforcement to get it back into our uh, intelligence units or our law enforcement units to use that as evidence. So that's always a big stovepipe that we've been talking about for, for decades because everyone's got different authorities, regulations, and policies. But the most important thing when you seize those on submarines and dows, go fast boats and planes, what's that satellite phone number? You know, what address do they have? What's the IMEI number on certain things? To get that in the hands of the right people, or even if you got to put it back in so we can get that cycled information back. It's, 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 all, about, it's all about intercepts, and it's all about supporting the host nation. And I, I'll throw this part in for, uh, you know, for DEA. And I meant you mentioned uh, China, you know, about uh, uh, the, the precursor chemicals. Then you mentioned how many people were killed, uh, Russian soldiers, right? 100,000, I think you said, were killed maybe over last year. Yeah, so if you think of the overdose deaths in the United States, over 107,000 overdose deaths just last year alone, that's not counting the slow death of, of drugs, the gangs, the destruction of neighborhoods and the violence that's happening every year. All those drugs are from precursor chemicals coming from China, coming through the Sintam uh, area, uh, the Sincom area over into Mexico and other areas to create drugs that they know are killing Americans. So you can ask your questions. Does China do this intentionally? Do they know it's killing hundred thousand Americans? Do they do it on purpose to damage our economy, damage our public health? You know, you know, just bring down uh, the, 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 with the violence in the United States. We see this nonstop coming out of China. And you see that relationship with Russia and China. All right. So there's, there, there is a huge thing to consider right there. We're looking at China not having to fire a shot into the United States, not having to hack in anything, not having to steal any intellectual property, and are killing over 100,000 people a year from their precursor chemicals. Not even from fentanyl, just precursor chemicals are sending throughout the world for production. And then when you go into Afghanistan and we're also looking for the other, uh, the other precursor chemicals, should Germany step up where, where they're sending their precursor chemicals to Afghanistan? How about India? We have leverage from the State Department, you know, from various ambassadors that you should put some think tanks together. Okay, how do you start twisting arms? You know, how do you start playing hardball? All right, sometimes, you know, we got to put the wiffle ball bat down and pick up the hardball bat and, and hit the ball. I mean, because these, these guys are playing for real and they don't care how many American people are getting killed. And it's pretty disturbing to me as a DA agent when you see this many people dying over on our side. And we have the ability, again, I, I, I truly believe our bread and butter uh, for law enforcement and for US military is our relationship host nationwide to attack that problem. Because when you have counter narcotics and terrorism, they're one and the same. They're not separate. Those terrorists are used in the, the drugs to fund their terrorist attacks their activities, their influence, and to take over other countries. And that's not an assumption, that's fact that we know from informant bases, uh, informant uh, human sources that we have, intercepts that we have, host nation cooperation. So, so from our standpoint from law enforcement is what can we do better, you know, with, with CINCOM? Right? What can we do better to offer things that the military can do that we can't do? What authorities do they have 
uh, that we can actually pass our information to them and it'll come back to us. If we can't arrest them, you know, can we use treasury? Because I can see Brian Capra there. We go back years. You know, taking their money hurts them more than taking our drugs. There's more drugs out there than what we know it can do with, but we can start seizing all their cash, all their cryptocurrency was a great point to make because we see all that cryptocurrency coming up and it moves all over the world. How do you freeze it? Then how do you seize it? Again, you go back to intelligence. It's great to know that they're using, uh, using cryptocurrency, all right? but how do you know it's illicit? How do you get the, the, uh, the order or a grand jury indictment to start seizing all that money? That hurts them. And I wanted to throw that in there too, because I think that's really important when you go back to the Al Capone theory is, okay, how are we going to get it? You know, as long as we can hurt them, let's hurt them. So that's just some of the comments I wanted to, to kind of start off with. So sorry to throw that law enforcement angle of it, but usually we're knuckle draggers. So we just like to throw it out on the table no, and see what happens. That's, that, that's exactly the intent is not to have, you know, that a, a panel of everybody from the same organization, <laughs> you get one view on it. Having those differences starts to bring out some, where do we have some overlap that we can, <laughs> we can tease out? Or where do we have differences that we may need to close the gap on or not? Oh, Ambassador, I think you had a, a, a point you wanted to make. So both uh, <clears throat> Dr. Schroden and, and Matt raised some points that I wanted to amplify. <clears throat> so to kind of boil this down very simplistically, the Al-Qaeda leadership, Ayman Zawahiri, who was struck and killed in Afghanistan by this administration, was staying at a Taliban safe house, at a Haqqani safe house. But the safe house of the individual who's responsible for internal security for the Taliban. So there is a clear and has been from day one, a clear nexus between the Taliban and Al Qaeda. After 9-11, when Secretary Rumsfeld asked me to take over the senior civilian job of special operations, low intensity conflict, uh, which had the counter, has the counter narcotics mission embedded within it. Uh, I can tell you, I've been to this rodeo with the Taliban on declaring freezes on poppy production. They do it when their warehouses are bursting at the seams to maintain price. We also saw in the run up to the situation in Afghanistan and our withdrawal, that the Taliban had actually started to completely integrate and control the entire production process. It used to be in the past, they would beat the, they would score the poppies to get the, you know, to get the um, residue, scrape that off, process it with some basic chemicals, but a lot of the refinement into heroin was done in Pakistan. The Taliban had begun to pull all of that and integrate it vertically and horizontally inside Afghanistan. And I would presume, don't know, but would presume, good question for your J2, that they now have basically cemented end-to-end -end control of the process. When we came in after the Obama administration, we were dealing with an ISIS that was controlling a territory the size of Indiana and had an annual revenue of about $2 billion, mostly oil, extortion, some other things, okay? But with that $2 billion, ISIS spread around the world and began conducting attacks against not only the United States and our interests, but many, many others. When we left Afghanistan and allowed creation of an emirate the size of the state of Texas, the Taliban had from heroin production alone, 1.6 billion alone. That doesn't include the other revenue streams they had, illicit copper, so on and so forth. So when you hear our intelligence community and you hear folks from Central Command warn about the existential threat of terrorism coming to our shores again, because they are plotting and they do intend to hit us, they have not stopped, they've never lost that ambition, recognize that they have ample revenue to conduct those attacks. So this is something that we do have to get at. As Matt said, the nexus between terrorism and narcotics trafficking is clear. Another great nexus that we could talk about if people are interested in is Hezbollah and the Iranians getting into the Captagon trade as they inherited a large number of pharmaceutical related facilities <clears throat> in Syria and immediately turned to production of these pills, which they're spreading around the region, particularly into Iraq, Saudi Arabia, you name it. So that's yet another uh, problem that <clears throat> the command faces. But I just wanted to put those two additional thought streams on the table. No, thank you very much, Ambassador. And thank you uh, to the panel for your, your opening comments, giving us a lot to think about. And while we're taking a moment, please, as you have questions, line up behind the microphone or signal online, and we'll get to you as well.
We have a couple online already. Look at that. People are not only passively sitting, you know, when you turn the camera off and you're like, I'm in the VTC, but I'm not really here because I'm doing something else. <laughs> They're actually here and involved, which is refreshing. So go with, uh, go with our first, uh, first comment. We'll go our first question, rather. Okay, so Kathleen wants to ask a question regarding the Wagner Group. On the African continent, they trade security assistance in quotation, I'm sorry, security assistance forces, training and influence operations for mining, mineral and rare wood extraction concessions. Have there been any indications that Wagner's engaged at all in the drugs trade either in Africa or elsewhere? Okay, uh, great question. So uh, we'll start in reverse order this time since you're at the bat last. Mr. Donner, how about you? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't have any information exactly on that, uh, but we are really focusing heavy on Africa. That's one uh, uh, kind of really, we have 10 offices there uh, as DEA. We have a couple sets of investigative units there, building them up. Uh, we do see uh, a lot of uh, Chinese influence over there, uh, trying to utilize uh, technical uh, gifts to countries uh, to put their networks over there. So it's really concerning for us over there, but we are putting a lot more focus on Africa. A lot of drugs moving over through that way because uh, of corruption, a lot of destabilizing uh, terrorist groups over there as well, using the drugs. Uh, but we are seeing that being the, probably the next hub for, of transit zones uh, for drugs to terrorist organizations and going up into Europe from there. Hey, thanks. Dr. Shorten, anything on, on your research that uh, that uh, you've seen? I would just say briefly that where Wagner goes, instability follows. And so- I like I that bumper sticker. We might, need, we might need to take that. Where Wagner goes, instability follows. Yeah, that could be their corporate tagline. Could be their corporate tagline, yeah. Um, so while I can't offer any you know hard evidence of, of them being involved in the narcotics trade, particularly, you know, when narcotics smuggling thrives in areas of instability. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a reasonable, prognostication to say one should pay attention to areas that Wagner are in when it comes to this particular problem set. Even if it is or it, even if it is or is not the organization. Correct. The conditions uh, yeah. that they set create the ability for that to Instability flourish. Instability falls yeah. there. Yes. Yeah. Ambassador? No, I completely agree. And Kathleen, I think your your comment is exactly right. We've seen, and I've I've been during the Trump administration, spent a lot of time in Sudan. Um, but the DRC is another area. I mentioned the Central African Republic as well, where they do trade security, uh, the provisioning of security, the training of internal security in exchange for these concessions. I never saw Wagner directly involved in the drug trade, but they do fundamentally thrive where the breakdown of the rule of law occurs, uh, as, as the doctor has said. But one other thought here, which is that the character and composition of Wagner is changing. And they've moved from basically a, a mercenary force to a force populated with criminals out of the Russian prison system. So the Wagner of yesteryear is probably not going to be the Wagner uh, going forward. They may be much more criminally inclined. But that's a great question. Yeah, yeah it absolutely is. I, I, anything I, else to add? Well, a, a less criminal and less professional Wagner is a, is a great optic, but uh, it, it is... Um, uh, we work very closely with AFRICOM, you know, to make sure that there isn't a seam, you know, in the Red Sea or in Djibouti or, or any of these trades routes. And, you know, we mentioned the, our NIFSI earlier, you know, and, and so that, that's a great bridging solution, you know, not just across interagencies, but, you know, cross combatant commands. And uh, I, I don't, I don't know specifically, you know, I will agree that Wagner, you know, tries to get concessions, makes money and, and it wouldn't surprise me to, to hear that they're making money off drugs, but I don't know the specific answer to that. No, but I think definitely something to something to watch. If other uh, organizations like that are any indicators, right, in terms of that tie between extremism, uh, extortion, and the whole swath of criminality, uh, kind of following along the, the Al Capone model, right, of what, what else can we get involved with that, that generates revenue? Definitely something to keep an eye on. The other piece, you didn't ask this question, but I think it's it's worth mentioning is the close, close ties between Africa and the central region, right? We tend to look at regions very geographically, which is helpful sometimes. 
Sometimes it's not. You got to look at the map a little bit differently or look at drawing the lines a little bit differently. Look at the difference between moving Israel into the CENTCOM AOR, vice having in, uh, under, under European command in terms of a change in looking at a problem set. So that was that was great. And now we have a live in-studio audience. Question. But I don't know to the extent I'm alive. It's post-lunch. Um, oh, that discussion was very interesting. However, I'd like to try to focus back in on the actual panel research question. And that is, with everything you all said, what is unique about Russia's invasion of Ukraine that has impacted transnational crime, organized crime, drug trafficking, as it pertains to CENTCOM? Uh, other than the Wagner discussion and Wagner's, you know, uh, these sorts of activities do follow instability. But what has that invasion, Russia's invasion in Ukraine done to change what it is we as practitioners or policymakers uh, should be concerned about in the CENTCOM AOR? I didn't really hear that addressed specifically. So if you would, thank you. Yeah, great question. So we'll start with you in reverse uh, order. Sure. So. Yeah, I, yeah I, I briefly touched on it um, in the, the the Ukrainian invasion, you know, has affected a few things. One, it, it's allowed Iran, you know, to, to find a, a like-minded partner. They're both under sanctions. You know, we talked about it a little bit uh, about how they're, they're trying to collaborate on how they beat sanctions. And, and they are um, exporting weapons you know, to the Russians. So, so in the, the, the macro sense, there's a lot, a lot that could change here. Um, and in how that affects Maybe the uh, you know the Levant region remains to be seen, but I will tell you you know the Iraqis are desperate to try to get after the Captagon uh, problem that's going on, and uh, and that goes right around through Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Lebanon uh, is you know bordering on a failed state, and so uh, where Iran spreads influence, where Russia is uh, is creating those those you know desperate conditions, you know a stronger Iran in Syria. Uh, means that Russia is trying to exercise their authorities, and all of that then allows the Assad regime some latitude, you know, to create some real problems. And and one of those is is that we talked about the Chinese precursors that are coming in uh, to these pharmaceutical plants in Syria that are are producing Captagon that's going, you know, straight to Europe. Uh, the other place where where I did mention that I think is um, is in the Central Asian states. And so we talked about the, the, the meth, uh, the heroin and, uh, and opium, and even the, um, the, the hashish that comes out of that area. The, um, the Russians don't like that either. It causes a lot of problems in Russia uh, as it comes through those Central Asian states. As Russia has pulled um, some of their more professional and capable forces to the front lines in Ukraine, what that leaves behind in those Central Asian states to, to partner with some of those Central Asian nations uh, may be the opposite of what we want. And so when you talk about the susceptibility to uh, poorly paid, poorly trained uh, soldiers who are on a very porous border with little ISR and little oversight, um, the, the potential for corruption starts to grow. So not only do you have less ability to, to, to play you know, zone defense, uh, you never can play man to man, you're covering bigger zones. Now, some of the people in the zones are willing to make some money to look the other way. So, so I think, you know, we've probably uh, could get to a perfect storm, you know, if we see a lot of production coming out, and we, we are, you know, of, of Afghanistan, and then problems in the Central Asian states, which, which is, um, you know, I talked about the opportunity for us to partner, there's, there's also a little bit of an imperative for us to partner there to help them with their border security problem because um, where the drugs go and create money for terrorists who then can use that money for transportation and, and, and uh, you know, the, the means to, to move, you've got a porous border. So that, that Central Asian uh, states, uh, we've created now an additional drug problem and we've uh, created additional terrorism potential problem uh, if we can't have better border security there, which is an emphasis of what we're trying to work on. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador? I, I think <clears throat> to very specifically answer the homework assignment, I think it would be the fact that 
the sanctions we've imposed on the Russians as a result of their invasion. For instance, there's a prohibition on any U.S. person furnishing physical banknotes into Russia. We've also put all these sanctions out on various individuals. Um, one of the net effects of that made, was that it made it very hard actually for Russian embassies to pay their staff. And the cumulative effect of these restrictions has been a hard pivot into cryptocurrencies by the Russian population and by the Russian services. In and of itself, that doesn't touch directly into the drug trade, but when you consider that Russia is now actively setting up shop and working with the Venezuelans to do Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin transactions, and you have the Iranians and Hezbollah that have also set up shop in Venezuela, um, that cumulative snowballing effect is that we're going to see, there already was a lot of use of crypto in the drug business, but we're going to now see a further explosion in the types of crypto assets being used and the methodology and the tradecraft being shared between terrorist groups, narcotic groups, I mean, the Maduro regime's a narco-terrorist hybrid, and then the Russians and the Iranians together. Thank you. Dr. Shrun, anything? Uh, just, I mean, specific to Afghanistan, since that's what I touched on, the, I, I think I mentioned, right, the distraction uh, that Rus the Russia-Ukraine war just poses in terms of diplomatic efforts and just general international attention to the counter-narcotics issue. So that's sort of one impact. I think there is, specific to Afghanistan, another impact, which is the impact on global generosity, right? I mean, part of what's driving the, the production of poppy, the expansion of poppy in Afghanistan is the, is the absolutely dire economic situation that exists in that country. They have huge humanitarian needs. I mean, billions upon billions of dollars worth of donations uh, is what the UN has asked for, and four, four to five billion dollars. They're not getting that much, uh, in part, I think, because there is this other massive humanitarian situation taking place in Ukraine that people also want to donate money and attention, et cetera. So there is a distractive effect, both in terms of diplomatic and attention and also in terms of generosity and aid. Um, specific to CENTCOM, if I get off right, I think there, there, it may pose some opportunities, right? If you think about the you know, great power competition as existing on the, the, conf, the, the, right, the competition's uh, continuum as the joint staff talks about it, cooperation to competition to conflict. There are, this is an, this is an issue, counter narcotics is an issue that is shared by many, many countries to include a number that we would point to and, and, and you know, say we have an adversarial relationship with them. I mean, Iran has a huge issue with narcotics coming from Afghanistan. So does Russia, right? So do basically all of Afghanistan's neighbors. Um, so that creates a couple of opportunities. One is, Right now that CENTCOM is not so actively, you know, focused on fighting wars overseas, right, has perhaps attention to uh, put on other things, you know, could CENTCOM increase its focus on this particular issue set as a means of building partnership across the region, right, in a cooperative sense, cooperative, uh, you know, sense with an eye towards competitive results, right, so there may be an opportunity here for CENTCOM in that regard. Um, another I would just say is there is also the possibility of using counter narcotics as a de-escalating lever in certain situations diplomatically, right? I mean, yes, we're putting a lot of pressure on Russia these days. It may or may not behoove us at some point to, to talk to them, you know, friendly, cooperatively about things like counter narcotics, but it's something that, right, it's a tool in the toolkit. Uh, it's something on which it's, you know, it's worth recognizing we have common cause with many, many countries to include virtually all of the ones in the CENTCOM AOR. And that was a, you know, a great question from the DEA standpoint from the, the, the intelligence that we have now, it's changing the routes of how the drugs are moving in the area, right? They're gonna start using the Black Sea more. Uh, we see more going through the, the Greek islands, uh, which is gonna be concerning, but we have a good relationship uh, you know, with the Greek islands over there. So we'll have some success there. Uh, another thing that we saw from uh, our human source bases over there is our remittances coming out of Russia all going down because the economy is going down. So all the surrounding countries are, are poorer now. So they don't have the money coming out of Russia back into there. So we see that a lot with people being in despair that might start turning to the drug trade, uh, which is concerning for us right now because prior to the war, uh, we actually had a pretty good relationship with narcotics uh, officers in Russia always asking us to get much back, but we're always giving information on the cocaine, which most of our cocaine in Russia comes from Ecuador. So they're tasking our Ecuadorian office where we have an SIU there, Intercept Project, 
try and see how much more cocaine that we're going to start seeing going over Russia and to see maybe when we're allowed, if we can pass information back to our counterparts in Russia to get that exact thing, get those favors back uh, when we can get to that point. But we're definitely thinking that there's going to be a, a, an increase of cocaine coming out of Ecuador, going over into Russia so they can start supplementing their salaries and start doing that, which again is another, another concerning trend. Thanks. So I think um, at least what I'm hearing is the key thread through that is it's not necessarily Russia invades Ukraine and therefore drugs are in spot B, but it's the second and third order ties from that, like troops coming off of a border, like money's not going into uh, investments, like um, issues with uh, the crypt cryptocurrency and the ties with narco terrorists. It's just all of those things that start to have almost a snowball effect on all of this that the epicenter really is the central region. When you look at the production of drugs coming out of mm -hmm. Afghanistan, you look at the precursor drugs coming through and you look at those traditional trade routes coming through that we really have to pay attention to. We, did we have another online question? Oh, we have several. Okay, well, we'll go one and then we'll go back live, so. So Basir would like to ask, was the recent collapse in crypto and NFTs shorting of the market by Chinese and or Russian Entities. I don't know if anybody has any insights into that outside not, of the scope of drugs. Not to my knowledge, but we got some crypto experts in the audience, so I'd defer to them if they want to comment. We spoke about it earlier, but I don't think it it, it was at all. Well, uh, that it was just really just mismanaged, uh, uh, intentional running and stealing people's money. Uh, so we we didn't see any outside influence, you know, from from China or anybody else. This was just, you know, one of these, what do you want to call it, Posse scheme, whatever. And the guy was able to pull the wool over people's eyes and destroyed uh, a lot of other companies and uh, and people's investments. Uh, I think one thing it's going to do is actually going to put a little focus on cryptocurrency uh, with the regulations, and people going to be a little more careful with it. But according to the people I work with, the crypto, I mean, it's not going away. Uh, it's just that people are going to be more careful with it. But we didn't tie, we didn't see any ties at all to being undermined by foreign a foreign country. Great, thanks, thanks for the question, sir. Yes, it's good to hear all the different perspectives from the different agencies and and Admiral Renshaw. It's good to see another Hoosier in the room. Um, being the only ag guy in this room, uh, I I hear a lot of downstream wow. impacts and effects and solutions to international drug trade. Why not nip it in the bud? literally and, and figuratively, and although it may not be uh, conceivable at this point in Afghanistan itself, uh, maybe providing agricultural advisors uh, to Afghanistan to consult them on higher value or at least equal value legal crops. Um, maybe it's training uh, uh, Uzbek sheep herders, cattle herders up on the plains, giving them a sat phone, providing QRF forces or training uh, when they call in and say, hey, we're seeing somebody walk through, um, it, doing something like that. And there are endless other solutions, but what, what might you see leveraging agricultural knowledge and, and training as effects of, of providing solutions for the DEA or Right. Setcom or wh whoever. No, thanks. I think that's a it's a great question, and I do know it's something that has not not been tried before in terms of finding high yield crops or high profit crops to substitute in Afghanistan. Uh -huh. But I want to expand the question just a little bit, not just the, the agriculture, although I think that that's vitally important. But what are some other sort of offsets that we could use at, in an away game, right? Instead of waiting for things to come to the states. How can we play that forward? We have a presence in the CENTCOM region with the military. We have DEA offices. We have other interagency presence. We have embassies everywhere. What are your gentlemen's thoughts on what we can do forward? Um, to get to that gentleman's question, nip it in the bud. Is that even possible to, to do? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, if you have uh, stability and rule of law, uh, you probably have a, a fighting chance. and. Um, and, and that's the challenge in a region that does not often have stability and rule of law, at least not homogeneously uh, across the region. So, so it's it's a bit of a um, a, a game of you know dominoes. If you, if you can get that stability in one area, and you can get control, and we talked a little bit you know about 
ISIS. And, um, and so where uh, ISIS is less prevalent in Syria um, is probably uh, a better place to live or Iraq than it was you know, five or 10 years ago. And, um, and then if we work, you know, the US military's job is not to go in and, and teach those things. But if we have, if we, if the US military can help with stability, transportation, security, uh, then uh, NGOs, other government agencies, et cetera, can come in and do those sort of partnership things that build, you know, a, a legitimate economy and a legitimate education system. And, and, you know, going back to Afghanistan, we spent billions trying to uh, eradicate crops and, and training and, and replacing, but you know it's it's places there where people live in the first century AD, uh, mm-hmm. and that, that's a hard hard you know challenge. And, and it's the second that we lose you know uh, stability or that that rule of law and now have a, a government mm-hmm. you know that's there that's not doing those things, um, you know it's easy to revert back. So if the if the local uh, economy is based on smuggling and drug trade, um, and there's there's no real alternative. Then then it's hard to get after it. It's it's you know piracy is sort of another one of those things that stems from you know a lawless society where there's there's no viable economic alternative. You know the, the, you just turn to what what you know can make some money and you're, you're willing to take risks. So that that's that's where I think the partnerships are really important. You know we got to partner with the governments there. Uh, to, to help them get after the problem and then really partner with uh, NGOs, interagencies, you know, to, to do what we do best to enable them to, to build, you know, something in the future. Ambassador. So very specifically on the ag question, from, from my personal experience, we, that's what we were trying to do in Afghanistan. Our issue wasn't crop substitution per se, it was that there, there isn't the infrastructure necessary to move product to market. And, but the people who do have the capacity to move the stuff are the, are the drug, are the narcos who operate massive armed convoys. They get into shooting mass, matches with the Iranian border guards and tear them up. Uh, they do the same to the Russians. So I think the doctor's point on potential collaborative options is very well taken. But unless you have the road network to really allow the farmers to move things to market and given the price that's being offered, they have every reason to not go down that path. In terms of your broader question, as I've sort of suggested, both in my remarks and here at the table, um, you know, under General McKenzie, we had a treasury liaison officer here at CENTCOM um, and, and a strong interagency group. Treasury has since pulled back and they've, they've pulled all of the, of the LNOs out of all of the combatant commands which uh, I think is, was a terrible decision by this administration, but it's one they made. And I think that if you're going to get at a lot of these problems and interagency solutions, since you're not gonna be able to put lead on target for a lot of these problems, you're gonna need other people's authorities. Um, having an interagency group that works directly either for the CAG or for the commander himself, um, that can bring those authorities to the table that includes DEA, that includes treasury, that includes commerce, I think is, is uh, is going to be in the command's interest. Yeah, I, I mean, I would just say it, it is an incredibly difficult situation in Afghanistan. I mean, I, to, right, they, they've commented already about agricultural substitution. We tried that a lot over the last 20 years. Cotton, soybeans, wheat, uh, you know, pomegranates, I mean, all sorts of different quinoa at some point. Um, the, the challenge you have, right, is you got to put yourself in the shoes of the Af- average Afghan farmer who is planting these things, right? You need seeds, okay, that costs money. You need water, mm-hmm. that costs money. Uh, once you got your crop, you got to get it somewhere you can sell it, that costs money. Um, and every year, you're right, I mean, farmers, I, my, my whole family were farmers, right? It's that whole idea of you take your entire life savings and you put it in the ground every single year. It's a gamble, the whole future of your family. All right, so that's the situation these farmers are in. Um, and you're asking them a lot to take that gamble and plant something that they don't know, that they don't trust, that they don't have an economic supply chain to, to deal with on the back end. Um, and oh, by the way, right, this, the conditions that drive farmers to poppy in Afghanistan are actually getting worse, right? The economy is getting worse. There's less money around. There's been a, a two year long drought in Afghanistan, climate change is hitting that country harder than a lot of people realize. So all of the conditions that drive farmers towards the plantation of poppy 
are getting worse over time. So, I mean, it's an excellent idea uh, and, I, and I hate to poo poo it, but it's just, you know, you put yourself in that average farmer's shoes. It's a tall order to ask them to do anything different. Yeah, I mean, I, I just going to say the exact same thing that Ambassador said, doctor said, uh, I've been through that before, uh, crop substitution, you know, without the road infrastructure and getting, a, getting the crops to market, you know, it's going to be difficult to work. And then we are successful. Uh, the Taliban just comes right back in and says, you know, you're not growing any more cotton. You're going to be growing opium or, or, or you're dead. So I mean, until you have rural law established, too, that wouldn't work either, either as well. Yeah, thanks. So it reminds me, too, of something. Uh, one second. It reminds me, too, of something with uh, that, that uh, paraphrase of Machiavelli. There are others with vested interests who don't want to see you succeed. Um, even if we came up with a great crop substitution, it's something that that came out of the the mentions of the Taliban coming back in. You're, you're not only fighting against convincing the people to grow, you're convincing against the people who are losing mm. in that uh, in that effort as well. So, just a quick follow up. I, you know, cotton sucks a lot of water. No. Takes <laughs> Afghanistan doesn't have water. Mm. Um, having the proper agricultural mindset, the proper agricultural advisor. You know, uh, uh, farmers in Afghanistan back when we were there were making about 750 an acre growing poppies. Uh, USAID or whoever was coming in, say, grow corn, grow cotton, they're making 60 bucks an acre. You don't have to be a, a rocket yeah. scientist to figure out other substitute crops like saffron, on the other hand, is comparable to poppy, and poppy production and doesn't require a lot of water. It is very much the same sort of uh, agricultural system that poppy production is. So it's just dealing with the farmers there and, and, and trying to find a good crop substitute, not what they grow in Indiana or in Louisiana or somewhere like that. It, it no, it it's a fair point not to, not to mirror image what it is we're doing. Um, and happy to talk more of that. Uh, offline with the saffron. I think we tried that too. Uh, back to online and then back to you, sir. Okay, uh, this is specifically for Admiral Renshaw. How has our withdrawal from Afghanistan impacted our counter narcotic programs and funding in the region? Yeah, I, I don't know that uh, you, know, you could tie counter narcotics funding directly to, you know, withdrawal from Afghanistan. You know, I, I think we are, um, it, that we talk about 100 and 7,000 overdoses in the United States. And so the, the counter narcotic funding is going up, but it's being spread more and more thinly across, across the globe. So um, I, I think that the challenge for us is, um, you know, from a funding perspective is there's, there's just never enough. And so, you know, that's exactly why if we can partner with people who have more specific funds or authorities uh, when we can use innovation to replace, you know, where, where you would have had like a P-8 maritime patrol aircraft, you can put up, you know, some large number of very long range, persistent, low cost UAVs that don't have to be all that, you know, high tech to carry some payloads, um, th then you can buy back, you know, some of that, you can use artificial intelligence. Um, so so the, the funding uh, specifically, is uh, it, it's never going to be enough. So it, it does challenge us to use partners and then innovation, you know, to get after those things. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the challenge of Afghanistan, we talked about it, you know, we spent a lot of money specifically in Afghanistan. Um, and, and now we're spending money on the periphery of Afghanistan. Um, but if we're not getting the most out of each of those dollars, we're probably, you know, going, going to just be pushing uphill on this boulder. Yeah, thanks, sir. Good afternoon, Mark Wagerzewski, Joint Special Operations University. Uh, great discussion showing the connections between states like Russia, Iran, China, Afghanistan, in regards to drug trafficking and organized crime. Um, my question is, you know, we, we showed, you guys really spoke about how it you know, puts them all together is they're in the anti-US camp, really. And my question is why, so they've been around for hundreds and thousands of years, these states, uh, they have a lot more dissimilarities than they, than they do similarities with each other. Uh, so to break up this drug trafficking, drug trafficking, to break up the organized crime, uh, what are your thoughts on 
playing up the dissimilarities between these states. Thanks. Uh, Ambassador, we'll start with you since you had the last <laughs> question, sir. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And I think we, we touched on it. Um, you know, Moscow is a destination for heroin coming out of Afghanistan. Um, so is Tehran. And so those are um, situations where there, there is, and in fact, there has been the ability to keep a certain level of discussion going, maybe not so much with the Iranians, but certainly with the Russians, even in some of the worst of times. Um, but I do, I do think <clears throat> that gets to your information operations background. I mean, I think a lot of that is making sure we highlight um, some, of the, some of the reasons why these regimes really don't have great reason to trust one another. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in the negotiations with the Russians, uh, one of the things I gave them during the course of the negotiations was what we, what we told them was a classified briefing, it, it, it was, on China's nuclear buildup. Because we know the Russians size part of their nuclear forces based on what they think the Chinese are doing. There's not just one big happy alliance here, right? And one of the things we gave them was a map that showed all of the different parts of Russia that China believes were unfairly ceded in various unequal treaties over the course of many, many years that go all the way out up to and including Vladivostok, right? So, um, you know, the, the Russians uh, are on the fast track to becoming a servile vassal state to the Chinese if they're not careful here. And with that comes potential loss of territory. And so these kinds of, of messages, I think we need to be amplifying. And this is something that CENTCOM through, through its web ops platform, SOCOM through its, through its authorities and others need to be getting truthful messaging out there regarding areas where there are disagreement. I mean, I, if, if, you have, if you don't have something, that's fine too. I, so I would just quickly say, I think the biggest dissimilarity across the CENCOM AOR is the degree to which various states are work, willing to work with the United States. And so playing up on those differences, I, I mean, I would start there, right? Map, map, who do you think has the largest stakes in this issue set and are also willing to work with us? That, right? Design thinking, that's the, those are the low hanging fruit aspects. Start there, you know, build your networks. Uh, in that part of the quadrant and then move to the harder target sets from there. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, it's a good question. And, and for a DA standpoint, uh, with Russia and Pakistan and Turkey before the invasion, we actually worked pretty well with them. And it was really big for uh, the ambassador and DCM and State Department when there was actually a highlight or a bright spot in your relationship with those types of countries. And I'll use China, uh, for an example. We actually have... Uh, uh, a good relationship with the MPS. You know, we were traveling over there, they invited us in because their interest was the cocaine that was coming from South America over there and they needed our information that they couldn't get. So we were able to at least share that with them and get some kind of cooperation with them and try to build on that uh, with the Chinese. So, I mean, those, those four examples right there, you know, we don't always just look at everything as a negative. Is there an in somewhere that could help DEA and could help other uh, embassy personnel or units be able to get uh, some help as well from these countries. So you got to think of the, the entirety of the, the embassy staff on, on what you can do to make things productive. Yeah, yeah you know, I would, I would focus on the, the two aspects of that, you know, on the, on the positive side, um, we, we do have to resist the, the tendency we often have to either impart our own values and view of the world onto, onto partners uh, or to homogenize you know, the regional partners, they all do have a, a little bit different uh, willingness to work with us. They view the problem a little bit differently and in a different context. So from that end, it does require us to have a very good understanding of, of, of where we have those that common ground and bring them together. You know, CMF is a good example of, you know, the authorities and the willingness or the, the resources that different countries bring is very, very different. But, but they all do share, you know, at least some goal to, to stop some sort of smuggling or trafficking. Um, and then the other part of that is, you know, the, the, the countries, when we talk about like some sort of Iranian Russian nexus or, you know, how Syria uh, government works with them, it, it's not based on like a shared set of values. They, they don't, you know, their, their shared set of values is to counter Western democracy and, and rule of law and governance in places to keep them unstable and isolated and individually weaker, you know, so that they can then reap the benefits uh, individually. So the ability to, 
to, you know, so there's a lot of places where you can try to drive wedges in them and, and none of these alliances, you know, they're not going to be long term. Uh, but I think that is a, a, a point where we can continue to work very, very carefully, you know, to, to chip away at some of that, that uh, those lack of shared values. And, and just a caution, not, not as a uh, indictment on, on your question at all, but a, a caution in terms of the miracle thinking, right? Today is the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. You may believe that's a miracle. You may have watched Franco Harris's Immaculate Reception. If you shouldn't, you should see it on YouTube because it's a great, uh, great football play, right? But information is not magical either. It's not just, let's just tell these two people something and then they'll, you know, they'll, they'll separate. It requires deliberate thought and approach, which also takes resources and people and planning and assessing. And it has to be very deliberate as well as you as you approach that and think about all of the second and third order effects of it in terms of what are the embassies trying to get after what State Department. Try. So I'm not suggesting don't do it. It's just not simple and it ought to be delivered in an approach. But I think it is something that's worth worth considering. Absolutely. Great question. We have something else queued up online. We do. Fantastic. Uh, regarding uh, Ambassador Billingsley's comments about the need to expand military skill sets into international business, complex finance, private equity, et cetera. The question is where within DOD would the educational requirements lie? Is it with the services? Is it PROCOM dependent? Is it a soft skill set? Um, that's a great question. So I, I want to be clear. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that uh, the Department of Defense or Central Command uh, try to reflag itself as Treasury or, or the Institute for International Finance or, or any of those outfits. Partnering with those skill sets in the interagency um, has proven in the past, as I mentioned, in the counter- ISIS finance group and in the, in the Afghan threat finance cell has proven to be highly effective. One area where those skill sets, however, are very much resonant and can be, in my personal view, better tapped is with the civil affairs capabilities that the United States Army has. Because the vast majority of our civil affairs special operators are reservists. And their daily lives, uh, they may be architects, engineers, businessmen, high finance, you name it. But you will find a very eclectic group of people uh, in that part of, of the community. And, uh, and, you know, the guys you just need to go knock on the door and ask for some help are right down the, right down the road at, at U.S. SOCOM. That's true. Uh, yeah, just, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick two finger on that. I mean, there, one thing, so my team at CNA a few years ago, we did a study that looked at cryptocurrency. This was not long after sort of cryptocurrency really emerged and people became aware of Bitcoin, et cetera. Um, and its implications for special operations uh, forces, right? And what we discovered very quickly is that almost no one in the Department of Defense at that time, this was about four years ago, knew anything about cryptocurrency. I mean, like nothing. There was no, no pockets of expertise other than like three or four people that we were able to meet. So we took a step back and one of the things we created was a primer for national decision makers on cryptocurrency. Um, so there are those types of documents that exist um, that people could turn to and just self-educate, right? Um, not to a high level, but enough to expose yourself to the concept that you're smart enough to at least understand and be able to engage in conversations with other parts of the government, like Treasury, who actually has people who know a lot about it, um, who, who are vastly smarter, right? So to be able to at least have a conversation with the parts of the government that have that understanding to be able to plug into them. Thanks. No? Okay. Sir? Tom Mortensen, uh, you briefly, the panel briefly touched on second and third order effects. So I have a comment and then I'm going to ask a question. The comment is that as long as the Russian invasion of the Ukraine continues and the hardships continue there, you're going to find the IOs and the NGOs leaving their resources towards that effort and countering the dependent, uh, the displaced person issues in Syria and other places. So I think that's a, a concern of us uh, that as that operation continues in Ukraine for Russia, it's drawing those resources that would normally help not only in the immediate effect of working with some of these situations, but the second and third order effects dealing with rehabilitation of drug 
uh, users, et cetera, that, that these countries face. The question I have for the panel, however, is what authorities and resources do you think we need to really effectively combat this mission? That's the question. Thanks, good question. Well, I'm not, uh, we'll start, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if it's so much, I think the authorities are there. I think it's the, the host nation cooperation you know, and the will of these countries. So I think, you know, with, with uh, DEA, Total 21 authorities to be able to invest drug trafficking, money laundering, then you have the authorities of the military, uh, FBI, you have the corruption authorities that they have. So I think the authorities are there. A lot of it comes back down to budget, uh, having the tools uh, that you need, having the personnel that you need, and you need, you need that third country cooperation. Uh, like for us to win some places, we're just not welcome. Uh, some places we are, but they got to be trained. Uh, and then when you have co a cooperation within uh, the embassy community, you have to train the right people. Uh, one of the things I know uh, dealing with some of the embassies DEA works with is the military does a great job training people. But we got to make sure it's, they're training the right people for the long term goal. So if you're going to train uh, their military, their police, make sure it's the military and police that work with other U U.S. entities that are doing investigations and have authorities to attack that drug problem, money laundering problem, gang problem, whatever situation is. So being collectively working together, that's why you have country team meetings uh, every week with the ambassador, is to be able to pick the right people to be trained, where you're going to put your resources. Uh, everyone's got to do more with less. So can we work with somebody that can do something that we can? So I think really comes into communication internally with U.S. entities, you know, and then having the budget and then being smart with the host nation on, on targeting uh, the right people. I, I, would, I would add that I, I do think, you know, the, if, if we work together and have that interagency approach, we probably have the, the right U.S. authorities. And then, um, and then, as mentioned, you know, understanding the, the differences between the regional countries, you know, Uzbekistan is way different than Tajikistan. And they're they're right there. Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan don't even like each other, you know. So so you've got to you've got to kind of understand that. Um, when it comes to resources, you know, I, I think sometimes that's a it's a bit of a loaded question because if you if you, you told me to go solve the drug problem in the Middle East, you know, I could eat up about two thirds of the DoD budget, and and I'd probably get, get make it make do some damage. But uh, you know, somebody's giving up somewhere something somewhere else. So. Um, you know, I, I talk actually quite frequently to the, the DASD uh, who oversees the, the counter drug, counter narcotics resources and make my case, you know, and, and every, every win that I get means that Southcom didn't get something. You know, it's not like he can go back. He's not able to go back to Congress and get some more money because of the case I made. He's, he's trying to, to dole that out evenly. So I, I think from a resource, you know, I, I, I'm kind of saying it over and over again, you know, how we use those resources you know, from, uh, you know, with partnerships and innovation is probably um, in, in, in that interagency and the other countries is, is maybe more important. And you're exactly right, you know, along those lines, those NGO, those aid organization resources that are sucked into Ukraine, we, we do see that, you know, th there is now, um, you know, trying to shine a light on Northeast Syria to make sure that, that people still remember the, the challenges we have there. So, so a very, very good point, you know, up front, uh, because it, it's something we are feeling. And one last statement, Do, is there cross-fertilization of lessons learned from, let's say, Southcom to our other co-cops in drug trafficking? Because obviously they've been the major battlefield for years. How transferable is information like that? And maybe within, the the civilian to... within the civilian agencies, highly, mm -hmm. because of the way we were organized. Um, and, and both DEA and Treasury are very small. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very tight-knit group of people with a lot of historical experience that does get transferred. Uh, I just wanted to offer, <clears throat> but not, not so much with the military commands, in my experience. Mm -hmm. um, I've, you know, having worked very closely with both of these outfits, I'll tell you, you know, DEA conducts a thousand operations that they never planned for a year, and DOD plans for a thousand operations they never conduct <laughs> in a given year. And so getting that planning, that network analysis capability, DOD has the ability to do things which Treasury and DEA, I just say, can't, which is to go through that nodal analysis, that network analysis, and to consider the second and third order effects, and then say, okay, who's got the right authority to achieve that effect? Are we just going to get him in his car with, with a switchblade? 
or are we going to scare him to death with a drop by from law enforcement? Or is his bank account going to suddenly seize up and he doesn't understand why there's a hold on, on all his money. But it's only really, I think, if you can have a combatant command, bring that interagency together and get them working together to use those planning skills that DOD and only DOD has, where I think you, you really begin to, to get that goodness in the fight. I would submit that uh, if you look at how we deal with disasters in this country for the interagency, with ESF functions, emergency support functions for different agencies, it may be a good building block to build that type of relationship. And I'll yield to the floor to other speakers. No, thank you, thank you very much, sir. Anything up queued up online? Yeah, for uh, Dr. Schroden, can you please expand on how you believe the U.S. can engage with Afghanistan's neighbors and the region to address the narcotics coming from Afghanistan? Oh, it's a great question. Um, I think some of the speakers have touched on it a little bit in terms of border security is, is certainly a place to start. Um, you know, we heard a lot about what the border looks like on the Central Asian side of things, the you know, firefights with the Iranian border guards, and, and to some extent, uh, there have been increasingly number, uh, increasing numbers of those with the Pakistani border guards uh, over the last few months as well. So um, border security is something that, that I think is a good place to start. Um, there's a lot that the U.S. can provide, and not necessarily even from a DOD perspective. Obviously, you know, Customs and Border Patrol, um, DOD, right, can, um, in some places, the Coast Guard um, can get involved with those types of initiatives, and, and that's a, a good place to start. It's relatively, you know, it's, it's not very contentious with a lot of countries, right, as long as you're sort of just there helping them build better facilities, um, giving them ISR tools, training them on ISR, et cetera. Now, these are relatively low barrier of entry type things that we can do with some of Afghanistan's neighbors to try and help them out. Um, interestingly, um, they can also be, you know, dual purpose. Uh, I've written before about, as we think about terrorist threats inside of Afghanistan and how to deal with them in sort of an over the horizon sense now that we're not there anymore, border security is one way to try and get after that, right? If you can get a toehold with a partner in terms of helping them secure their borders, um, you can then hopefully use that as a building block towards a broader counterterrorism type relationship as well. So I think border security is, is the place that I would think to start. Thanks. I'm noticing a pattern here too. I don't know if you're noticing the same pattern, but we're getting like specific fan type questions coming online. We got like a following here. You may take, check your Twitter feeds if you got, you know, increased followers going on. We got the general questions coming from the, from the session. We'll see if that pattern holds. Good afternoon, everyone. Mitch Mintaco with uh, USF Naval ROTC. Uh, Ambassador, you mentioned a few times USF students and how they'd be able to have an impact in the future. So I just wanted to ask the panel generally, how can young people, young leaders more specifically, learn from this conflict, such as Russia and Ukraine, illicit drug trade and uh, illicit commercial goods? How can we learn from these conflicts and apply them to the future, either militarily or politically, to resolve, solve, or prevent future conflicts? Thanks, great question. Uh, anybody wanna go first on this one? All right, I'll, I'll take a stab at it first. Um, I think it's by really looking at, at history, not just this conflict and thinking it's new. And not that everything is the same. There's a great quote out of Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. Now, I realize we have computers today, we didn't 200 years ago, right? But human patterns are very similar in terms of how people interact, how nations interact. And that has really kind of flowed over time in similarities. And so really looking at those patterns, I think can be very helpful uh, for that. The second piece is continuing to hope in something better, I think is also important, not despairing of one more conflict, one more issue, uh, whatever else. And the third point, before I turn it over, is there is no deus ex machina. Right. Technology promises a lot of wonderful things, but it's never solved every problem we have. It's still a human problem. And so not putting your faith in the technology, but in disciplining the technology to help you solve the human problems going forward. Yeah, I, I would add, you know, um, beyond the education is, is an understanding, you know, as you look back over history that uh, we're not going to solve this problem entirely. There, there is not going to be uh, a eureka moment, you know, there's, there's not going to be, uh, you know, that right crop that replaces another crop until you just keep trying. And so 
um, I, I, it's it's really important, you know, that we have that that beacon of what what the United States stands for, and that we try to use that beacon, you know, to help the rest of the world be raised to our standards. You know, uh, it, it ought to be the role model to understand that our form of government, our form of economy, despite you know all the challenges and, and things that happen internally, it still made us the most prosperous people, you know, who have the best quality of life probably overall than any in the world. So, you know, it's easy to get really frustrated because you can, you can just, especially in the, in the CENTCOM AOR, because there's so many things that go back historically and factors, you know, to try to solve, you know, even one problem is really hard, but, but, you know, having that ability to just stay with it day after day, day after day and chip away uh, at, at the problem, you start to make some progress. And, and I think that's what, uh, you know, counter narcotics is actually a place where we can chip away day after day and just get a little better and learn from each other and, and, and take some steps forward and, and really try to build something uh, that, that helps the people in the region. Because there's a lot of people there that would aspire to live like us. Um, you know, when you talk to people in the region, even who are close, that are relying on China, where they are relying on Russia, you know, they're not going on vacation in Russia or China. You know, they're not sending their children there uh, if they have a choice for education. They're coming to the United States. They're immigrating to the United States. They're buying, you know, the, the, the finer United States products. So, you know, it, it's, it's a brand that sells and we got to keep selling it and just chipping away. But don't, don't get your head down because uh, there's going to be a lot of fails, you know, along that way. And, and uh, you know, when I die, when you die, uh, I'm pretty sure the Middle East isn't going to be like this beacon of Jeffersonian democracy that, that everybody, you know, wants to go live in. But maybe it's a little better. Maybe it's a little more stable. Maybe it's, you know, uh, better than we left it. So, um, and, and we've helped the people there. I think that's that's what I would I would say. Yes, sir. You know, as I tried to do in my in my speech, <clears throat> it was to to make this point that you know you asked it from the standpoint of advice to give USF students. Um, the best advice I can give is you know in your discussion with your colleagues, with your friends, your family, uh, others in the classroom. Um, don't don't turn inwards. Don't let the United States move in this isolationist direction. It's not who we are. Uh, and if we do that, if we fall victim to that, just as we saw on 9-11, I was in the Pentagon on 9-11, and if, you, if you'd asked me then uh, that my grandchildren would be fighting the fight against Al-Qaeda, I would have told you you're crazy. But these issues are not going away. And either we treat them at the source, we deal with them at the source, or they, the problem will come to us. Final point, you epitomize it. You're wearing your fatigues, right? So the call to service, there's no greater call. And so I'd encourage USF students who either want to serve in the uniformed military or as civilians in any number of agencies, uh, there's a way you can contribute to the nation's security. So thank you. Yeah, I, so I would offer, right, students are an extension of the academy. And one of, the, one of the great roles that the academy plays in support of government is the ability to ask and provide answers to questions that people in the government don't have the time, wherewithal, or even know that they need to ask. Um, and so I, you know, I would encourage the students of USF, as I would encourage professors and right, people elsewhere, um, to ask the hard questions, right? Ask the hard questions and then try to seek answers to them. Uh, try to answer them in your term papers or, you know, press your professors to try and address those questions. And, and I would take it even a step beyond that, which, which may come across as a criticism of the academy, and so be it, right? Don't just write the paper and turn it in, right? If you have ideas that you come across in researching and trying to answer those questions, get the ideas out there. Uh, I, one of the great things about, I think, the younger generation today is they're very comfortable with flat communications and reaching out directly to people in positions of power. That's fantastic. Many government officials are on Twitter, right? Tweet at them. If you've got an idea, hey, I, you know, I did this term paper on this particular topic and I came up with this idea. Here's a thread of what, you know, what I came up with. Tweet it at them. Who knows what you, know, what you might be able to accomplish? So those are just some ideas that I have. Thanks. Yeah, just a few things I'd like to add, you know, you know, what you want to learn from a conflict like this, especially as a you know, young student, young person, and the devastation it caused the economies in the world, the lives it cost, 
uh, you, know, you can't travel certain places. Uh, you just see just families in just dire need. Uh, you know, it, 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 when you take your classes and you're in seminars like this, you know, it makes you understand diplomacy, you know, approaching, is there, is there a better way? You know, and, and then ask yourself, learn from mistakes. Like you just said, ask, ask the tough questions. You know, it, no one's perfect. You know, what went wrong? What could we do better? You know, could we have been more assertive uh, to, prevent, to prevent this from happening? Those are things that you got to learn from, from history. And I think one of the things that you really want to ask like students today, and I know most people in the room have seen some very grotesque things in their life in other countries and disasters that are happening, even in natural disasters. If you're going to take this life on, make sure you pick something that you care about and you believe in, you know, because you'll be much more successful uh, in helping other people, protecting that, you know, the homeland and your family. And it'll mean more to you than, 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 than your paycheck. So you find something that you, you believe in, I think is, is really important in this type of career. Thank you. Thank you. I think we got one more, one more question. Go ahead. We'll go, uh, we'll go live for our final question before we turn it back over. Uh, yes, hello, thank you. My name's Jose. Um, I'm a vet, by the way, don't touch me by my love. <laughs> no. All right. I have three hard questions. Uh, you can choose whichever one you want to ask, but um, I know you guys are the experts and I'm just a novice, but I do have three hard questions. On the first one, sir, uh, I came in late, by the way, sorry. Um, you were talking about sanctions. Don't you think sanctions have been having the opposite effect in, on I want to hear your opinion on the after effects uh, when the uh, Russian gold, reserve gold was confiscated. That's the first question. The second question is harder than that, that I really want to hear for, for everybody in the United States to hear. In this one, you were talking about drugs. And I don't know if the, the um, CIA has ever been investigated, but there are rumors that the CIA is in the business of importing drugs. And now it's getting to the point that I don't know, but it seems like police officers when the United States, American police officers are falling victim to it, you know, like silence. Now, the third question that I have is you could, for you to choose is this one. Um, I know Ukraine, it's an energy war, right? We were talking about the pipelines and everything else and the uh, liquefied natural gas, LNG, sorry. All right, but um, in Ukraine, we're supporting Nazis. How can we not see that as, we're the bad guys. We're not gonna win that way, sir. Um, sorry, uh, I do have those three hard questions. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully I'll get an answer. Choose whichever one you want. Thank you. Thanks for leaving us today. Everyone wanna pick uh, one really quickly? So on, on the sanctions question, which was his first, um, what I would say is, uh, Sanctions are not a substitute for policy. Uh, and if, you, if you're just gonna throw sanctions around uh, without a clear, coherent and integrated policy, you're probably not gonna achieve the effect you're trying to have. But I have very clearly seen moments where even a discrete targeted sanction on an individual has, has had the effect we wanted to have. Um, whether it's, uh, it's convincing uh, Kabila not to run for re-election because we sanctioned his bag man in the DRC, uh, which led to uh, he, him desisting from an effort to, to change the constitution to allow for another term in office. Um, some of the, I mean, I'll tell you firsthand with the Venezuelans, I, I think Matt will back me up on this, but there's nothing that the Venezuelans are scared of more than getting quote, OFACT. Uh, because they know eventually there's an indictment coming and they're going to go to jail. So you can have these very clear and very uh, powerful effects if you have a policy. Speech I gave, maybe, I don't know if you were here for that, but uh, I've been critical of the sanctions we have, or in my view, haven't imposed on the Russian Federation for its war in Ukraine. I don't think we've done enough. I'm glad we grabbed as much of their gold as we could get. But the problem is, okay, we've got a couple hundred billion in, in frozen Russian reserves. We're still paying them half a billion a, a day out of Europe for energy exports. So while I believe that the American taxpayer should continue to support this administration's efforts to, to arm and fund the Ukrainians, I do have a hard time 
the American taxpayer shelling out hundreds of billions of dollars when the Europeans are funneling to the Russians the same amount. So we do have to get at the sanctions business with a degree of uh, determination that to date, we've not been willing to exhibit. Yeah, if I, I'll add some on, on the sanctions part. Uh, sanctions aren't put on them just to just to hurt them economically. It also makes them change uh, their business plan, their illegal business plan, how they move money, how they communicate, things that they do. So it opens them up for law enforcement and uh, investigations by other foreign nations as well. So it's really a tool that forces them to do something they normally wouldn't do or weren't doing. So when they put their sanctions on there where they got to move money a different way, got to communicate a different way. And Venezuela is a perfect example of that with the sanctions that just crippled their administration, which is corrupt from top to bottom and, and indicted uh, for drug charges. So, I mean, I think it's, it's a great thing when you talk about uh, interagency cooperation, that when sanctions are put on by the U.S. government, that law enforcement gets benefit of that on enabling us to investigate these transnational organized crimes and foreign governments easier. Yeah, let me just come in. Some of, a lot of people don't realize what, when they hear about sanctions is that a sanction is actually a, it's a civil action, not a criminal action, right? So just because we freeze your bank account doesn't mean you're going to jail, right? But what is a felony offense is if you try to evade those sanctions. And so the moment you do that, the moment you try to weasel your way around those restrictions, now Department of Justice has got you, DEA has got you, and you are going to go to jail eventually. Thanks. Thanks for the uh, three fastballs at the end of the, uh, the game um, when we were expecting sliders and curves. So uh, I appreciate that. Sorry, we only got to one of them, uh, but thank you for uh, for taking the swing and a hit, I, I would might add. And uh, thank you, Dr. Oh, Deeb. Appreciate it. Andy, thank you very much and the panelists. And you know, I was right. Just as advertised, yes, as, as, as good as it gets, and everyone. And I would like to express my sincere thanks and appreciation to our, moder uh, to our moderators, speakers, panelists, and everyone who came back after lunch and the many who is online. And just to let you know that these panels will be um, on our website. So you will have a chance to view them. And great question from our USF student. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a clip, the advice that was given to the students and also to the professors. I'm gonna play that the first thing in my class, hard, ask the hard questions. And that's what we are here intend to do. So thank you for those compelling questions to do that and the significant insights. So it's truly been a privilege to join you in person and serve you as a conference MC. And now I'm pleased to introduce professor and associate dean of research for the College of Arts and Sciences and my friend, Randy Larson for the closing remarks. Dr. Larson has been serving at the University of South Florida since 2002. And prior to joining USF, Dr. Larson also held positions at the University of Hawaii and California Institute of Technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Larson. All right, thank you, Adib. My microphone up here. Um, it's certainly an honor to be uh, the closer, I guess, for today's um, uh, sixth uh, GPC conference. Um, I was here when we started the GPC series. Uh, these have been a, a really great uh, opportunity to learn um, a lot about what's going on, particularly in the CENTCOM AOR, but also um, across, the, across the globe. Um, I would like to, uh, first of all, again, as Adib um, did already, to thank all of our speakers and panelists uh, and participants from the audience today for just a, a, an extraordinary day of, of, um, of uh, presentation. So we can give them a round of applause for everyone today. Thank you. And also before I, I just have a few remarks. Um, I don't want to stand between everybody here and our beverage establishments that are near the campus. So I'm trying not to keep things too long. Um, but as you might imagine, right, putting a conference together like this is a heavy lift. Uh, and there are a lot of behind the scenes uh, things that go on, right? And there's a lot of talented people that help put, pull this off. Um, so I just want to acknowledge a few of those from the GNSI, uh, Jim Cardoso, 
Um, also, Jesse uh, Fusiak, Tad Schaffner, Glenn Beckman, and Selena Grouse. Um, also from USF, uh, Central Marketing, they've been a great team to help kind of pull this all together and all of our folks here. Um, but Stephanie uh, Scoopian and Tanya Vomax, and then also from Cyber Florida, Kate Whitaker uh, has done a lot of heavy lifting over, over all of the conferences for us. And I'd like to acknowledge um, Kate. So I'd like to acknowledge all of those and thank you for your efforts. And one of the other, uh, I think, unsung heroes of the, of the TPC is sitting here is Dr. Uh, Farhadi who actually was one, was instrumental actually bringing the GPC conference here to USF. Um, he's been a tireless advocate and, and worker. And I know that from you know, my time early on this conference when we were kind of working out a lot of the kinks to get this launched at USF. There were a lot of challenges early on um, uh, administratively and, and Adib stayed the course. Um, and so he's been uh, just a, a phenomenal colleague to be able to help pull this together behind the scenes. And I will say he's done all this as an assistant professor in the Department of Religion while he's going up for tenure promotion and doing all of his research and scholarship and all of the teaching of the courses that he has to do. And he's still done a lot of heavy lifting behind here. So I wanna thank you Adib for, for this. And this was a great panel by the way. And I, I think both were just phenomenal and um, Part of what I want to talk about just briefly um, is something that probably came out more in this panel than the early in the earlier panels, what the relationships of academics can be to provide um, uh, to provide support uh, and to provide insights uh, together with uh, our strategic partners uh, and how we can leverage the academics. What, what we learned from the uh, conflict in Ukraine <clears throat> is how complex the problems are that have emerged from that conflict. It's not just, well, Russia invaded Ukraine, and so there's a problem in Europe. Um, what we've seen is that these problems are global problems, and that conflict has created a, a set of really complicated and intertwined um, challenges. They, they come from energy, right? And we've seen that, that, that the, the global, um, energy sustainability and the global energy market is significantly impacted by, by uh, what's going on in, in Ukraine. Food security, we heard a lot about that earlier on the food security problem. Um, that's impacting everybody, right? That impacts particularly underdeveloped countries um, where now we're putting additional tensions on already stressed uh, nation states. That creates, I think, vast instabilities that creates even more problems that are far removed from the, the area of the conflict. Um, the, the human migration problems, the, the humanitarian crisis that it's created, um, not only does it create a humanitarian problem, but it stresses those countries of where the refugees are going, right? You're gonna put a lot of tensions on those governments um, down the road, and especially the longer the conflict lasts, the worse this is gonna get. Uh, I think we've also seen that um, it really tests our, our relationships with NATO, with our NATO uh, uh, colleagues and, and those treaties. How much stress can we put on those? Early on, it, I think we saw a lot of, you know, of, of unity around, but the longer this goes with, with the cost and the energy situation, how much, how much tension can we, can we absorb? So these are really complicated really complex problems. Um, and I think that's what came out of today. Um, but when we have these kind of complex solution or complex problems, they also require integrated and interdisciplinary solutions to those problems, or at least approaches to those problems. Um, so, I, and I think we heard a lot about kind of a whole of government approach um, to addressing a number of challenges, including the, the drug trafficking. Um, but I think I would extend that to the whole of government, whole of academia, uh, even our other community partners, NGOs, et cetera. There are, there are whole groups that can be integrated together to help address the challenges. And that's part of what we're here to do at USF is start to bring these kind of collaborative um, teams together to be able to address these, these, kinds, of, um, these kinds of challenges. Um, USF is a research one university um, or a large research one university. 
we have enormous intellectual capital uh, at our institution, and I think that's true for all of our R1s, um, that can be drawn upon to help um, our government uh, organizations to help think differently uh, about these problems. And I think the universities can certainly make um, significant contributions, um, significant contributions in those areas. Um, and not only to address this challenge, but uh, to address other global challenges and those that are current challenges and those that, that are gonna be emergent challenges. Um, and that's one of the things we always have to think about as well. And I think that question came up um, earlier today was that it's one thing to be thinking about what's going on right now and how are we gonna address the challenges that are going on right now but we also always have to be cognizant of emerging challenges that are gonna come down the road so that we can get ahead of those challenges. So not only is it important to meet our existing challenges and try to, to, um, to find innovative approaches, but also to be always thinking ahead um, of, of what's next and can we get ahead of, of what's next um, with those challenges. Um, what makes USF particularly well-suited to address global challenges like this is the fact that um, USF has a culture of being interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary. And if you go to any university in the United States, they will tell you the same thing. Um, those, are, those are great buzzwords uh, that universities will use. And then when you go and you, you actually talk to those faculty or you talk to those students, you find out it's actually not that way at a lot of those institutions. There still are silos and institutional barriers to collaboration uh, and to transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary research. USF is different um, partly because we're a new university, right? We were founded in 1956. Our first graduate programs weren't established until the 60s. That gave us an opportunity to build an institution a little bit differently. And we built it with that collaborative spirit and that transdisciplinary spirit. And something that came out I think was really important, uh, I think it was said in this panel, was that interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary research um, and, and kind of solutions and challenges works because you bring disciplinary expertise to the problem. So transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary means that we still have very strong disciplinary programs and we bring those disciplinary teams together um, or those teams together, disciplinary experts to help solve those problems. And that's what we're really good at at USF. We don't have those kinds of barriers here. There are still some, I'm not gonna lie. Um, you know, we are still a large organization and uh, we, we still have some, uh, what I would call more of the old school uh, mentality with some of our faculty, but overall we are a, we are a, a, very, um, a very collaborative institution. Um, and I think that, that really you know, positions us well to be able to work on these kinds of problems with our partners. And I think we see this with the Global um, uh, National Security Institute that we just founded. And I would say that the GNSI actually is an effort that started probably six years ago uh, by a small team here at USF, uh, partly out of uh, College of Arts and Sciences, but also out of Cyber Florida, um, with this kind of vision of this is where we would be. We would, we would develop um, uh, an initiative that would be focused on national and global security issues uh, and that would provide an opportunity for external partners to be able to identify a window into the university. One of the, one of the challenges, one of the hardest things to do in working with a university like ours, the, with the size that it is, is when somebody comes in and has, hey, I have an idea, maybe it's CENTCOM's J8 group, we're really interested in the human dynamics problem and influence, but who do you talk to? Where do you go? Do you, which college do you talk to? Which faculty members do you talk to? So it's very hard to find those windows in. The GNSI is that window, right? So that, that is part of their, um, um, part of what, what they do is they provide that mechanism for a flow through um, of where we can, we can have an entry point into the university for global and national security um, issues. And we are um, beside ourselves with excitement that we have General McKinsey as our uh, inaugural um, executive director for the GNSI. Um, it's, it's really uh, phenomenal and what he's been able to accomplish, and I think it's been six to eight months, maybe not even that long, um, what he's been able to build here has been phenomenal. So we, we are well on our way to getting the GNSI off the ground. Um, so one of the ways that USF, um, kind of the way we respond to challenges is that 
when we identify a, a need or a challenge, we put together right away, once we find out what that challenge is, we, we identify teams of faculty from across the USF system, not just a particular department or a particular college, we can bring faculty, students, postdoctoral fellows from, uh, from across the system to form teams to address challenges. And a good example of that was the pandemic. Uh, when, when we first were shut down in March uh, of 2020, we were able to form with 60 faculty members from across the institution, what we call the Pandemic Response Research Network. That was a network that was created to address all aspects of the pandemic. Um, everything from the medical side, the environmental side, the social, social and behavioral side. Um, that network addressed a lot of problems. Uh, we worked with our community partners. We worked with uh, hospitals and clinics. We worked with the, the Florida Department of Health. That's a model for how USF approaches problems. And we've applied that model also to our work with CENTCOM and the J8 group on human dynamics and, and influence. We right away brought together, we understood what the problem was. Uh, we had a number of workshops with, uh, with people from the J8 group. Um, we identified the problem, we worked with J8. And again, right, there's language barriers between academia and, and the command. And so we had to kind of navigate that. But once we did, and we kind of got on the same page about, okay, now we understand what you're really trying to do. How could we help? Now we can put together our team of uh, subject matter experts uh, together to start addressing that problem. And in fact, we have a workshop coming up uh, next week on the 14th with that same group. But to show you how the breadth of how we tackle these problems, that workshop is gonna have people from arts and sciences, which will be people from intelligence, or I'm sorry, our Info school of information, religious studies, um, our uh, interdisciplinary global studies, but is also gonna have people from the College of Public Health. We're gonna have people from the genomics program and biostatistics. We've got also faculty participants from the College of Business. It's not that they are experts in influence or the indices and the, and the, and the nuances of what we're trying to do for, um, to understand influence broadly, but these people have expertise in peripheral areas that will all contribute to that. And once you put those people in a room and we start the conversations, they bring their disciplinary expertise now to, uh, to tackle a new problem. That's the strength of the university. And that's the strength of the University of South Florida is we have the ability to do that. And I'm really glad our student asked the question about um, how, do we, you know, how do we get students involved in this? This is where our student involvement comes, right? So our students at USF are also involved in undergraduate research programs. They're working with faculty directly. So every time we create one of these hubs, there are, there are students associated with this. They're both undergraduate students, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows. So it really gives us an opportunity to not only help, um, help the government uh, in finding new ways to think about the problem and maybe offer some new solutions to those problems, but at the same time, in parallel, we're also training that kind of next generation of thinkers that even though they're exploring a particular discipline, they're learning how to apply that discipline to other things, right, other, other areas. So that's one of the strengths of the institution. Um, we have a lot of assets at USF that are related to uh, global and national security. That includes our Institute for Applied Engineering, where we do a lot of the, the science and technology uh, comes out. We, uh, as you know, we have Cyber Florida here as well. Uh, that's housed at, at USF. So we, we do a lot of work with the Cyber Florida group. We started a new, a new effort that's broadly in human dynamics and behavioral sciences. That's a, that's a new network that we've established here. One of the hubs, one of the research hubs in that network uh, is Influence. And that's the one we're working with, uh, partnering with the J8 group. But when we see opportunities uh, and challenges that come from our partners, that's one of, that, what's one of the advantages of having a you know, USF in, in the neighborhood of McDill is that we can respond to these work very quickly and assemble these kinds of teams. So you know, we offer great partnerships. Um, we've had great relationships with uh, US Central Command. Um, uh, we've also uh, had very productive relationships over the years with the Joint Special Operations University. Those are continuing and we're expanding those now. So the, I think the future is really bright for our relationship uh, and our ability as a university to help um, address some of these challenges. Because again, what we've learned today is they are extraordinarily complex. Um, 
And there's no, they're so intertwined uh, and entangled, it's very difficult to try to navigate these complexities. So the, the more talent and intellectual capital we can bring uh, both from within the government and from academia and even from our um, private sector partners uh, can be really important and are probably gonna be required um, to address those issues. And with that, um, like I said, I don't wanna take too much time because I know everybody's spent a long day. I, I'm really excited about the number of people are, are here. Uh, I only have one story about that. I gave a talk one time. I was the last talk in the last session on the last day. And the only people in the room were three of my graduate students, two uh, speakers with their luggage waiting for their cab to go to the airport, and the guy waiting to pick up the chairs. That was the most unmotivated I have ever been, <laughs> I have ever been to give a talk. It's like, okay, I'm sure it was a terrible perform <laughs> performance because the janitor didn't really know what I was talking about. So. <laughs> Anyway, thank you all again for attending. Uh, I will plug in, uh, put in a plug for the March um, um, GPC conference on China. It's gonna be amazing. Uh, clearly China, uh, I, could, I could probably talk for an hour on the university's issues with China, on the 10,000 talents program and intellectual property issues and things like that, but that will be for another day. But um, again, thank you again. Um, and we look forward to seeing all you uh, in March.